Scorched Earth Book 11 in the Warrior Series by Ty Patterson Chapter 1 Low-tech usually beat high-tech when it came to counter-surveillance and espionage. In-person meetings were harder to intercept than emails and phone calls. The planners and perps applied those same principles when it came to the takedown. They knew that the office on Columbus Avenue was like a fortress. It had cameras on the outside, visible ones, as well as discreet. They knew a supercomputer inside the building was continually scanning street traffic. If a vehicle or a person passed the office more than a certain number of times, the computer was programmed to investigate. If a car or a bystander loitered over a threshold period, Werner, the supercomputer, kicked in. No, the perps had to go low-tech. It was the only way they could execute the grab successfully. It was the only way they would live, because they were going against some of the most lethal men and women in the world. The office was home to the agency, a covert government outfit that didn't exist on paper. It was run by a female director, Claire, who was based out of D.C. and reported to only one person, the president. It had just eight operatives, Zeb Carter, the lead agent, Broker, the intel analyst, Bear, Chloe, Bawana, Roger and the twins, Beth and Megan Peterson. Zeb was ex-Special Forces, as were Bear, Bawana and Roger. Broker was a former ranger, while Chloe had been in the 82nd Airborne. The twins came from an illustrious cop family and ran the logistics and intelligence side of the agency. They were the glue that held the outfit together. The agency had a near-zero admin footprint, which was due to the cover the operatives adopted. They all worked for a security consulting outfit that was housed in the Columbus Avenue office. The security firm was genuine, it had real clients and had been Zeb's business before he joined the agency. The Black Ops unit went after terrorists, international criminal gangs, drug and human traffickers, anyone who was a threat to national security. It was a compact, tightly knit team that was more like a family and had never failed on a mission. It hadn't been attacked either, not directly. That was about to change. The perps knew the routine of everyone inside the tall glass walled office. They had contacts, very deep and highly positioned people who could find out that information. They mounted watch. Werner would look suspiciously at any vehicle that lingered. But a NYPD cruiser? A real one? The cruiser was only one part of the surveillance team. There was an ambulance, a roadworks outfit, and a gas maintenance vehicle. They took turns and made a note of the comings and goings. They knew all the operatives weren't present. That was okay. They were interested in only two. When it went down it was ridiculously simple and proved that low-tech and ingenuity beat high-tech. Beth and Megan were returning to the office from a visit to a nearby coffee joint. They went to the cafe every day. Talked about work as well as life stuff. Beth was dating Mark, an NYPD cop. It was going well. Megan was single by choice. There was a lot to talk about. They might be sisters but they were also close friends. Zeb had drilled it into them to eliminate routine. And the twins tried, but it was difficult. Humans were creatures of habit and liked to stick to a timetable. That didn't mean the sisters were careless. They were watchful, their eyes ceaselessly moving, observing as they talked. They were armed, their glocks in shoulder holsters concealed by jackets. They had been trained by Zeb in deadly killing arts. They had been on missions. They were battle hardened. They were vigilant. And yet they fell into the perp's trap. The garbage truck came roaring down the street, which was experiencing heavy traffic. Its driver was on his cell while he drove, probably arguing with his girlfriend. One eye on the lights and vehicles in front of him, his ear jammed against his phone. He didn't see the ambulance backing out of its parking spot. When he did, it was too late. The truck crashed at full speed into the rear of the ambulance. It climbed onto the sidewalk when he turned the wheel desperately and plowed into a suited woman. It injured another pedestrian and finally came to a halt against a lamppost. 
Megan stood frozen for a second and then ran to the scene, Beth hot on her heels. The sisters bent over the injured woman and saw she was bleeding. Call 911, Megan snapped at her sister. Not necessary, ma'am, said a uniformed man who came out of the wreckage of the ambulance. My vehicle's still serviceable. Just the rear door that's dented. I was off duty grabbing a bite. He crouched next to the fallen woman while Beth snapped her phone shut and tended to the fallen man, the second injury. A crowd gathered and helpful comments started to pour in the way they did. Ma'am, I'll have to take both to the hospital. Better care there. He hesitated. Can you two come along? Normally I work with a buddy, but like I said. Let's go. Megan rose and helped him place the woman on the stretcher and carry her inside the ambulance. She and Beth assisted him in taking the man inside. A cruiser rolled to a stop and a uniform rushed out. He asked questions, took notes and made calls. He sent the truck driver for further questioning and waved the ambulance away. Relative calm returned to the street. The twins had disappeared. Zeb was lounging on a couch while Broker was on Werner. Werner was the name of an artificial intelligence program that he and Zeb had bought from a couple of Stanford kids. The software was housed in a supercomputer in the building, but they all used the name Werner interchangeably to refer to either the program or the computer. Bawana and Roger were in Vietnam, on the trail of drug runners. Bear and Chloe were in London, working with Scotland Yard on uncovering a terrorist cell. Zeb and Broker. They weren't doing much. Work was light. There weren't many active missions. Broker glanced up and looked at the door. The twins hadn't returned. He had seen the accident go down on his cameras and had seen the sisters climb inside the ambulance. It was the way they were. He figured they would catch a cab back. But heck, that was a while ago. He tried their cells. No answer. He looked up a GPS program on the computer. All of them had sensors in their jackets and shoes. It was how Werner kept track of them and reported any anomalies. No signal from the sensors. Might be still in the hospital. Those sensors don't always work when there's a lot of electronic equipment around. He looked up the ambulance's plates. Mount Sinai Street Luke's on Amsterdam Avenue. They'll be back soon with a story to tell. He returned to his project, a bulletproof vest that could be worn like a tee or a shirt. It was something he was working on with the NSA. An hour passed. He fidgeted and tried the cells again. No response. He glanced irritably at the couch. Zeb hadn't moved. His eyes were closed, but Broker knew he wasn't sleeping. His friend was aware of everything that was happening around him. He can probably hear me breathe. Hear me think, he grouched internally. Another hour passed. No sign of excited voices. No sign of the oxygen that the twins were. Zeb, we have a problem, he said, striving to keep his voice calm. His friend rose lithely, instantly, as if he had been thinking the same thing. Call Mark, Zeb told him. Mark, buddy, have you heard from Beth? Broker said into his cell. There was an accident outside our office a while ago. They went with the ambulance. No, we didn't see who was injured. Hold up a beat. Broker brought up the camera feed. Looks like a woman and a man. On the sidewalk. There was an NYPD cruiser too. He gave him the plate numbers and hung up. He'll check, he told Zeb unnecessarily. Mark called half an hour later. Broker snatched his cell and listened, his face turning gray. He hung up, tossed his cell and turned to his friend. No record of an accident. That cruiser, it was in the Bronx when the accident went down. That ambulance, it's down for maintenance. Has been out of circulation for over a week. Zeb didn't reply. His breathing didn't change. Only his face gave him away. It had turned pale. 
that and the trembling of his fingers when he raised his hands were his only displays of emotion. All ten fingers shaking imperceptibly. Someone's got them, Zeb. Zeb still didn't speak. A faraway look came over his eyes, one that Broker recognized. His face shuddered and became implacable. The trembling became more noticeable. An onlooker would have mistaken the shaking for fear or nervousness. Broker knew better. It was anger. Not red-hot fury but cold rage inside his friend. A cold rage that would drive him relentlessly till he rescued the twins. A burning that would take him wherever he needed to go, even to the far corners of the world. A cold rage that would scorch the earth. Chapter 2 Run the cameras again. Zeb bent over Broker's shoulders as his friend's fingers flew over the keys. They had gone through the CCTV camera feeds several times and each time had spotted nothing. Again? Yeah. Broker ran the videos in slow-mo. The twins were there, sipping on their drinks as they walked back to the office. Megan throwing her head back to laugh at something her sister said. The garbage truck came from behind. Smashed into the ambulance. The ambulance driver came out. A few minutes later, the sisters got inside the ambulance and it roared away. Broker had run the images of the garbage truck driver and the ambulance man through Werner. The supercomputer had sophisticated facial recognition programs that linked to several national and international databases. Nothing. The two men weren't in any database. Broker had also run the victims' faces as well as all the bystanders. No luck there either. The elevator door swished open and Mark hurried in, followed by Pazaka and Chong. Mark was anxious and didn't conceal his expression. Pazaka was his usual bland self, his mirrored shades looking at no one in particular. Chang's hair was ruffled, even more than normal. His suit looked like he had slept in it for a week. The two detectives knew Zeb and his crew very well. The agency's operatives had helped them several times on cases where the agency had an interest. Terrorism in the city. Drug trafficking. A couple of times the police commissioner had hired Zeb as a consultant to help out on tough cases. The detectives got all the credit each time and knew enough not to ask too many questions about the agency or its unorthodox methods. Anything. Mark questioned them, running a hand through his short hair. Nope, Broker answered and flicked his eyes at Chong who shrugged. We've put a bolo out for the ambulance. He trailed off. Broker nodded in understanding. No cop had spotted the vehicle. You have those tags in their clothing, don't you? Mark asked in frustration. Beth told me about them. Surely you can track them. You've got more technology here than we have. The tags are dead, Broker responded calmly and watched the young cop pace, his face knit in worry. Cut him some slack, Broker told himself. I would be the same in his position. The twins had met Zeb in Wyoming a few years ago, while on vacation. They were Boston-based then, running their web consultancy business, and had returned to their home state for a short break. The vacation had turned into a nightmare when a gang of assassins had pursued them, until a quiet man stepped in and rescued them. Zeb Once they discovered who he was, they sold their business in Boston, moved to New York, and demanded to join the agency. Zeb had resisted, but the sisters didn't give up. They badgered him until he caved in and became the heart and soul of the covert outfit. Mark Feinberg had been a cop with Jackson PD and had helped Zeb and the twins. He had been captivated by Beth and had followed her to New York. He joined the NYPD and the two started dating, a strong relationship that all the operatives approved of. You'll just sit there. Waiting for what? The phone to ring? Mark turned on Zeb, who hadn't moved from his chair, hadn't greeted the visitors. I expected more action from you guys, Mark yelled, his face turning red. Zeb looked at him impassively and turned his gaze away when his cell rang. Zeb? 
anything. Claire zeb mouthed at Broker and went inside an inner office. No ma'am. No chatter. No warnings. I've checked with the other agencies, have gone through all the intel at my end. Her voice was quiet. No one could read anything in it. Zeb knew better. Claire would persuade the president to carry out a nuclear strike if it helped recover the twins. I've briefed General Klaus. He's at the Pentagon and said he will talk to the NSA. I've already spoken to them. They too have nothing, but you know the general. He wants to do something. Zeb did know General Daniel Klaus. He was the national security advisor and was one of the few people who knew of the agency's existence and purpose. He approved of the outfit and its operatives. The sisters in particular. They were daughters to him. Anything, Claire repeated. You're hot. Hot was when all other missions were dropped. Hot didn't respect red tape and protocol, whether national or international. We already were, ma'am. Zeb returned to the main office and sensed the buzz in the room instantly. Broker caught his eye and tossed him his jacket and holster. We got a witness. He has something. Chapter 3 I thought it was just another accident, Alicio Gidney said. This is my first time in New York. I was recording everything, and I caught it on my cell. Gidney was in his late twenties, had red hair, a neatly trimmed beard, and brown eyes that were distant as he recalled the events. They were in one police plaza, one PP, the NYPD headquarters. In an interview room, Gidney behind a table. Chong, Pazaka, and Mark in front of him. Zeb and Broker, leaning against a wall. 7 p.m. Five hours since the kidnapping. I forgot about it when the ambulance drove away. Went back to my hotel. Saw the request for information on my TV. Called the number. You got your cell with you? Mark asked, making an effort to curb his impatience. Yes, sir. Gidney produced his phone and nodded when Chong gave him a may I. Look. It's the third video, Gidney added helpfully. The footage was shaky and started with a shouted my god from the witness. I couldn't control myself. Gidney smiled when he heard himself. The smile disappeared when Zeb gave him a look. Gidney had been behind the ambulance initially, and when the twins had gotten inside, it looked like he had scrambled around till he got to the passenger side at the front. It was an angle that looked inside the ambulance. It captured the two other men inside the ambulance. Their faces were visible to the camera as they grabbed the sisters and applied what looked like dark cloths to their faces. And then the video shook when Gidney sprang back as the ambulance drove away. Zeb took the phone and played the video repeatedly till the images of the men were burned in his mind. The beast stirred and rose. Not yet, he ordered it. He was handing the phone back to Gidney when his hand froze at the witness's words. Russian. They were speaking Russian. It turned out that Gidney was a high school teacher. Taught Russian. Recognized the few words that filtered out of one half-open window of the ambulance. 8 p.m. Broker and Zeb had returned to their office. Mark had wanted to come along and help out, but Broker, Chong and Pazaka convinced him otherwise. Dude, you don't want to know how we operate. Besides, Beth wouldn't want you to. That last line convinced the young cop more than any other. Broker turned to Zeb, who was on his cell. Zeb spoke briefly, monosyllabically, and hung up. Bear and Chloe. Bawana and Roger. They're returning. Their missions. They're out of them. Broker went to his computer and inserted Gidney's video. He got Werner to search for the faces, and while the supercomputer went to work, he turned to his friend. Watched as Zeb stood motionless. Face shuddered. Eyes hooded. Why are Russians involved? Zeb didn't answer. 
Werner came back with a response half an hour later. No match. Zeb took one look at the two words and started moving to the elevator. We're going to ask them. Broker hurried to catch up. Yeah. There were three large Russian gangs operating in New York. They had carved out the city among themselves. The Yurovich gang worked in Manhattan and Jersey City, and the Valentin Hoods were based in Brooklyn and Queens, while the Borisovna gangsters claimed the Bronx and parts north as their territory. Each of the gangs provided the usual services. Prostitution, drug trafficking, and gun running, among many others. Each of them were in continual conflict with the Italian mafia, Ukrainians, Hispanic gangs, and other criminals. Zeb drove to the meatpacking district, broker beside him, traffic and streetlights flowing across their faces in streaks of red, green and yellow as he navigated through the night. The meatpacking district was where Vasily Yurovich was based, the head of the largest Russian gang in the city. He will be surrounded by his men, broker said, inconsequentially since he knew his friend didn't care. Zeb would go through brick walls and mountains of gangsters to find the twins. Chapter 4 Yurovich's office was in a red brick building on Washington Street. The first floor housed a popular nightclub that was owned by the Russian and was one of his legal businesses. Legal was a loose term for Yurovich, since his men sold drugs to the revelers in the club. Zeb walked up to the bouncers and held up his NYPD badge wordlessly. They parted and he went inside, broker close behind him. Inside was a lounge and a reception area. Throbbing beats came through closed doors. A receptionist looked askance and started to protest when Zeb jabbed the elevator's buttons. She came around her desk, slowing down when Zeb faced her. Something in his face made her stop. Is he upstairs? She nodded dumbly. Will you warn him? She shook her head. Zeb pressed the 14th floor button and stood silently, Broker watching the digits race on the small panel. We need him alive, Broker told him unnecessarily. The elevator opened into a carpeted hallway, two heavies in front of its doors. They looked startled when Zeb and Broker stepped through. The next moment they were writhing on the floor when Zeb kicked one in the groin and chopped the other in the face. He removed their guns, crushed their radios and turned left. Ahead was another set of doors, with three bouncers in the doorway. They raised their hands up silently when Zeb pointed his gun at them. Broker disarmed them and secured their wrists and legs with plastic ties. Footsteps pounded, and from around a corner two suits rushed up. One had his gun out, while the other was reaching beneath his jacket. Zeb fired twice, shooting them in their shoulders, and whipped his barrel across their foreheads. He raced around the corner to yet another set of doors and thrust it open. Large office, half the size of a basketball court. Polished wooden desk. Three men near the door. One man seated, turning around, his mouth opening in shock. Another seated man on the other side of the desk, his eyes expressionless. The three men moved as one. The first seated man started rising. Don't, said Zeb, no inflection to his voice. That didn't stop the four men. He shot two of the standing men in the shoulder, almost lazily. The third dropped his gun when Broker produced his Mossberg, which he had concealed beneath a long coat. Only Broker would wear a long coat in New York in the summer. However, this time, it wasn't for style. The garment helped conceal his weapon. Zeb shoved the rising man back into his seat. Don't move. The man didn't move. Vasily Yurovich, the man at the other side of the desk, hadn't moved either. He was tall, six feet five inches, broad and muscled. Dark-haired and clean-shaven. His face was bland, his eyes cold and calculating. You won't walk out of here alive, whoever you are. Don't worry about us. Zeb tossed a cell phone at him. Look at the video on that. Are those men yours? Yurovich hesitated. Take it. It's not a bomb. 
it's not a listening device. If I wanted to kill you, you'd already be dead. The Russian picked up the phone, fiddled with it, and played the video. His face paled when he realized its significance. He glanced up once at Zeb and Broker, and bent back to the video. I don't know all the men in my gang. Not personally. He cleared his throat. Igor will know. He nodded at the seated man in front of him. Give it to Igor. Igor took the phone and watched the video. His forehead had a thin sheen of perspiration when he raised his head and looked at the intruders. He moistened his lips. I recognize one of them. Who? He looked at Yurevich, who nodded. That one. He paused the video and pointed at one of the men inside the ambulance. The one who was holding the cloth to Megan's face. Caton Grigory. He was one of us. No longer. Where is he now? He joined the Italians. He was working with them all along. We would have killed him, but they offered him protection. You could have still killed him. It would have started a gang war. Which Italian family? The Italian mafia had five families, each one of them working in mutually agreed territories. Fiorentini. That's? I know who they are. Delmo Fiorentini's family was the third largest in the city, and operated in the northeastern part of the city. It was rumored that the family's gun-running business had supplied weapons to homegrown terrorist cells. The NYPD had questioned Delmo Fiorentini several times and each time had to reluctantly let him go. The FBI had arrested him a few times and each time Fiorentini had walked free. No actionable evidence. He's based in Atlantic City, Vasily Yurovich said, trying to be helpful. He's the only mafia boss based there. All the rest are in New York. Zeb didn't reply. He knew of the family. He knew of all the major gangs in the city. Do you know why he would be involved in that kidnapping? Zeb asked Igor. Those are your women? They are my friends. Zeb's voice was arctic. I don't know anything about him. He was a soldier. Competent. That's all I know. We weren't friends. We weren't close, Igor replied quickly. The door burst open and a bunch of armed men poured in, their weapons trained on Zeb and Broker. Boss, are you all right? One of them yelled at Yurovich in Russian. Da. He's fine. Can't you see? Zeb replied in the same language and locked eyes with the Russian gang boss. Ask them to behave and you'll live. Yurovich stared at him. His men filled the room. They outnumbered the two visitors. And yet, this stranger was calmly telling him that he would die. Who are you? You don't want to know. Zeb turned and walked out of the door, not one heavy blocking his route. Chapter 5 Bawana and Roger were in Hanoi when they got the message from Zeb. They were working with the Vietnamese police forces, tracking down an international drug runner. They had finally captured the criminals and were interrogating one of them when their cells buzzed. They were in a holding room along with Hanoi police chief Cam Van Lan. Just the three of them and the bearded man handcuffed to a table. Phu Duc was the drug lord of Southeast Asia. He used women and children as couriers, transporting drugs in their stomachs. He was vicious and ruthless, one of the most wanted men in the world. Bawana and Roger had picked his scent up in Mexico and tracked it back to Vietnam. In the steamy jungles of that country, they had destroyed several cookshops that Duck ran and put down several of his men. Along with the Hanoi police, they had cornered the criminal in his mansion, deep in the remoteness of the country, and in a violent shootout, they had captured him. They had just started interrogating him when Bawana took Zeb's call. After hanging up, he whispered in Bear's ear. Problem? Van Lan looked at Bawana and then Roger, 
sensing something behind their ominous expressions. For him. Bawana jerked his head at Fu Duck, who sat insolently in his chair. Sir, if you leave us alone with him, you'll get all the intel you want. Van Lan knew them well. He knew their methods. Time was critical since Fu Duck was holding back on a major shipment, one that involved 15 girls, captured from Vietnamese villages. We can't, the police chief protested. You can't, sir. We can, Bawana told him. He cannot be marked, Van Lan whispered and left the cell. You think this is Hollywood? Fu Duck sneered at them. There are laws you have to follow. Rules. Bawana approached him, the expression on his face making the hardened criminal flinch. Bawana grasped his hair and smashed his face brutally on the steel table. In my world, laws are for those who obey them. They left two hours later, after Fu Duck had spilled the details of his entire operation. It was raining. The sky was dark, just the way they felt. The air smelled fresh and the streets were alive with traffic and vendors and officegoers and homemakers, despite the downpour. They sat in the cab silently, looking out as the rain splattered and ran down the windows, blurring the world outside. If anything happens to them, Bawana rumbled and didn't complete his sentence. He didn't have to. Roger knew. If the twins were harmed in any way or much worse happened to them, blood would be shed. London was five hours ahead of New York, and it was one and when Bear and Chloe got Zeb's call. They were geared up in armor, protective helmets, and headpieces. They were with five elite cops and were driving to East London when Chloe took Zeb's call. She listened. Asked one question, gave an answer, and hung up. Beth and Meg. She flexed her fingers, keeping her voice low and steady. What about them? Bear asked. They've been kidnapped. They drove up in two vehicles, a couple of streets away from their target house. The house, a row house in Forest Gate, was believed to be occupied by a terrorist cell. The agency had heard of them when they had taken down a cell in Iraq. Bear and Chloe had flown to London and had shared their intel with Sir Alex Thompson, head of MI6. Sir Alex had brought in MI5 and Scotland Yard, and a joint operation had been authorized. Bear and Chloe had insisted on joining the takedown team, a request that the MI6 chief had readily agreed to. Bear and Chloe brought up the rear of the second team, running silently in the dark night. Rows of white-doored red brick houses. Trash cans in front of several of them. Cars parked in driveways. The unique smell of London in the air. The sky orange from streetlights. Pools of water on the street from a recent shower. The team leader signaled, and the groups entered their target street. The house they were seeking was in the middle of a long chain of residences. It had a dirty yard. Beer cans and bottles glinted in the light. Another signal. Bear and Chloe's team, just the two of them and a counter-terrorism officer, went to the rear, jumping across neighboring fences, ducking below windows, and entering the backyard. It was small. Paved. It had a door to the house, one curtained window. They waited. The officer raised his hand when the order came over his headpiece. He kicked the door down and tossed a flashbang, crouching while Bear and Chloe covered him. And then the night exploded. Chapter 6 Their intel said the forest gatehouse had four men in it. From the initial burst of fire, it looked like there were more. Smoke and yells filled the house as the team at the front crashed in, Bawana and Chloe's team pincering in from the back. Chloe saw a shadowy figure on a staircase, a gun in his hand. She snapped around. The figure fell. Officers surrounded him. Voices rang out, ordering the men in the house to surrender. Rounds poured from the upper floor. Clear the ground floor, the team leader shouted. Their team's officer bent low, moving slowly in the narrow hallway while the other team went upstairs. The hallway opened into a living room on the right, a kitchen and dining room to the left, a small bathroom in the recess. They split up. 
Bear took the living room. Chloe and the officer took the rest. Shooting intensified as the other team battled with the men on the upper floor. Clear, Bear murmured after checking out the living room. He went to the hallway, alert, waiting for Chloe and the officer to emerge. He squinted up the staircase but didn't see any of the fighting. It looked like it was concentrated in the bedrooms. The officer entered the hallway, gave a thumbs up, Chloe behind him. The officer switched his assault rifle to his left hand, removed his helmet, and wiped the sweat off his forehead. Looks like we missed all the fun. He grinned. He was facing Bear, the stairway to his left. He didn't see the concealed door beneath the stairway open. Didn't spot the bearded man emerge, gun arm extended, aiming. Hostile. Bear and Chloe warned simultaneously. Chloe threw herself at the officer and brought him down. Her right hand extended instinctively. Her round punched the shooter's left shoulder. Bullets whizzed through the air over her head and embedded in the wall behind her. She corrected. Triggered, and the hostile went down when Bear joined in the firing. She covered Bear as he inspected the cunningly disguised room and gave the all clear. The officer rose and inspected the dead man. He turned around and fingered the holes in the wall. Shook his head ruefully. Glad I missed the fun. Three hours later, Bear and Chloe were at Heathrow. Their faces were grim, and other travelers gave them a wide berth, sensing something in their demeanor. Just yesterday, Chloe said, breaking their silence, I bought those shortbread cookies for them. Bear didn't say anything. He had been with Chloe as she had bought the gifts. Not just the cookies, but also a scarf for Meg and a Burberry jacket for Beth. They boarded their flight and when it rose off the ground, they stretched out and willed themselves to sleep. Rest was important, wherever and whenever they could get it, because they would be relentless until they got their friends back. Day 2 Zeb rose early and went for his run in Central Park. Alone in the green he let the beast loose and it filled him, dark and raging, making him pound the track, leaving behind other runners. I will get them back. The beast roared in agreement. I will not let them die. Not like my wife and son. The beast howled. His tea was dripping by the time he slowed to a jog. He went through his martial arts sequence, keeping his eyes away from the clearing the twins used to favor. He was toweling his face dry, approaching their office, when he spotted Broker waiting impatiently in the lobby. What? They found the ambulance. And two bodies. Zeb froze. No, Broker replied quickly. The two men inside the ambulance. Caton and the other dude. The ambulance had been found in the Forked River Service area, on the Garden State Parkway, in New Jersey. An inquisitive seven-year-old boy had wandered off to the vehicle, pulled open its doors and screamed on seeing the bodies. The ambulance was surrounded by cops by the time Broker and Zeb reached it at 10 a.m. Zeb had driven out of the city, powering through the traffic, leaving his friend clutching his seat tightly. We won't rescue them if you splatter us against a truck, Broker had admonished his friend. Zeb had pressed the pedal harder in reply. Chong broke off when he spied Zeb and Broker approaching. The inevitable crowd had gathered, held at bay by state troopers. There were NYPD cruisers and various other vehicles parked around the ambulance, keeping it away from prying eyes and cell phones. The rest area has cameras. Chong chewed on gum as he greeted them. The ambulance came in at night. Around 10 p.m. No footage of what went on. Nothing. Broker asked incredulously. Nada. There's the clip of the vehicle rolling in and coming to a stop where it is. That's all. Zeb brushed past them and found his way blocked by a burly trooper. He gave him a cold stare until Chong called out from behind. Let him through, he's one of us. Zeb kept going till he approached the open doors. White-coated technicians were dusting the vehicle, taking photographs, and doing whatever forensic technicians did. 
he stayed out of their way and peered inside. Caton was recognizable, despite the hole in his temple. The other man had a similar hole. Both were dressed in dark tees, track pants, and white sneakers. Any women's clothing? he asked a technician. Just the bodies. A shout from another technician. Hair. Female hair. He raised a pair of tweezers to the light and brought several strands of hair to the light. They were brown. You got DNA records for them. Pazaka came up to Zeb. Yeah, brokers got them. The DNA records matched. Megan's. The hair had been found on a side wall where the inside paint had chipped. Saliva. Zeb asked the cops. Any traces of saliva? Pazaka trotted off to ask the technicians while Chong eyed Zeb curiously. Why would there be saliva? Meg. She'd know we would be hunting. She would leave traces of their presence. The hair could have been an accident. No. He's right. Pazaka returned, panting. Another technician found saliva on the floorboards. That too is a match. What does it all mean? Chong turned on his heel and surveyed the scene. Neither Zeb nor Broker replied, and when Chong quirked his eyebrows at them, Broker said simply, It means we are going to ask Delmo Fiorentini. Chapter 7 Atlantic City was not the first choice base for four of the five Italian mafia families, but then, Delmo Fiorentini didn't consider himself to be like any of the other mafia bosses. He had a medium-sized build, and while he was in his 60s, he paid a lot of attention to appearances. His hair was thick, black and glossy. The finest cosmetic surgeons had worked on his face, and it looked wise. His personal trainer took him through a vigorous regimen each day, and the end result was that Fiorentini looked like a well-aged Hollywood star. He didn't have the youth, but he could still turn heads. Fiorentini loved to bash heads, something that he had picked up from that movie about Al Capone. He had a baseball bat handy in his office, and whenever he picked it up, his underlings trembled. Fiorentini scoffed at the old world style of the other families. He was modern. Being modern required one to keep up with the times. Parts of his business were traditional, but he had diversified. Cybercrime was big and growing. He had hackers in his 300-people-strong gang who pirated credit cards and ran scams. Gunrunning was an old revenue stream, but who one sold weapons to mattered. Some customers paid more than others, even if those customers were blacklisted by the other families. Fiorentini did business with anyone who paid. None of this untouchable customer business for him. If terrorists came to his door and had cash, he would sell them arms. Heat from the FBI and the other law enforcement agencies? There was such a thing as proof, and not once had Fiorentini been convicted. And in any case, how did one know who was a terrorist and who wasn't? Fiorentini lounged on his couch, high above the floors of his casino, the Gold Rush, while his flunkies gave him his daily briefing. The baseball bat lay handy, but as yet, he had no cause to use it. Frank Bucho, his chief hitter, stood next to him. Bucho was slim, ordinary-looking, until one looked into his eyes. They were flat, dead, emotionless. Bucho would cap a trader with the same expression he used to change the oil in his car. Of course, he never attended to his car himself. He had men for that. Bucho had risen up the ranks of the Fiorentini family. He had joined as an 11-year-old and had started his life in crime by holding up old men and women in dark alleys. His first kill had been when he had been 15, when he had slashed an elderly man who had resisted. His cold viciousness had come to the attention of Fiorentini, who had interviewed the boy and found out he was born in the streets. Drunk father. Absentee mother. Bucho was a survivor however, and his street smarts and calculating ways ensured he rose to the top of the Fiorentini family. There were the inevitable politics and resentment when the mafia boss took him under his wing. 
Bucho killed one street boss by cold-bloodedly executing him in front of his men. One moment, the street boss had been chatting with his soldiers. The next moment, Bucho had walked up to him, calmly drawn his gun, and shot him in the forehead. He threw another street boss off the 15th floor of an under-construction building in New Jersey. A site that Fiorentini owned. That was the end of the resentment against Frank Bucho. Street bosses still disliked and distrusted him, but they no longer complained to Fiorentini. When his underlings had left, Fiorentini turned on the TV and watched the news on mute. The sisters were still headline news, and why wouldn't they be? They were young, good-looking, and worked in a security firm. Their daring kidnapping had gotten all the channels into a frenzy. A TV reporter brushed her hair back in the blowing wind and outlined the scene at the Forked River rest stop. The ambulance was the same one she gushed in breathless excitement, and there were a couple of bodies in it. Not of Beth and Megan Peterson, she assured the watching public, but of two men who were most likely their kidnappers. She interviewed a couple of cops and then snagged Pazaka. Pazaka's shades glinted as he launched into a long spiel that essentially said the police were following many threads. You were careful. Fiorentini asked Bucho. Yeah. The other dudes came quickly. They were drugged. No trouble. You'd recognize them if you saw them. Nope. They were masked. Just two of them. What? Fiorentini demanded when Bucho broke off. He knew his lieutenant well. We should have stayed out of this. That security consulting firm. I looked it up. It's headed by one Zeb Carter. He has connections. We were paid well, Fiorentini defended himself, and you know my rule. We don't turn away customers. The last customer you personally handled nearly got you thrown in jail. The last customer was the leader of a homegrown terrorist cell in New Jersey. He had been arrested by the FBI and was negotiating a lenient sentence when Bucho had taken matters into his own hands. Bucho had arranged for the snitch to be shanked in prison, and that had saved Fiorentini. I am old Frank. How long do I have to live? They put me in prison, you take over. But as long as I am around, I will run our gang my way. The way I have always done. Fiorentini rose from his couch, went to the glass windows of the casino hotel, and looked out at Atlantic City. The gold rush, his casino, was one of the largest in the city. It was his pride and joy. It was where he had started, after inheriting it as a failing business from his father. Delmo Fiorentini had turned the casino around and used it as a launch pad to grow his family business. Back when his dad had been around, the Fiorentini family had been the smallest of the five mafia gangs. Now it was the third largest. All thanks to him, Delmo Fiorentini. He wasn't going to be told how to run his business, not even by his closest confidant. Besides, they just wanted our hitters, he tossed over his shoulder. Caton and a few men. The plan was theirs, the equipment was theirs. We just provided the men, and you took care of them. Who are they? The men who approached me are old customers. They run women down south. Why do they need these two women? Fiorentini swung around irritably. Boy, don't you know I never ask questions about customers' motives? For all I know, they could be a front for someone else. Before Bucho could answer, there was a knock on the door and it swung open. Two soldiers entered armed, alert. Behind them came two men, and bringing up the rear were three more soldiers. At the sight of the arrivals, Frank Bucho sucked in his breath. He knew trouble when he saw it. He recognized the two men in the middle. That man broker, from the consulting company's website. And Zeb Carter. Chapter 8 Who are they? Fiorentini demanded irritably, and cast a glance at the baseball bat. It had been some time since he had bashed anyone. Boss, that's Carter. The other man is broker, Bucho said softly. 
Bucho's soldiers brought the visitors to the center of the room and stepped back. Five soldiers behind Carter and Broker. Fiorentini and Bucho in front of them. Bucho gave an eye signal to one of his men, who went out and returned with three more soldiers. They crossed the room and stood alongside the mafia boss and Bucho. Who are you? Fiorentini rapped out when Bucho's men had settled in place. He was an Italian mafia boss. He had to display authority. Zeb Carter, the lean brown-haired man answered easily and nodded at his companion. That's Broker. Why are you here, Mr. Carter? Fiorentini ran his eyes up and down the visitors, noting their confident stance, and a cool wind blew through his mind. These men are dangerous. You disarmed them, he snapped at his men. No boss. They said they would start a firefight on the floors if we did, one hitter replied. Fiorentini's face darkened. You brought armed men to meet me, he thundered. Boss. Bucho plucked at his sleeve. We have them surrounded. Let's hear them. Listen to your man, Delmo. He gives good advice. The handsome man broker grinned. The smile faded and his green eyes grew flinty. You've heard of the Petersons' kidnapping. He pointed to the still-running TV. They're our friends. Your man Caton was involved. He's dead now. The other guy too. We want answers, Delmo, Carter interjected quietly. And we want to know where they are. And if I don't give them. It would be bad for your health. Delmo Fiorentini stared incredulously at Carter. He and his friend were surrounded by hitters. They were in the mafia boss's stronghold. And yet here he stood, threatening Fiorentini. You. Just the two of you? No sir, not just them, a voice called out from the door. A large black man stood at the door, standing as easily as Carter and Broker. By his side was a bearded man. He too was large. A third man appeared, model handsome, and lastly came a petite woman. All of them entered the room as one, the black man a step ahead. Who are you? Fiorentini's eyes narrowed. How did you get in? Victor, he roared in sudden rage. Victor's that black dude who was at the elevators. He's taking a nap. He and his friends. Fiorentini gritted his teeth. A vein throbbed in his temple, and he strove to clamp down on the red mist that was fast descending over him. Why did you grab them? It was Carter's matter-of-fact tone and demeanor that did it. The brown-haired man hadn't turned to watch the new arrivals. He alone had kept watching the mafia boss while everyone's eyes were on the four visitors. Who does he think he is? He comes to my... Boss, Bucho cautioned, reading Fiorentini's flushed face and narrowed eyes. Fiorentini's hand shot out. A forefinger extended, quivering in anger. You can go to. Bucho moved. A flickering draw so fast that it blinded everyone. His hand darted to his waist and emerged with a gun. Zeb exploded into action. Diving away. Not needing to warn his team because they were taking evasive action. Bucho's first round grazed Zeb's temple even as he was falling. Zeb drew. Snapped a shot. Missed. Bucho was no longer where he had been. He had leapt at Fiorentini and was lying over him. Triggering as fast as he could. Bucho's men unloaded. The office was large, but now it shrank with the presence of several armed men and one woman. All of them firing. Finish it off quickly, or else my team could get hurt. Zeb kept rolling desperately. Felt a hammer slam into his back. Gasped. Didn't let that slow his momentum. He was dimly aware of Bawana and Bear falling to the floor. Not hurt. Taking their time. Firing back at Bucho's men. Broker and Chloe at far ends. Taking cover behind furniture. Calmly joining the fight. 
Zeb came up against the wall. Turned around to see Bucho grab Fiorentini and hustle him to a concealed entrance, behind the protective ring of his men. Zeb ran. Stumbled when Bucho fired another shot and got him in the chest. Armor. Broker insisted on that. Body armor was good. It stopped a speeding bullet and subdued its killing impact. However, it still felt like a mule kick. Go, Buana yelled at him. Zeb went. Jammed his leg in the closing door. Narrow corridor. White walled. Footsteps ahead of him. Fiorentini shouting unintelligibly. Bucho calming him. Zeb turned a curve. Bucho and Fiorentini at an elevator door. Jabbing at buttons. Bucho turned. Zeb threw himself to the floor and fired instinctively. Bucho's rounds flew over his head. Zeb's round missed. He fired again, and just as the elevator door opened, he got Bucho in the chest. Another round, and red stained Bucho's jacket. The gunman fell. Fiorentini roared and grabbed his man. He ignored the waiting elevator. Used his lieutenant as cover and raised Bucho's gun hand, slipped his own finger over the trigger aimed at Zeb. No option. Fiorentini fell back when Zeb's round smashed into his forehead. From behind the sounds of the battle diminished and died. Sounds of groaning. Voices of surrender. The corridor was quiet, except for the elevator doors swishing as they tried to shut, came across Fiorentini's leg and opened again. Bawana and Bear came running, their guns out, faces taut. Bear went forward while Bawana bent over Zeb and turned him around. I'm good, Zeb told him. Got a couple of rounds in my vest. Fiorentini, he asked Bear, who was rising over the fallen men. Dead. So is Bucho. Back there. Zeb inclined his head at the mafia boss's office. They've surrendered. Some of them are down. Broker's got a scratch on his shoulder. No other injuries. Bawana was frowning as he helped Zeb up. That was plain stupid. Starting a fight there. What was Bucho thinking? And Fiorentini. Zeb had no answer. His eyes turned bleak and his lips thinned. Not only did he have no answers, they had made no progress in finding the twins. Beth and Meg were still missing. And he was still clueless. Chapter 9 Fiorentini's dead. So is Bucho. The old man in D.C. raised a gnarled hand heavenward and clenched it in quiet celebration as he listened to his man narrate the events at the Gold Rush. You're sure? Fiorentini is a wily fox. He has faked his death a couple of times before. Not this time, sir. Difficult to fake a death when you don't have a head. The watcher, who had been posted at the casino by the old man, outlined all that had happened. He had spoken to Bucho's men, those who had survived the shootout. Two hours had passed since the events. The casino was locked down. Cops swarmed in and around it. He had glimpsed Carter and his men and had sent their photographs to the old man. The old man's lips moved silently as he flicked through the pictures on his screen. Carter. Broker. Bawana Kayembe. Roger Fearden. Bear. Chloe. You knew this would happen, sir. I was hoping. Fiorentini was certifiably crazy. Anyone pushed him and he lost it. No one confronted him for just that reason. Carter did, and look what happened. This is a dangerous game, sir. In our business, every game is dangerous, son. Besides, this is the only way. If they find out, what will they do? The old man snorted. Send me to prison. Give me the needle? I don't fear either. This can blow up in our faces, sir. There's no other way, the old man shouted, spraying spittle across the room. He breathed harshly for long moments. 
Where are they now? He snapped at his man. Circling, just like you instructed. How are they? As we expected. The handover went well? Yeah. Bucho killed his own men and went away. Our men were masked? Yes, sir. Not that it matters now. Bucho's beyond talking. What should we do now, sir? Take them to the tunnel. That's a long way away, sir. Surely we can tackle the tunnel differently. You are questioning me again? Megan raised her head and looked around. They were inside a van. Just her and Beth. Wrists tied behind their backs. Ankles secured. Mouths gagged. The van jostled as it ran, and from the outside, she could hear the hum of tires on asphalt. Some highway. Roads too smooth to be anything else. She knew they had been drugged. Her memory was hazy. She remembered Beth and her entering the ambulance. Their shock at the two masked men who had sprung at them. Then nothing for a long time. She looked down at herself. She was wearing a tee and a pair of jeans that she didn't recognize. Sneakers that fit, a pair that she had never owned. Socks too. She peered beneath the neck of her tee and under the waistband of her jeans. Underwear that looked new. Her skin crawled at the thought of someone undressing her and getting new clothes on her. The clothes fit. The shoes too. They had our sizes. Probably disposed of our clothes and shoes. Which means they knew about the sensors. She had come to some time in the night when a door had slammed. Did I hear shots at night? She shook her head and grimaced when her head started pounding. A muffled sound caught her attention. Beth. She too was wearing different clothes. She was awake and was looking at her with wide eyes. Scared. Trying to be strong. We'll be all right. Zeb will come, she tried to convey with her eyes and hoped her face reflected confidence. Megan was the older twin only by a few minutes, but Elder was Elder in her book. And with that came responsibility. To protect her sister. They had lost their mom when they were young. She had helped her dad with bringing up Beth. And then that awful incident had happened at the university. Beth had been smack in the center of it. She had taken months to recover, and while she had healed fully, Meg knew at times her sister felt empty. Hollow. Megan had been around. Always. A friend had once told her it felt like she, Meg, had put her social life on hold for Beth. I haven't met the right person, she had laughed it off, and had meant it. But there was no denying she felt protective towards Beth. Her sister had grown, become mature, a strong confident woman in her own right. An integral part of the agency. She didn't need Meg to be her protector, and there were times she acidly reminded her elder sister of this. And yet. Now she's with trapped with me. Don't know why. Don't know where. Don't know if we'll live. She forced herself to wear a calm face and shifted to sit with Beth. They both faced the front, where a thick glass partition separated the cab from the back. She could see two men in the cab. The driver and a passenger. Both masked. Thin gloves on their hands. Long sleeve tops that covered their arms. A radio played softly and she could hear strains of music. Every now and then, the men wordlessly looked down at a screen. Her brow furrowed and cleared minutes later. They're typing messages on their cells. For the other to read. Beth seemed to have the same thought since she nodded instinctively. Which means they don't want us to overhear. So they're likely English speakers. The passenger felt her eyes and turned. Dark eyes. Brown or black. Seems to be clean shaven. Is he American? Who are you? she yelled. It came out as a mumble because of her gag. The masked man didn't reply. He turned to eye Beth. 
Why have you grabbed us? No answer. Megan hitched forward till her face was just inches away from the sheet of glass separating them. Holding his eyes, she leaned forward, waited for the vehicle's ride to smoothen, and then made her move. She smashed her forehead against the glass. Chapter 10 Her forehead split. A starburst pattern of blood smudged the thick glass. She reared her head back to strike again when the watcher shouted inarticulately, and his companion brought the vehicle to a halt. Both men strode out and flung the rear doors open. One of them got inside the van, bending low, as the sisters shaded their eyes from the bright light outside. Evening, Megan thought. We've been out for more than 24 hours. A highway for sure. Little traffic. She strained to look beyond the men, to see if there were road signs. She didn't spot any. The approaching man smashed her away easily as she lunged against him. She careened into the sidewall and the van rocked. He grabbed Beth by her hair and pulled her to her feet. A knife appeared in his hand and he pricked her neck with it till blood appeared. His eyes flicked at the separating glass. His message was clear. Behave, and your sister will live. He held Megan's eyes till she nodded, and only then removed the knife from Beth's neck. Megan rushed forward as Beth started collapsing, her eyes wide in shock, and took the force of the fall on her body. I've got you honey, she tried to tell her sister. Beth was whipcord tough, and on any other occasion would have joined her sister in attacking the men. Beth was weak with hunger and fatigue, however. She was still in shock. She collapsed on the floorboard, tears leaking from her eyes. We have to use a bathroom. We need food. Water? Megan yelled at the men from behind her gag. She glared at them, not knowing if they understood, while trying to cradle her sister. One of them seemed to look at her mockingly, and with that, a burning fury took hold of her. She rose without a second thought crossed to the door in one hop and butted the man the passenger in the chest. He was startled and then seemed to sneer. He slapped her, a heavy blow that felled her and slammed the door shut. One. Will. Not. Cry. Megan forced herself to calm down and turn to her sister, who had a look of shame on her face. Megan knew what Beth felt. She had let her sister down. No. Megan hunched over her and rubbed her face against Beth's hair. She got her to lean against the sidewall and inspected her neck. The trickle had stopped. It would heal. Don't put yourself down. We'll get through this. Together. She turned to the thick glass and found the passenger watching her. She let her eyes do the talking. I'll get you. This isn't over. They need a bathroom break. Food. We need to stop too. The passenger typed out on his cell and showed its screen to the driver. A few more hours he mouthed and the passenger nodded. It was dark by the time the vehicle slowed and entered a small town. The sisters were sleeping, but the vehicle's jostling woke them up. They peered through the glass. Watched the vehicle's headlights cut through night. The twin beams lit up wide roads, lawns, a few vehicles on a street. Houses. No one walking their dogs. No kids playing. No signs on the roads. The van turned and entered a street that seemed to have empty houses. It rolled to a stop in front of one. The rear doors opened and the two men beckoned them silently. Both were holding guns and looked as if they knew how to use them. The sisters got out of the van and stood for a moment without moving, letting blood flow through their bodies. Inhaling deeply, letting oxygen enter their bodies and clear their minds. The men shoved them towards a house. The driver unlocked it and pushed Megan inside. He didn't turn on any lights. He brought out a flashlight and led her to the kitchen, his gun prodding in her back. He had one hand digging into her shoulder, the other holding the weapon. No room to move or act. She looked back. Beth was similarly restrained. 
The kitchen counter had sandwiches and paper cartons. Water. The men freed the sisters, watching them carefully, and pointed them towards the food. Megan and Beth exchanged a glance. Food was good. Food, water, and sleep. It gave the body strength for the challenges that lay ahead. They ate, Megan murmuring to Beth, asking about her. Beth replied softly. She was better. Getting better. Do you know where we are? Her sister asked Megan, her lips barely moving. No. Some small town. I got that, babe. I saw that too. Beth's lips quirked and Megan warmed inside. Her sister was back. She would face the devil with Beth by her side. They took turns going to the bathroom while the men hung around, alert. Clean. The food was ready in the kitchen. Looks like this was a safe house. A lot of planning went into our abduction. These men are probably just the transporters, Megan surmised. Her eyes moved ceaselessly as she washed her hands. She opened the medicine cabinet. It was bare. She inspected herself in the mirror. Gaunt. Hollow-eyed. But alive. And her strength had returned. An impatient knock on the door. Their captors urging her to hurry. She was leaving the bathroom when an idea struck her. She went to the mirror, wet a finger and scrawled on it. All that she knew which wasn't much. She pressed both palms on its smooth surface and hurried out. Prayed that the men wouldn't enter the bathroom. Prayed that her writing would stay, but she was less confident about that. Closed her eyes in relief when their captors didn't enter the bathroom. The men were pros. They didn't give any room for the sisters to attack or escape as they bound them again. One man held a knife to one twin's throat while the other man secured the other. Who are you? Megan asked before the gag went over her mouth. No answer. She tried in Arabic and watched them minutely. No reaction. French. German. Italian. Nothing. Once outside, Megan got a good look at the street. White houses on either side. Vehicles. Not all of the homes were dark. A house diagonally opposite had a dim glow from inside. Must be 8 p.m. One of the men, the driver, stumbled on an uneven paving stone, and that gave her the opening. She leapt off the ground and kicked him in the back with both feet. Fell on her back with a sickening thud, but adrenaline was fueling her. Beth was reacting, lashing out with her feet. Megan rose quickly and drove into the driver with her head, ramming him back against the vehicle. She brought her elbows up and plunged them into his abdomen. The men recovered swiftly. The passenger grabbed Beth as she was attacking him, turned her around and crushed her face against the smooth side of the vehicle. The driver grunted, blocked Megan's head blows and slapped her repeatedly till her lips split. Some more. Megan didn't let up. The driver punched her in the abdomen, and that dropped her to the pavement. She rubbed her bleeding mouth on concrete before the driver yanked her and threw her inside the vehicle. The next moment they were speeding away, but in the vehicle, Beth and Megan were triumphant. They had won a small victory. Chapter 11 Zeb and his team were back in New York later that day. They had watched as the New Jersey state troopers and the NYPD cops questioned all the mafia hoods in the casino. Not one of them had any information on the sisters. He stood to one side as his crew conversed softly. He caught snatches of their conversation. Bawana and Roger updating Broker on how they had arrived. Chloe and Bear doing the same. None of them wisecracking as they would have normally done. Nothing, Chong huffed out in frustration when he came to them. About a hundred thugs in that place and not one lead. What about Fiorentini's cell phone computer? Office records? Bucho's cell. Broker prodded. We're on that. It'll take time. Time. 
the word hung in the air mocking them. They stopped at the Forked River rest stop on their way back to New York. They talked to the security chief and inspected his camera setup again. You got everything we had, the burly man grumped as he watched Broker and Roger finger equipment in his office. Asking me again isn't going to help. Why did the cameras go on the blink at that very moment? Broker turned towards him. They didn't, the security head defended himself. They spotted the van coming in and parking. Have you seen that parking lot? That's a lot of ground for the cameras to cover. More badgering didn't help, and they left shortly afterwards in two vehicles. Back in New York, they split up into pairs. Broker with Zeb, Bawana with Roger, Chloe with Bear. They went to the snitches they had developed over the years. They talked to gang members and criminals. Italian mafia, Russian mobsters, Ukrainian hitters, Hispanic hoods. They threatened and cajoled, requested and asked. Not one person knew of the twins' kidnapping. Broker didn't know what had woken him late that night. A feeling. He raised his head carefully and looked around their office. Bawana, Roger, Bear, and Chloe. They were all there. They had dropped on couches and sofas on their return, none of them feeling like going to the apartments each one of them had in the building. Zeb. He wasn't on his sofa. Broker searched in the dark office until he spotted a dark shadow at the window curtain. Zeb. His friend stood motionless, staring out into the night. A cruiser's siren wailed from far below, and blue and red flashes lit up the room and landed on Zeb's face. His eyes were narrow slits, his face grim. Something moved. Broker looked up to see Bawana standing next to him. How is he? Bawana whispered, his voice barely reaching Broker. Broker flung a hand out. You can see for yourself. He'll be back to his usual self when we find the sisters. And if we don't, then none of us will be the same again. Chapter 12 Day 3 New York was overcast, dark clouds hanging low in the sky. Similar to how they felt when they set out on their run. Six of them in black running suits. Bawana and Bear leading the way, Roger bringing up the rear, Zeb Broker and Chloe in the middle. Other runners and cyclists gave way. Gave them a wide berth. Some people stopped to look at them, as if the grim cloud surrounding them was visible. Sweat matted their hair and made their tees cling to their bodies as they went into their training moves. It was when they were winding down that Broker's cell rang. He broke away from them and wiped his face with a towel. Yeah? Something about the way he stilled got their attention. We'll set off. Right away. He thanked the caller and hung up. His eyes were glittering when he turned to the expectant faces. Crozet. The watcher had spoken to the old man at night, a call that hadn't gone down well. Those guys couldn't control two women, the cantankerous man had yelled. They were taken by surprise. The older one, Megan, charged at them when they were outside. They subdued both of them but feel one of the neighbors might have seen or heard something. The old man fell silent as he figured out the implications. You haven't gone to the house. No, sir. Too dangerous. Send a cleaning team. Let's not risk anything, not at this stage. The watcher had been half expecting that and had his cleaners ready. They were on their way to Crozet. Zeb and his friends showered swiftly, geared up, and headed to JFK in two black SUVs. They had several such vehicles in New York and stashed in major cities all over the country and around the world. The vehicles were kept at garages owned by veterans who maintained them, dropped them off and picked them up before and after missions. At JFK their Gulfstream was waiting, piloted by two experienced ex-Air Force men. The aircraft, the vehicles and their Columbus Avenue office were owned outright by Zeb and his crew. 
A Middle Eastern royal had gifted them a check several years ago, one with several zeros in it. An expression of his gratitude for rescuing his daughter from a slavery ring. They had declined the offer, however he had been insistent, and Broker and Zeb had made good use of the gift. After their purchases, a substantial sum had remained, which they had invested. Not one of them lacked materially, but none of them had joined the agency for the money. Crozet, in Albemarle County, Virginia. About 6,000 people. A small town near the Blue Ridge Mountains. A scenic town. Tourism breweries, employment in Charlottesville, which was close by. Broker briefed them while Zeb sped towards the airport, Roger driving the other vehicle, listening in. Through the vehicle speakers. A neighbor heard a disturbance last night. She looked out and thought she saw two men struggling with two women. Tires hummed while he took a breath. Traffic scattered out of the way like leaves flung out by a storm. She didn't give it much thought. It's a town with a very low crime rate. But she had a change of heart in the morning. Called her local PD. It got logged in. Chong and Pazaka heard of it. Asked the county police chief to secure the place. Do nothing till we got there. Beth would have, Roger began when they entered the aircraft. Its interiors were plush. Leather seats that reclined. A revolving table. Well-stocked kitchen. A bathroom with a jacuzzi. We know, Bawana cut him off. He dropped into his seat and closed his eyes. Zeb didn't pay them any attention. He knew what Roger was going to say. Beth loved to kick her shoes off and wriggle her toes into the leather. She would smile dreamily as she shifted her body in her seat. He glanced at his palms. They were steady. They had trembled that one time when he and Broker had realized the twins had been kidnapped. Not anymore. Inside he felt cold and emotionless. The beast had swallowed everything. Emotions, feelings would return once he got the twins back. And if he wasn't successful, he would be ice forever. They touched down 90 minutes later at Harrisonburg, where two black vehicles were awaiting them. Crozet was 50 miles away to the south, and an hour later at 12 p.m., they were rolling into the town. Broad leafy streets. Kids playing in parks and grounds. Tourists with their cameras. Away from Crozet Avenue were the residences, on quieter roads. Broker guided them to Hayden Lane and then onto Hayden Way, from which they took a left and approached a house. Its neighbors were separated by 200 yards of lawn and pavement. On the opposite side was a row of well-spaced homes. A couple of police cruisers were parked in front of their target house. A burly cop straightened when they emerged from their vehicles. Earl Coaster, County Chief of Police, he introduced himself to Zeb after removing his shades. Coaster gripped the hands of the rest of the operatives, his eyes running over them swiftly. Don't have much. Marge, he nodded at a house diagonally across, on whose porch a woman stood watching them, thought she heard yells and banging at night. She looked out of the window and saw four people jostling. Two of them women slim build. Two men dark-haired white. He waited for a reaction and when there was none continued, she came out of the house but the men had bundled them into the van and left. Nothing else? Chloe stepped forward. No ma'am. Not even a license plate number. It was a black van. There are millions of black vans in the country. She thought it was just two couples horsing around. She woke up, the running banners on TV reminded her, and she made the call. You looked inside the house. No ma'am. I got calls. I wasn't supposed to do anything till you arrived. He looked at them searchingly with a just who are you folks expression on his face. Chloe didn't enlighten him. Neither did anyone else. May I? Chloe asked him and gestured at the house. Sure ma'am. We got here an hour ago. We questioned Marge and the other neighbors. My men have kept everyone out of the house. 
Zeb broke away from Coaster and headed to the house. He stood for long moments trying to get a feel for it. Broker said it was empty. Had been vacant for over a year. Its owner was living in Mexico. He didn't sell or rent it out. He was heading down the drive when Chloe's shout stopped him. Something in her tone made him whirl and look back. He hurried over to where she stood, pointing at the concrete below. Dark brown stains. He knew what those were. He had seen many such discolorations in his life. Dried blood. Chapter 13 The county's forensic van was still some time away. Broker wasn't one for hanging around, however. He went to his vehicle and brought out a large black case. He donned a pair of gloves and with Chloe's help, lifted several flakes of dried blood from the pavement. He went back to the vehicle, Chloe helping him, and disappeared inside. Zeb went around the back of the house and inspected it. Narrow yard. Signs of periodic maintenance. White wooden fence, a small gate that opened into a large green space. Public ground, going by the paper cup rolling in the grass, and a child's tricycle on its side. The house had gray clapboard on the outside. Two stories. A porch. A double garage and a driveway. He came back to the front, where broker Bear and Roger were with Coaster and Marge. She looked in his direction. He didn't meet her eyes. He was looking beyond her, at Broker and Chloe. They had emerged from the vehicle and stood taut. It's Megan's, Chloe said her voice tight. Sure. Absolutely. Zeb ran to the door, his friends following him, all of them disregarding Kosler's startled shout. The door opened easily. Hallway. Living room. Bathroom. Kitchen. First glances. Glasses and plates next to the sink. He touched them. Dry. I'll get this, Broker said, Chloe with him. Zeb stepped back, letting them work. Chloe dusted. Broker lifted prints, digitized them, and ran them in his laptop. A lot of smudges in the kitchen, but nothing of use. They worked swiftly, efficiently. Practice honed over the years. Bathrooms, Zeb told them. Chloe nodded, not one of them questioning why. They knew. It looked like the house was a rest stop. The sisters would use the bathrooms. The bathroom on the ground floor had no prints. Chloe froze when she went upstairs. She beckoned silently, and they crowded behind her. Water had made trails down the mirror. It wasn't the marks she was pointing at, however. Next to them were two imprints. Faint, but the light and the angle they had were good. Two palm prints. It's hers, Broker confirmed an hour later. Nothing of Beth, but Megan was here for sure. Beth too, Chloe corrected him. The neighbor saw two women. Kosler had been joined by more of his people when they went outside. Officers in white coats stood outside a police van. You've ruined the site, Kosler said angrily when Zeb approached him. None of that evidence will be admissible now. Zeb didn't reply. He looked down the street, then up. No vehicles. No twin waving at him, grinning cheekily. You heard me, Carter. Kosler repeated. Yeah. No evidence will be needed. That's so. Why? Because nothing will go to court, Bawana growled and shut the cop down. It became dark by the time they finished scouring the town, speaking to several residents and convenience store employees. Marge was the only witness. They returned to their vehicles, Bawana and Bear's hands on their hips, Broker looking broodingly into the distance, Chloe at Zeb, expectantly. There was a solitary cruiser, two cops in it, to watch over the house. The officers didn't come out of their vehicles to greet them. Broker, those smudges on the mirror. Can you run algos on them? Yeah, why? 
See if Werner can detect any writing. Broker's lips compressed for a moment, then he sighed. I should have thought of that. Evening became night. They ate cold meals bought from a convenience store. Werner had returned with an answer. Those smudges seemed to be arbitrary. There could have been writing at one time, but the water had dried. We go south. Zeb finished his meal and dumped the box in a bin. South. Bear scratched his beard. Yeah. Can you be more specific? There's North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia. Lot of ground to cover. Besides, there aren't many bad dudes in these parts that we have gone up against, Bawana added. South, because the twins are drifting south. Whoever's got them, Chloe chimed in to support Zeb. They left half an hour later, Zeb in the lead, Roger following. They were at the end of the street when Zeb looked in his mirror. He swore softly, slammed on the brake, and executed a tight U-turn. What? Roger yelled in his earpiece, and then he too fell silent. The house was lit with an orange glow. It was burning. Chapter 14 Possible Hostels Zeb warned as he neared the house and saw a couple of shadows dart towards an SUV. He floored the pedal and raced towards the vehicle, whose lights came on. He kept going. 30 feet away. 20. An arm came out of the vehicle. Two flashes and two rounds pinged off their hood. That's confirmation. Bear gripped the door handle tightly and glanced at Zeb, his eyes translating his move. The oncoming vehicle swerved at the last moment, just a couple of feet separating them. Bear flung his door open. Zeb grabbed his collar with his right hand. Bear drew his Glock and fired a long burst at the driver's window, from which two shadows were visible. The window shattered. Zeb executed a tight turn, barely noticing Roger's vehicle, which had gone over to the cruiser. Zeb lost time in the turn, giving the hostile vehicle a window to accelerate in. Going after them, Zeb told Roger. Gotcha. The cops are dead. The black SUV was racing by the time Zeb got his vehicle around. Bear punched the GPS and got a map of the town. Straight ahead is a dead end. A left, and then a right will take us out of town to I-81 going south. Zeb's response was to stomp on the pedal. Their vehicle had souped-up engines. It could outrace any cruiser despite its bulk. It could put any highway vehicle behind it. I don't think I hit anyone, Bear said after a while. You weren't the only one shooting. I got off a few rounds too, Chloe spoke up from the back. But I didn't hit anyone either. The fleeing vehicle made a sudden left, careening on two wheels before landing. Even through the thick glass they could hear the squeal of tires, and then the SUV disappeared behind a corner. Zeb followed, making their vehicle slide rather than lurch. There. The hostels were a hundred feet away. He surged ahead. Didn't turn away when a window seemed to roll down and a gun flashed at them. No rounds came their way. Too far. Too much jostling. They're getting desperate, Chloe murmured as she craned to look behind. No sign of Roger. Desperate. Alarm bells rang in Zeb. Roger. We're still at the house. Have called Kosler. He should be here any moment. There might be another vehicle. Other shooters. I hope there are, Roger replied quietly. Time we got some answers. Zeb ended the call. He followed the vehicle as it hung a right, swerved as a car came from the opposite direction, its driver honking angrily. Crozet was no place to go drag racing. They left the town behind, Zeb keeping well back, since the traffic had thickened as they reached the exit to I-81 South. I-81 South was three wide lanes. Empty. A couple of brake lights far ahead. No headlights behind. 
the attacker's vehicle put distance between them. Zeb closed it and came up on its right. They could see the passenger, who was looking right back at them. The driver, who was looking ahead intently. There seemed to be a third person in the back, but before Zeb could look for too long, the vehicle swung towards them. He fell back. The vehicle retreated to the fast lane and raced. He tried to catch up. The passenger side window rolled down, and a barrage of bullets flew towards them. They either flew harmlessly or impacted without causing any damage. All their SUVs were armor-plated, equipped with custom tires and various gadgets that would have felt at home in the Batmobile. The shooter's head peeked out for a moment, his eyes wide in their headlights. He jerked back inside when Chloe snapped a shot at him. Want them alive, Bear warned. Zeb made a third attempt, conscious that there were a pair of headlights coming from the rear. A semi. They can use it for cover and get away. He nosed ahead, came alongside the SUV. Its driver looked across at him, turned the wheel savagely, just as its windows rolled down and the two passengers started firing at them. Zeb didn't yield. He turned to meet the vehicle, intending to drive it off the road and up against the protective railings. He underestimated the weight of his own vehicle and overestimated that of the opposing SUV. His vehicle was heavy. It crashed into the hostel's ride, crushed its hood, and pushed it against the metal barriers. Metal screamed, yelled, and tore. From behind came a long, blaring horn as the approaching semi warned them. The shooters tried to get away. Their driver coaxed every drop of juice out of his engine. He left strips of paint and metallic skin behind as he tried to escape. Zeb kept him jammed. The passenger at the rear propped himself out, gun in one hand, something round in another. Watch out! Chloe yelled. Zeb was moving even before she had shouted. He jammed into reverse, pulling back as quickly as he could to get away from the grenade in the shooter's hand. The lethal object flew in a short curve and exploded a few feet ahead of them. The blast rocked their vehicle. Clumps of earth, stone and concrete rained on their SUV. No, he shouted when he saw what was happening through a small, clear patch of windscreen. The semi had been overtaking them when the grenade exploded. Its driver had swerved instinctively when he saw the explosion. He'd corrected too much, just as the hostile vehicle was pulling away, cutting lanes to get away from their SUV. It drove right into the path of the semi. 80,000 pounds on 18 wheels against 4,000 on 4. It was no contest. The semi-driver slammed on his brakes, but momentum was against him. His vehicle rammed into the SUV and flung it forward and upwards like a paper ball. Metal shrieked horrendously as it landed, skidded several feet and rolled onto its back, its wheels still turning furiously. The semi was in no better shape. Its trailer had given up the battle against mechanical and gravitational forces and torque. It yawed screechingly, swinging out across the road. It teetered on its multiple wheels until it fell over on its side, dragging its cab along with it. Zeb leapt out and ran towards the attacker's vehicle. A tire burst. Metal clanked. Engine still growled. There was smoke in the air. There was a long trail of plastic, rubber and vehicle parts strewn on the highway. He gave no thought to any of that. His Glock was held straight down. His eyes were intent on the vehicle. Need them alive. He slowed when he reached the SUV's carcass. Crouched to peer under its body. Bitterness flooded through him when he rose. His friends could read his expression. The hitters were all dead. Chapter 15 An hour later, they were still on the highway, which was now closed off, and had several cruisers and police vehicles on it. Several choppers circled in the sky. A couple of them were police helicopters, while the vast majority were media aircraft. 
floodlights had banished the night, and the flashing light bars on top of the cruisers turned it colorful. Kosler was there, as was a captain and the state troopers. An ambulance had transported the semi's driver, who was lucky to be alive, to hospital. Another police vehicle had taken away the dead hitters. Zeb had given his statement several times to the various police agencies. The captain was with him, Kosler by his side. You don't know these men, the captain asked again. No, sir. We saw the house was burning. We turned back and they opened fire on us. We gave chase and tried to stop them. You can see what happened. Zeb shrugged his shoulders. Grenade? You're sure of that? Yes, sir. I'm sure your people will confirm that. The captain broke away to confer with his officers in a low voice. Zeb took the opportunity to join his friends, who stood arms across their chests, watching expressionlessly. No IDs on any of them, Broker said out of the corner of his mouth. I got friendly with a cop who shared that with me. The cops had arrived soon, before any of them had an opportunity to check out the hitters or their vehicle. No VIN on the SUV either, Chloe added. Broker, you asked them how they got here so soon. They got a tip. An anonymous one. Not the semi's driver. Nope, not him. He was busy trying to save himself. They weren't trying to kill us. Zeb turned it over in his mind. Burn the house down. Erase any evidence. Get away, that was their mission. Aha, Broker agreed. Thing is, why did they wait so long to smoke the house? No team was close by. Bear ventured. And by the time they arrived, we were here. The cops too. They fell silent, pondering over Bear's angle, until they nodded, one by one. Feels right, Roger drawled, but how did they know we would be coming? They had access to the police database. Marge called it in. It got recorded. Chong spotted it. They did too. We got here by 12 p.m. What took them so long? Chloe argued. We were bunched together. Our Gulfstream's always on standby. We could move fast. Maybe their team members were scattered. And we don't know what time they got here. Maybe they showed up before us, but Kosler's presence put them off. Why did they kill the cops? None of them had any answer to that. This Carter, the old man said with grudging admiration, he doesn't do anything by halves, does he? He was watching his TV, which had live coverage of the incident on I-81 South. He didn't do much, the watcher replied. The team messed up. They should have waited for Carter and his people to clear Crozet before burning the house down. They're dead? Yes, sir. All of them. I called the cops as soon as Carter started giving chase. He didn't have to say that they could manage the cops and anything that they discovered. You watched? From a safe distance. The watcher had stayed well behind Carter and the two SUVs. He had parked on the hard shoulder when the crash had happened, and had watched through his binos. He was still in the same spot since the cops had stopped all traffic. He was in no hurry now. All evidence at the house had been burned up. The two cops who had spotted his men were beyond talking. And his team, the three men, would not be spilling any secrets. What about the packages? On the road. Heading to the border. The old man heaved himself out of his chair and went to a sideboard. He poured himself a shot of whiskey. Inhaled it for a few seconds before gulping down a sip. They need a clue. Otherwise they'll go around in circles. I'll think of something, the watcher promised. Traffic resumed late in the night, under the watchful eyes of the cops. Zeb and his team were at the crash site on the highway, having decided to sleep in their vehicles before resuming in the morning. I miss them, Bear said suddenly, as they leaned against their vehicles, cupping paper cups full of coffee, watching police officers clear one lane and then two lanes. 
No one said anything. An hour later, Chloe jumped off the hood of Zeb's SUV. Its front had caved in, but it was in sound running condition. She tightened her jacket around her and was climbing inside when Zeb spoke. Atlanta. That would take three or four hours to arrive from. All of them stiffened. They knew who was in Atlanta. The Road Ragers, a criminal motorcycle outfit that the agency had dismantled three years ago. The biker gang was the distribution arm of a drug-running operation that reached from South America to the southern states of the U.S. Zeb's team had busted the international gang and in a shootout with the Road Ragers, had taken down most of the bikers. Their leader Randy Bull Miller had threatened to capture and rape the twins. Bawana had rearranged his face before the cops had arrested him. He's out, Zeb continued. He was released earlier this year, after turning state's evidence for the feds. He revealed all that he knew on his Mexican suppliers. There's some chatter that he started the gang again, but it wasn't our problem anymore. He didn't have to elaborate. He saw the light dawning on their faces. Miller had regularly sent threatening letters to their Columbus Avenue office from prison. Each and every message had been addressed to the twins. Chapter 16 Day 4 They returned to Harrisonburg, where a silent man collected the keys to their vehicles. Their aircraft was waiting, its pilots expressing no surprise when Zeb gave them the new destination. Zeb updated Claire when they boarded the aircraft, and briefed Sean and Pazaka when it soared into the sky. The rising sun's rays touched its wings and turned them liquid gold. We checked out Bull Miller, Chong protested, his voice scratchy with sleep and exhaustion. And? Zeb asked, aware that Chloe and the others were looking at him, gauging his reaction to the cop's reply. And nothing, Chong replied in disgust. Atlanta PD questioned him. Cleared him. He's running a bar now, downtown. How did he fund that? He said he had some savings. Look, that's all cleared. Where are you guys? Hold up. You're going to Atlanta, aren't you? He accused Zeb. Zeb didn't reply. Zeb, we are working non-stop on the kidnapping. Pazaka is coordinating with the Virginia police and the state troopers. Got any leads? You know we don't, Chong retorted. But this is our number one case. Your barging in there won't help. You're leaving a body trail wherever you go. Zeb hung up on him. Broker let Werner loose on Miller while they flew. He was suspected of three murders, but nothing had ever been proven. In prison, he had shivved another inmate. Again, no witnesses. He had assaulted several women, his girlfriends. Not one had ever pressed charges. The feds had clamped down on the South American gangs based on his testimony, and that had given him a hall pass. We'll have to do this the hard way. Broker shut his screen down when he broke down the sparse intel on the biker. We'll have to ask him. Miller's bar was in downtown Atlanta, snug between an Italian restaurant and a bookstore. It was crowded and noisy when they reached it in the afternoon of that day. Five men and one woman all dressed in dark clothing, a flash of red at Chloe's throat, a scarf. They entered the bar and split up. Broker with Zeb, at a table. Bawana and Roger at the bar, the Texan smiling, making acquaintances easily, while Bear and Chloe went to the pool table. No Miller. Not many bikers. The bar catered to office-goers and tourists. It was an upscale establishment where one didn't see many hairy chests and tattooed forearms. They lingered while Roger worked his magic and found out that Miller made an appearance for an hour each evening. Get some bikes, Zeb told Bear and Bawana when he heard. They didn't question him. They had worked with him for too long and knew he would have a reason. They went outside and returned an hour later, Bear flashing a discreet thumbs up at Zeb. Miller arrived at 5 p.m., greeted a few patrons who looked like they were regulars, and went behind the bar. 
Randy Miller was huge. He was as tall as Baron Bawana, 6'4 in height, but was wider. He wore his red hair long, tied behind his head with a band. He was in a denim jacket over blue jeans. Black boots that sounded like gunshots as he walked on the wooden floor. Zeb and Broker ducked behind menus while the rest of the operatives concealed themselves behind other customers. Miller spoke with his bartenders, inspected a logbook, and disappeared into a small office behind the counter. He emerged after a while, backslapped his employees, cast a glance around the crowded establishment and went out. They followed him outside town, Bawana and Roger on one bike, Bear and Chloe on another, Zeb and Broker in their SUV. Miller was joined by three other bikers as they strung out on the asphalt, the throbbing of their pipes audible over traffic. He left Atlanta behind as the shadows grew longer. He stuck to I-20, going west, and when he was near Fulton County Airport, he exited the highway and took a smaller road. That turned into a dirt track, and his followers fell further behind to give him space. The dirt road went through thickets and passed a few shacks before widening into a clearing, at the end of which was a bar. It was a biker bar, going by the rows of neatly parked vehicles, and if anyone was in any doubt, its sign gave it away. The spare tire was carved into a wooden board. Two bike tires hung from either side of it. Bear and Chloe entered first and were assailed by a wall of noise. Bikers of all sizes lounged against the bar and crowded around tables. A few women too. Miller was nowhere to be seen. Chloe went deeper inside, a few whistles greeting her, Bear following after her. She found the ex-con at the pool table, cue stick in hand. You've been following me. Miller spoke without looking at her. The decibel level around him fell instantly. Miller finished chalking his cue stick and turned. His eyes narrowed when he took in Chloe and Bear behind her. I've seen you before. His eyes searched behind them and lingered on Bawana and Roger. The noise fell further. Bikers straightened and crowded behind the visitors when Miller snapped his fingers, his eyes glittering. You're the ones who took me down. Yeah, good memory, Chloe replied dryly. You aren't worth remembering, Miller shrugged indifferently, but those two sisters with you. His eyes widened. They're missing. You think I had something to do with that? You sent letters to them, so yeah. Miller shook his head. Not me. I wish I had them in my arms, though. They were well built. I bet sure I could. Chloe moved before he could finish. She grabbed his hair and smashed his head on the table. Chapter 17 The bar exploded. Bikers yelled and surged forward. I wouldn't, Bawana rumbled and produced his Glock. Roger waved his gun and kept the approaching men at bay. You think those pea shooters can stop us, a man growled. I don't know. Bawana pursed his lips. Why don't you find out? Miller struggled at the table, cursing and swearing, but Chloe didn't let up. She had kicked his feet from underneath him, and her hand kept his face pinned to the table. Where are they? What did you do to them? A gun cocked loudly before Miller could answer. Step back. A heavy step forward through the crowd, a Mossberg cradled in his arms. Chloe looked at him. He looked capable and determined. The pool room was small and had about ten men in it, not counting her friends. Most of the bikers were spread around the table. A couple were facing Bawana and Roger. Zeb and Broker were at the rear, standing watching. Zeb nodded at her imperceptibly, and she let Miller up. A shotgun makes a difference, doesn't it? The biker grinned unpleasantly, felt his jaw and spat blood. Now let me show you some hospitality. He swung. And with that, the bar exploded into action. Chloe ducked under his meaty arm, kneed him in the groin and gouged his eyes. Miller screamed and clawed at his face. Chloe punched him in the throat, aware of the shotgun booming, 
but she didn't falter. She was supremely confident in her friend's abilities. Ten armed bikers against the agency's operatives, who were driven by a cold rage. No contest. She grabbed Miller by his tee and headbutted him. She let him fall on the table as he sucked at air desperately, blood streaming down his face, his eyes clenched shut. She took a step back when two bikers rushed at her. The cue stick flew into her hands and became a weapon. Its pointed end thrust into one attacker's gut, making him wheeze. Her hands slid down the stick, and without missing a beat she sent its other end ripping into the second man's face. He howled in agony and collapsed. A glass case against the wall housed trophies and mementos. Movement in its reflection. She whirled and dropped to a knee. Thrust the stick into another biker's throat. Rolled on the dusty floor, flowed to her feet and jammed an elbow into an assailant's face. The men at the pool table fell away. The sounds of battle receded, and her vision widened to take in everything. Biwana clubbing a biker. Bear hurling one man against another. Roger breaking an attacker's arm. Broker disarming Mossberg man and kicking him down. Zeb standing unmoving where he was, his eyes flat. Stop. Stop. Miller groaned and rose slowly, unsteadily. He cupped his face with a large hand, breathing torturously. His one good eye blinked, his shaggy head turning on his neck as he took in the scene. The pool room was destroyed. Most of his men were down. Moaning and swearing filled the room. The bar had emptied, but for the occupants of the pool room. I had nothing to do with their kidnapping. The words spilled out of his swollen lips. You threatened them when you were in prison, Chloe hissed. Miller's head dropped. I wanted to get back at all of you. They seemed like an easy target. He crashed back when Chloe broke his jaw with a punch. The cops arrived half an hour later, alerted by a customer in the bar, a couple of ambulances following. They questioned Miller, the brawlers in the pool room, Chloe and the operatives. All of them shrugged. We argued about a game. Miller tried to smile. We had too many beers. The cops looked searchingly around. Heads were nodding to Miller's words. There were several dislocated shoulders and broken jaws. Some noses were busted and many eyes were swollen. All guns had disappeared out of sight, mysteriously. The cops whispered among themselves and left with a word of warning. They had enough on their plate. Sorting out an alcohol-fueled brawl wasn't high on the priority list. The ambulances left shortly after, carting away those who needed urgent care. Miller nursed his face with a wet towel and watched Chloe confer with her friends. His eyes paused on Zeb and something deep inside him clenched. You'd better be speaking the truth, Chloe came back to him. I am. I had no involvement. You heard anything? No. He shook his head. You starting your gang again? He yelped when she grabbed his hair and raised his head. Keep clean. You'll live longer. He met her cold, hard eyes and believed her. He stopped her when she was leaving and gestured at Zeb, who was stepping out of the bar. He always gets women to do his job, he summoned his courage and sneered. Something turned in her eyes and he took a step back. You're lucky he didn't take a hand. Why, he blustered. You would have been beyond talking. Beyond living. For just writing those letters. Chapter 18 You didn't leave them a clue. The old man cursed his man. The watcher gritted his teeth but kept silent. He had worked with the old man for a long time. He had a lot of respect for him, but there were times when the elder man sorely tested him. I'm waiting, the caller berated him. They'll get their clue tomorrow, sir. Why not today? His boss yelled. 
It wouldn't have been appropriate, the watcher snapped. The packages have to be closer to the border for the clue to make any sense. And in that one day, they took a detour to Atlanta. Wasted time. I know, the watcher grated. It was me who told you. He had followed Carter to Harrisonburg Airport and had called the old man once the Gulf Stream had lifted off. His boss had done some digging and said the plane was heading to Atlanta. He's going after Miller, the elder man had added. The watcher took a chartered flight a couple of hours behind Carter and went directly to Miller's bar, the spare wheel outside Atlanta. The watcher was in Miller's bar when Carter entered along with his crew. He watched as the woman took Miller down neatly and her friends dismantled the brawlers. The watcher was an experienced killer. He had survived several missions. He had waged war in many countries and had come up against silent deadly men. He couldn't help being impressed by Carter's team as he watched. He'd left before the cops arrived and called the old man from his car. Miller is a bonus, his boss chortled. He wasn't on our list, but I think they've put the fear of God in him. He won't be reviving his gang anytime soon. The watcher agreed. He had seen Miller's face when the woman had finished with him. The biker was a frightened man. Tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow. They'll be back on track, he promised and hung up. Megan knew it was the fourth night since their abduction. She thought they were heading south but had nothing to base that on. It was just a hunch. Their captors had halted a few times at other safe houses to let them eat and relieve themselves. At each house she had tried to leave clues but as time passed she grew increasingly disheartened. She wore her game face however and whispered words of encouragement to her sister. Beth was taking it as well as she could but Megan didn't miss the haunted look in her eyes. Their captors gagged them at all times and administered some kind of sleeping drug through a needle. She and Beth had struggled initially, but the men were too strong and too well trained for them. Most of their journey passed in a blur of sleep, and when they were awake, they were usually disoriented. It was only at the safe houses that her alertness returned. But there wasn't much she could do. Until they came to that gas station. Her drug had worn off for some reason at that time. She had woken up, raised her head dully and noticed they had stopped. They were still in the van, but from outside she could hear faint voices and thought she heard traffic. That energized her. She yelled as loudly as the gag allowed her. She slammed herself back against the van's walls and made the vehicle rock. She kicked at the inside. Anything to make the vehicle move and attract the attention of passers-by. Maybe someone would become curious and would either call it in or question their captors. Either scenario suited her. Her motion woke Beth, who looked at her dazedly. Got to rock the vehicle, she yelled from behind the gag. She didn't know if Beth understood, but her sister threw her body around too, and the two of them made the van sway on its shocks. Hope ignited inside her when a voice shouted. There was the sound of running feet, and then she felt their captors enter the cab. The thick glass separating them was uncovered, and for a second the passenger locked eyes with her. Then the van was moving again, and the hope had died. Chapter 19 Day 5 They had spent the previous night in Atlanta, questioning Miller's associates, double-checking his story. Broker and Chloe had gotten him to draw a timeline of his whereabouts for the last 10 days, and they split into pairs to verify the details. It's not him, Bawana said glumly when they met for breakfast, voicing his friend's thoughts. I wanted it to be him so badly. He doesn't have the smarts. Broker slathered butter on his toast and bit into it with a satisfying crunch. Zeb played with his glass of juice, a distant look in his eyes. Broker, you ran those oil and paint samples, didn't you? Back at Crozet, they had found oil spots where Marge said the van had been parked. They had also found a few flakes of paint. Sure did. Oil and paint. 
they don't have a distinctive signature. They could match a million other vehicles out there. Zeb brought up a map on his screen. They had a 12-hour lead on us at Crozet. Yeah. But we lost a day here in Atlanta. They're 36 hours ahead of us. Assuming they're driving non-stop. And assuming they're still on the road. They watched Zeb as he played with an algo that drew pins on a map of the country. They've been heading south all along, he murmured to himself, and deleted all the flags that were above Crozet. That left pins around the Gulf of Mexico, inland, towards the southwest and around the border. He brooded in silence, aware that the beast wanted action, wanted to move. Movement is not action, he told himself. We have to head in the right direction. Why are they taking the road? Because it's the safest, came the chorus of answers. Airports, train stations, they have cameras, Zeb, Chloe told him exasperatedly. Surely you know that. Megan would have. She cut herself off and dug into her food savagely. You're listening to everything. Bear ventured at Broker, pushing his plate away moodily. His friend snorted in reply. Of course, he had gotten Werner to listen to chatter, track camera feeds across the country, monitor anything that was off. The downside with such large-scale intel gathering was the sheer volume of data. Broker had hooked Werner into a grid computer network, harnessing the power of thousands of machines all across the world. Still, that required time. And time and circumstances weren't favoring them. They climbed into their vehicles at 10 am, and Zeb set off south. They hadn't cleared the city when Chong called. Those hitters in Crozet, he began without preamble, no IDs on them. They don't exist in the system. Zeb grunted in response. He wasn't surprised. The kidnappers had shown themselves to be resourceful. He wasn't expecting rookie mistakes from them. Randy Miller's clear. We checked him out thoroughly. We know that too, Chloe butted in from behind. Tell us something new. Okay, Chong seemed to have a smile in his voice. This is a long shot. I've got. Chong spit it out or I'll come over there and beat it out of you. Whoa. Hold up, Haas, he chuckled and then grew serious. Heard of a town called Riviera? Zeb looked at Broker who shrugged. He met Chloe's eyes in the mirror. She shook her head. That's in my home state, isn't it? Roger drawled in their earpieces. Near the border. Nothing in that town. Yeah, Chong agreed. Thing is, the gas station attendant called the local PD at night. He said a black van had arrived in his parking lot at night. It seemed to move. Vans move, Chan. They've got wheels. Something called an engine. Just because the twins' disappearance was weighing heavily on them, didn't mean Chloe had to go easy on the cops. Yes, yeah, smartass. But get this. He said the van rocked as if there was someone inside. The driver. Passengers. Nada. There were two men in the van. Both of them were at the counter. He thought the van had illegal immigrants in it. That town sees a lot of such traffic. He said the driver and passenger were dark-haired. Zeb was turning at a light even as Chan was briefing them. To the Atlanta airport. The closest airfield to Riviera was Corpus Christi International Airport in South Texas. Flight time of two hours from Atlanta. A commercial flight would take longer because of connections. They weren't flying commercial. Zeb listened to his friend's talk as he settled into the aircraft. Riviera's small. Just about 2,000 people. Farming town. Corpus Christi, the nearest city, is a coastal town on the Gulf of Mexico. 300,000 people. Chong had alerted the cops and asked them to watch out for the twins. The marina and the port at Corpus Christi were on high alert. The state troopers had been recruited, and along with the Corpus Christi PD, were patrolling the waterfront. 
Not just patrol, Chong, Bear was arguing with the cop, they need to search. They need to stop all outgoing traffic. I know my job, Chong came back irritably. Clayburg County PD have already been to the gas station in Riviera. Bear? Zeb called out. Bear looked up, met Zeb's eyes, took a deep breath and lay back on his seat. Owners running searches on the ships and boats at Corpus Christi Port. Owners' destination logs, all that stuff. Broker looked at all of them. If they're on the water, we'll find them. Chapter 20 They had to wait for a while at Corpus Christi International Airport for their SUVs to arrive. Their nearest garage was in San Antonio, two hours away. A pileup on the highway meant they lost 45 minutes. Nothing much we can do. Roger fingered his shades and automatically flashed a smile at a woman who looked at him. He had the looks and the personality to be a movie star. He attracted female attention wherever he went. These weren't normal times. He hadn't once engaged any woman in conversation. The Riviera gas station was just off US 77 and had the universal layout. Several pumps beneath a concrete overhang. A subway. A convenience store. Green fields on the other side of the road. A set of lights on a crossroad half a mile away. Zeb entered the convenience store attached to the gas station. Four tills, just one clerk behind the one in the middle. He approached the pimply-faced man, remembering Chang's description of the attendant. Zeb removed his business card, the one that had the NYPD credentials on it. You called in that van? The attendant inspected the card, looked at Zeb and swallowed. Yes, sir. I told the cops what I saw. Yeah, Zeb said, nodding reassuringly. We're from the New York police. Just wanted to double check. Can you show us where the van was parked? The attendant closed his register and led them outside. He pointed to the pump where the van had fueled. They paid in cash. How many men? Two ma'am. The attendant colored under Chloe's steady gaze. He seemed to relax when she smiled broadly at him. They were about. He looked at her, then at Bawana, then Bear finally settling on Zeb. Your height. Zeb was 6'1". Short hair. Dark. Not black but possibly dark brown. They finished fueling, hung around and then came inside. Bought sandwiches, bottles of water. How many? Zeb asked. The attendant squinted his eyes in confusion and then his brow cleared. How many sandwiches and waters? Zeb nodded. Eight sandwiches and a twelve-pack of water. You heard them speak. No, sir. I mean, one of them spoke in English to me, but I didn't overhear their conversation. When did you notice the van? When they were paying. I saw it move from the corner of my eye. As if someone was moving inside. It started rocking noticeably. I broke off and stared at it. Then one of them said something, I don't remember. They finished paying, ran out, and drove away. He stopped talking when he spotted Broker and Roger in the parking lot. Broker had a plastic baggie in one hand, a pair of tweezers in another, and was scraping something off the asphalt. It's all right? Zeb followed his eyes, my friends are collecting possible evidence. What were they wearing? Nothing memorable, the attendant replied, his eyes still on the man outside. He didn't have much more than what he had revealed. He would have a hard time recognizing them again, he said. The men had ordinary-looking faces. Yeah, the cops dusted the gas station. Took prints. They came earlier today, he confirmed when Chloe asked him a question. Zeb wandered around trying to picture the night. No other traffic. Just the van. Two men who've been driving a lot. They get out. Stretch their legs. Fill up. Come inside. Stock up on food and water. 
Go to the counter to pay. He stopped suddenly, his eyes on a security camera. How many of those do you have? He pointed to the device. Four inside, sir. Two outside. The police made copies, took them. Zeb looked at Chloe, who nodded and stepped outside to call Chong. Can we see the feeds? The feeds didn't have anything more than what the attendant had told them. Not one of the cameras had caught the two men full on. It was as if they knew there was surveillance and had their faces down at all times. Can you make a copy for us? The attendant looked dubiously at Zeb. There's nothing on it. Just lot of video, sir. The cops have a copy like I told you. I want it. Zeb looked over his head out the window, to where Broker and Roger were huddled over the open door of their vehicle. He sensed the tautness in them and knew at once. I still want it, he repeated and went outside. Good probability. Broker controlled his excitement. The machine, he pointed to another black box on the rear seat of the SUV, says the oil spots and the paint flakes here are a decent match for those in Crozet. You can tell the time? How old those spots were? Nah. We don't need to, Chloe interrupted, joining them. I questioned the attendant again. He said the van was the only vehicle to fuel at the pump for the last 24 hours. He didn't tell me that. Zeb, have you seen yourself? Your face. It scares people. My female charm, on the other hand. She tossed a USB drive at Broker, who caught it deftly. Let's find a place to eat while Broker runs that footage. We can check whether other cameras exist. See where that van went. Maybe it went to Corpus Christi. Broker can hack into the cameras in that town and look for the van. They drove out in the usual formation, Zeb ahead, Roger following. Zeb stopped at the red light at the crossroads. Roger pulled up a few feet behind. A gray sedan, a family in it, was opposite them, on the other side of the lights. A construction truck was on the road to their right. No vehicle to their left. In his side view mirror, two vehicles appeared, growing larger as they came closer. An SUV and a car. The light turned green. Zeb moved, Roger followed. And then the two fast-moving vehicles crashed into them. Chapter 21 Zeb had accelerated instinctively to get away when the SUV came up to them on his side. He had seen the sedan ram into Roger's vehicle. No room to move. Truck and sedan ahead. His door buckled. Rounds punched into their vehicle. At least four shooters, he warned and snapped a quick glance to his side. Broker, the only other occupant of his SUV, had slithered out from the passenger side. Zeb couldn't help grinning. His team. They didn't need to be told. They knew what had to be done. He wasn't worried about the attackers in the sedan. His friends and the others would deal with them. His smile faded as a masked man appeared in the other vehicle's window and poured lead at him. His SUV and the enemies were jammed at the hoods, at an angle. He stomped on the gas and forced his SUV deeper against the other. He saw shadows move. Broker, Roger, coming up from behind. Lacing fire at the sedan. Thunder filled the vehicle even through its toughened glass. Roger and the others, taking a hand. The hostile SUV backed off several inches, but the masked man at the window didn't. He continued shooting at Zeb, even though his rounds made no difference. We'll get them. They seem to be amateurs. Zeb prepared to leap out through the passenger door when the dynamics changed. The family's car, in its haste to get away, stalled. Right in front of the two SUVs. The masked man stopped shooting. He turned to look at it. Zeb looked at the car. A woman in the passenger seat. Red hair. Eyes wide in panic. Screaming. A child in the rear seat. 
the driver trying desperately to start his vehicle. The truck honking trying to ease past. He saw movement out of the corner of his eye. The gunman lifting his weapon. Saying something to the driver. The gunman spraying rounds at him again. The driver leaning out of the window. Shouting at the family. Fumbling for his gun. Zeb stopped slithering away. He threw himself on the seat lengthwise. His Glock came out in a blur. Left hand jabbed the window roll down button. Right hand raised his gun, its muzzle just above the window, triggering in a continuous burst. Bullets flew over his head. One nicked the heel of his shoe. He kept on firing. Quick mag change. Jerk up to peer. The shooter slumped, but the driver was pushing his door open. He shot a glance at the car. Still stalled. However, the woman had run out. What's she doing? Thought turned to action. He dived to the rear. Kicked the door open. Cover me, he yelled into his mouthpiece. I'm going over the roof. A second to balance himself. And to check where the driver was. He was almost out of the vehicle. Looking right at the woman who had stopped in front of the rear door. Her hands spread out. Protecting her baby. Zeb lunged. Grabbed the roof of the hostile vehicle with his left hand. Pushed off with his left leg. Swiveled and rolled across the roof. The driver came into sight. Masked. Jeans. Black shirt. AR-15 held competently. Pointing it towards the mom. Hey. Zeb yelled. The driver turned and raised his weapon desperately. Zeb rolled on his left shoulder, the roof smooth and cool under his tee. The unique smell of gunpowder in the air. Sounds of battle and someone screaming. Sirens in the distance. The truck still honking. The mother shouting desperately. He blanked everything out. The driver existed. His AR-15 was all that mattered. Its muzzle rose. His Glock bent down. Exhale. Bottom of respiratory cycle. Trigger pull. Gently. The driver fell back as if punched by a massive fist. The AR-15 flashed. A round whizzed past Zeb's head. He feathered the Glock again, and this time the driver didn't rise. He landed rolled and rose. Ma'am please get back in the car. You'll be fine, he called out urgently. Her fingers rose, wavered and pointed at him. Behind you, said Chloe in his earpiece, her voice tight. Zeb dove away. Turned midair. Brought his right hand up and shot a long stream at the hitter who had been approaching behind him. The shooter's body jerked and collapsed as several rounds punched into him, from Zeb as well as Chloe. Zeb fell on his left shoulder on the asphalt. Got up quickly. Checked the driver, the passenger, and the hostel who had come from behind. All dead. All clear, Bawana said in his ear as if discussing the weather. He straightened and went behind the attacker's vehicle and joined his team. Five other bodies sprawled out. Two in the sedan. Three on the road. Bear and Broker were crouching over one hitter on asphalt. Who are you? Broker demanded as Zeb went over to them. Bear had removed the gunman's mask to reveal a bearded face. Brown eyes. Brown hair. Tattoos on neck. The man's eyelids flickered. His lips moved and he stilled. Zeb's team split up. They searched the bodies and found no identifying papers. Lots of wallets. Several bills and bundles of cash. But no driver's licenses, nothing to name the attackers. They took pictures of the attackers, Broker would run those through Werner later. The sound of vehicles grew louder, sirens piercing the air. Drop your weapons, a voice called out through a bullhorn as police vehicles surrounded them. 
We're the good guys. Bear smiled disarmingly when a police officer took his details. Each one of them was questioned by expressionless officers bearing the Clayburg County logo. There were state troopers too. All of them wore shades. I thought Chong had informed the local police about us, Zeb telegraphed at Broker with his eyes. His friend shrugged. Mr. Carter, a trooper named Lockhart said, coming to Zeb. You're from New York? Searching for your missing friends. Kidnapped. Not missing. You know these shooters? Lockhart didn't bother to correct himself. Nope. Never saw them before. You know them. Lockhart's cell rang and he turned away to take the call. He stiffened initially, then shot a glance at Zeb. Relaxed yes sir Ed at the collar and hung up. You have powerful friends Mr. Carter. Lockhart gave orders to his men, who stepped away from the operatives. The county police huddled to one side. I don't like vigilantes Mr. Carter. It's best you leave quickly. Leave the detective work to the police. I'm sure they'll find your kidnapped friends. Lockhart. Yeah. Back off. Zeb spoke quietly, but there seemed to be something in his face that made the trooper pivot on his heels and walk away. You'll tell us who those shooters were, Zeb asked as retreating back. Lockhart didn't reply. Zeb broker hissed, getting his attention. What? We have to leave. Quickly. Why? I have something. Chapter 22 Broker was tight-lipped, playing with his screen, despite Zeb's repeated attempts to engage him. Just find a place to park, his friend finally said irritably. And eat. Chloe said she wanted a bite. Riviera wasn't large enough to have a main street. It had a bank. A fire station. County buildings. Zeb pulled up in front of a fast food joint, sending a thankful prayer that his vehicle still moved. It was damaged. Its front had caved in. But the engine turned over, and its wheels put concrete and asphalt behind. That was all that mattered. A customer emerged from the restaurant, balancing drinks and bags of food. He whistled when he saw Zeb's SUV. That's some remodeling. Not by choice, I'm guessing. Yeah, Zeb replied shortly. Being polite wasn't a problem. Being conversational when he had a lot else on his mind was. There's a garage down the road if you need that looked at. Zeb thanked him and held the door open for his friends, who commandeered a corner table. Bawana pushed another table over and joined the two so that all could sit. What do you have? Zeb asked before Broker had seated himself. Broker didn't look up from his screen. His fingers flew over his keyboard before he turned the screen around for them. Watch. They watched one of the men from the van wander around in the gas station, picking up sandwiches, balancing them in one hand. We've seen this. Nothing new here, Roger muttered in disgust. Broker held his finger up to silence him and pointed at the screen. Sandwich Man was now joined by his companion. They huddled, the backs of their heads to the camera. They seemed to speak, and then the second man reached into his pocket and pulled something out. More huddling. This time the heads bent closer to whatever second man was holding. Sandwich Man straightened, nodded, and hurried to pick bottles of water up. For a fraction of a second, there was a clear view of what was in second man's hand. A cell phone. Second man pocketed it and joined his friend, and they went to the counter. What's new? Roger challenged Broker. This. Broker grabbed the screen, punched more keys and brought up a video clip. It was in slow-mo and digitally enhanced. Broker had magnified the tape and run several algos on it. The interior of the gas station was blurred. The men's heads were faded. All that remained was second man's palm and the cell in it. The next shot was a close-up of the cell. 
Its screen was distinct, as were its keys. It was a well-known model, with a large screen. The third shot came on screen. This one had a text conversation. How are the packages? Good condition. Any damage? No. Even the older one? Yeah. Bring them to the point. Coordinates. The last message was a string of numbers and letters. Zeb reached across and played the clip again. His face tightened, the food that Chloe had ordered lay forgotten. Packages. Megan and Beth. The beast roared, and his vision darkened as he tightly grasped the side of the cheap dining table to control himself. Zeb. Zeb. Chloe's face swam in front of him concerned, forehead puckered anxiously. And just like that the beast dissolved. Everything became gray in his mind, and his iron control returned. Yeah I'm good. Bawana picked Broker's screen and replayed it. Passed it over to Bear, who watched it with Roger craning his head over his shoulder. The manager bustled over, intent on getting them to vacate the table, since there was a crowd forming at the door. She glanced at Zeb, didn't seem to like what she saw in him, and switched to Chloe quickly. We're almost done. Chloe smiled, and when the woman left she leaned forward urgently. Broker those coordinates. Where's the location? Near the border. Laredo. About two hours away from here. Their faces grew bleak. Laredo was a border town in Texas, separated from Mexico, by the Rio Grande. Nuevo Laredo was on the other side of the river, home to cartel violence. They could guess where the sisters were being hustled to. Let's go. Chloe rose abruptly. Hold up. Bear grasped her by the arm and stopped her. Let's finish our meal. She looked at him mutinously, sighed and settled down. He was right. Food, sleep and water couldn't be neglected. Especially when they were on a mission. She dug into her plate but stopped chewing when another thought struck her. Broker the van. Did the cameras catch its plates? I wasn't paying attention. I was. Nothing escapes me. He shook his head wryly. It's a Ford Transit Connect. Hundreds of thousands of those on the roads all over the country. It had a license plate. The number's fake. Chloe settled back in disappointment and then slid forward again. What about? I'm a genius. Broker held up a finger admonishingly. I'm way ahead of you. I ran a trace on the text message numbers. They're using a masking technology. There's software out there that takes the real number, wraps a dummy number over it, and you're good to go. You can't extract the real number? Nope. I thought you were a genius. Some people are never satisfied, he sighed. What's the plan? Bear asked when Broker shut the screen and stowed it away. We find them, Broker replied. I thought that was obvious. You're forgetting something. Bear frowned. What? Those hitters. Bear waved a large hand in exasperation, pointing in the general direction of the town. Someone sent them. Someone knew we would be here. Who are they? And how did they know? Zeb had been thinking along those lines. He didn't have answers, however, a thought struck him. Broker, you swept our vehicles? Yeah. Every day. We're clean. We'll find out who they are from Chong. Zeb drained his juice. Doesn't look like the local cops or the troopers will be very cooperative. Chong will find out and tell us. Our priority, however, is to find the twins. And if more hitters come at us, we go over them. I hope they do, Bawana said yearningly. I really hope they do. What? Zeb asked when he caught Broker's expression. His friend brought out a cell phone and placed it on the table. 
one of the hitter cells. Funny how it found its way inside my pocket. Too late to return it to the cops now. They would have gone. Broker raised his hands defensively when all of them gazed at him. I swear I had nothing to do with it. It must be one of those new models that can fly. What's on it? Despite the likelihood that the twins would be ferried across the border, he couldn't help but smile. Broker's definition of legal process was loose. Very loose. I would have done the same. This is Meg and Beth. I would and will break any law to get them back. Just one number, Broker replied. Incoming and outgoing calls. This is a cheap model. A disposable phone. Zeb picked it up, thumbed through the keys until the single number came up. He dialed it, and then put the call on speaker. Broker hurriedly got more equipment out of another black case, attached the cell phone to it, and unfolded a screen. The phone rang three times before it was answered. Where are you? The speaker demanded. I'm watching the news on TV. Everything's gone apeshit. He cut himself off. Dino, he asked cautiously. Dino's dead, Zeb replied coldly, and you will be too. Soon. The speaker hung up. Zeb tried again. The number was dead. Anyone recognize that voice? Head shook. Any luck, he asked broker. Dallas. He was moving. I have him in the downtown area, moving from one tower's range into another. He fell silent as he fired commands at Werner. Burner phone, he said under his breath, lost in his own world, bought at a Walmart six months back. He pursed his lips as he worked for the next ten minutes and then shook his head. Nothing more to go on. Send everything to Chong. He might have more luck. We still don't know how those dudes found us. Bear rose and stretched. Several eyes in the joint turned in his direction. He was broad, big and bearded. He stood out anywhere. We'll figure it out. We go to Laredo. Zeb shrugged into his jacket. The twins come first. Nothing and no one else matters. Chapter 23 the twins had lost track of time. They were asleep most of the time, and when they were awake, they were dazed. When the van stopped, they stumbled out, and their captors led them to a safe house. They kicked out futilely and were quickly subdued. Dark. That was all that registered with Megan. It was only when they were rolling that she correlated dark with night. This next leg was short. Maybe two hours. Megan was just slipping into a deep sleep when the van slowed and bumped over a pothole. The jolt woke her up and she raised her head to see her sister's eyes. They looked around, not that there was anything to see inside the van. The vehicle rolled to a stop and they heard a door open. The partition glass was covered and they got no hint from the front. The rear doors opened. One of their captors, the passenger, beckoned to them silently. Megan nudged Beth with her shoulder. You first. Beth rolled awkwardly, got to her knees, and knee walked to the rear. The man helped her out roughly, and then Megan followed. Stars. So many of them. That was Megan's first thought as she looked up at the night sky. She stood next to her sister, breathing deeply, while the men went around to the front. Cool air went inside her, filled her lungs, and with that, the cobwebs in her mind began to disappear. Her mind sharpened as she looked around. They were in a town. Remote part of one, she corrected herself. She could see lights in the distance. The sound of traffic. Closer to them were the shapes of houses. All dark. They had an abandoned feel to them. No streetlights where they were. Just thick darkness that was pierced by the faint starlight and the faraway city's glow. She could smell water. She peered and thought she saw brush. Beth came over and grunted through her gag. River. Or at least it sounded like that. 
There were thousands of rivers in the country, whichever direction they had gone. The men returned, and one of them cut their leg restraints while the other held a gun. They shoved them towards the line of trees and brush. Megan nodded at Beth, and they moved willingly. Let's see where this goes. They're expecting a fight. Let's do that when they're least expecting it. They needed to get their strength back. Walking in the fresh air would help. She was sure of one thing. The men weren't going to kill them, not right away. There was a bigger plan. She looked up and suddenly felt small and scared. And then Zeb came to mind, and her friends. They would be hunting. Hunting like never before. Rules and laws wouldn't exist for them. They would walk over anyone and demolish anything that stood in their way to rescue them. They're coming, she told herself. They didn't have to walk far. Twenty minutes brought them to the side of a house. It looked more like a shack. Run down. Roof half collapsed. The smell of water grew stronger. She could hear tires hum on a bridge in the distance. Over the tree line was the orange glow of lights. A river crossing. Boat. There was a large white stone outside the house near its door. She halted near it and bent double, as if out of breath. She spat through her gag and hoped it landed on the stone. She crossed her fingers behind her back and hoped the men wouldn't wipe it off. They didn't. They waited, not looking at them. Supremely confident in their abilities to subdue the sisters. She coughed and spat again just as the passenger shoved her towards the inside of the house. The interior was dark and smelled of stale air. There was trash littered inside. Plastic bags. Empty water bottles. Food cartons. Strips of paper. A transit house of some kind? The driver reached to a wall and swung the door shut, enclosing them in darkness. The passenger turned on a bulb and bathed them in dim light. Tiled floor. Cracked in several places. A broken washing machine in a corner. A stained mattress. Beer bottles. Megan took it all in swiftly, her senses on high alert. Why here? She got her answer when the two men went to a corner and moved a large, heavy barrel. Water sloshed out of it as they grunted and shifted it. Beneath it was a square hole, about three by three feet. And then she knew what the captors were planning. Both men were turning towards them when she yelled inarticulately and leapt off the ground, drawing her feet up. She kicked the driver in the chest and sent him crashing against the barrel. She was aware of Beth mimicking her, even as she fell. She landed hard on her back and rolled. Got to her knees swiftly and caught the driver in the chest with an elbow. It was awkward since her hands were still bound. It didn't carry her body weight. Still he gasped. He recovered swiftly, however. He parried her shoulder strike. Punched her in the gut, which sent fire lancing through her. Get his neck between your ankles. She tried to maneuver, headbutting him in the process, but her bound hand slowed her movements. That and the captivity had drained her. He punched her repeatedly till blood streamed from her nose and her mouth. Yes. Bleed some more. She smashed upward with all her body weight, like a cobra uncoiling, and the sheer power of her move flung him back. She got a knee on his chest and rammed him with her forehead, her blood turning his tea dark. Kept on hitting him, blind rage driving her on, until her hair was grasped suddenly and she was pulled back. She moaned and tried to turn, but before she could complete her move something slipped over her neck. Cold, metallic. A collar. It tightened and cut off her air. She gasped harshly, her eyes rolling back, and she fell off the driver. The chokehold loosened, and when she got oxygen inside she raised dull eyes. Beth lay a few feet away, wearing a similar collar. She felt a flicker of satisfaction when she saw her sister bleeding from a cut forehead and torn lips. She looked at the passenger, who was showing signs of combat. Way to go, girl. I hope you hurt him. 
The passenger raised something in his hand, like a remote control, and pressed a button. The metal collar around her neck squeezed suddenly. She gasped and flailed, nearly blacking out until he eased. The passenger held out his other hand, which had another remote. He pointed at Beth and at herself and raised his hands. His message was clear. He could control both of them. The driver hauled her up roughly and took her to the hole. He pushed her so that she nearly fell, but holding her shoulder, he guided her down a wooden ladder. And Megan knew their abduction had taken a turn for the worse. They were heading to Mexico via an illegal tunnel. Chapter 24 Day 6 Zeb and Roger drove while the other operatives slept. The dark was thick and heavy. Nothing moved, just their beams piercing the darkness, yellow streaks that went into infinity. Just past midnight Zeb's cell rang. Claire. He took the call on his earpiece. No ma'am, he replied to her query. I have no idea how they knew we'd be there. Surely you have a theory. Zeb looked to his right. Broker had reclined his seat and had his baseball cap over his face. The remainder of his crew was in Roger's vehicle. These dudes, whoever they are, are smart ma'am. I think once we wiped out their hit team in Crozet, they became wary. It's likely they posted shooters wherever they stopped. These weren't their team? No ma'am. The hitters in Riviera were amateurs. The ones in Crozet were much more professional. Their only mistake was burning the house while we were still in town. Your theory's right, Claire said. No identities on the Crozet killers. The Riviera men, however, those were contract killers out of Los Angeles. The person you spoke to was most likely their middleman. The LAPD have had outstanding warrants on them for a while. They arrived a day before and were keeping watch on the gas station. There were witnesses. Their images were captured at airports. The LAPD's hunting the middleman. No luck so far. Some of them have priors? Three of them. Your friend Hall is happy. He can scratch a few names off his wanted list. Zeb and Jeffrey Hall, the LAPD's chief of police, went back a long way. You sure are clearing up a lot of nests as you hunt the sisters. Ma'am, can you get Border Patrol to keep a watch on the vehicles leaving Laredo? We're probably too late, but still. Already done. Border Patrol, Homeland, Cops, State Troopers, all have been alerted. Thank you, ma'am. She made a dismissive sound. There isn't a single law enforcement agency in the country, overt or covert, that isn't looking. The NYPD have set up a toll-free number. Crank calls? Yeah. I doubt you're watching much TV, but their faces are splashed on every channel, every few hours. There's a massive manhunt underway. And yet we're no closer to them. She paused for a moment. I've never known you to lose heart, Zeb. You're on their trail. 24 hours behind but still tracking them. Do what you do best. Get them. Zeb up the pace when they hit Texas State Highway 359, going west. Behind him Roger's beams followed at a steady pace. Broker stirred after several minutes had passed. Claire? Yeah. You've been awake all along. Yeah. You're thinking so loudly, I couldn't sleep. He stretched and drank from a bottle of water. He swirled it in his mouth before swallowing and capped the bottle. Something stinks about this. You get that feeling? Yeah. Zeb couldn't pinpoint what was off. It was a feeling that gnawed at him and pinged his radar faintly. His warning system had never let him down in all these years. There, Bawana, they all feel the same way. Zeb wasn't surprised. All of them had the same finely tuned instincts. Living on the razor's edge sharpened those. But they had to follow the sisters. There was no other option, not until they found out who the mastermind was and the reason. Broker, do we have enough gear? 
his friend raised a surprised eyebrow at him. You haven't checked? No. We have enough to wage a war. Several of them. They reached Laredo after a short comfort break. They didn't know what they were heading into and didn't want to be distracted when they arrived at the town. Day 7 1.30 am. The dials on Zeb's dash glowed dimly as he navigated into the somnolent city, following the directions on his sat-nav. He dialed a number Claire had texted him. Brady Wilkins, the chief of police at the Laredo Police Department. He'll be awake? Broker asked. Yeah. He's supervising one of the bridge crossings. Laredo had four bridges that spanned the river and crossed into Nuevo Laredo. Three of them allowed non-commercial vehicles and foot traffic, while the fourth permitted only commercial access. This had better be important, a gruff voice answered. Chief Wilkins, this is Zeb Carter here. Any luck, sir? No, son. I'm on the gateway to the America's Bridge. Stopping every car while we inspect them. My men are on other bridges. Nothing so far. We collared a few drug dealers. A few wanted criminals but no Petersons. We'll keep looking, son. Homeland, those border people, they're all here. If they're crossing into Mexico, we'll find them. They're probably already in that country. Thank you, sir. Son. I got a call from the governor. Just who are you folks? Just some concerned citizens, sir. Wilkins snorted in disbelief and hung up. Zeb straightened as the directions took them out of town and away from the bridges. There isn't any other crossing in town. The road ran parallel to the river for a while, and when Broker lowered his window, they could hear vehicles crossing the bridge. He didn't envy Wilkins and the rest of the law enforcement officers. They would be on the receiving end of the ire of passengers who were forced to slow down or stop as they crossed. The road took them outside the town, and a coldness gathered around him. Ten minutes, his satnav told him. I don't like this, Roger said quietly in his earpiece. Neither do I. Houses became more distant and run down. A left straight ahead and a right brought them to a clearing. No paved road leading to it, just a dirt track. Tree line in the distance, beyond which was the river. The river couldn't be reached on foot, since there was a protective wall and inhospitable terrain near it. He turned off the engine. In the darkness, he felt Broker pat his Glock. He turned off the headlights as well and stepped out silently. There were houses, he realized when he got out. Except that they seemed to be empty. Bear confirmed that, as he came out of the darkness after investigating several. GPS can be off by several meters, Broker said in a low voice and set off towards something that gleamed white, a dark structure behind it. The white turned out to be a stone, and the structure was a house. The GPS needle remained steady. They were in the right place. Except that there was nothing there. Floodlights? Zeb asked Broker. In the back. Zeb went to the rear of his SUV and removed three portable lights. He gave one to Bawana, another to Bear, and held one. The rest of his team stepped well away from the brightness. Standard tradecraft in case there was an ambush. There wasn't one. Zeb went to the stone and inspected it. Nothing special about it. Just a lump of rock that was buried in the earth. Wind and the elements had smoothened its rough edges. Why is it here? Any significance? There's no other stone in the area. He bent over it. No markings of any kind. His Glock slid into his right hand smoothly as he held the light in his left, over his head and well to the side. He turned to the dark house with a deep sense of foreboding and entered it cautiously, his friends covering him. First Impressions Tiled Floor Dirty Interior Trash Smell of Dead Air A Barrel in the Corner 
one large room. Another smaller room which was the kitchen, a bathroom which was clearly unused and stank. No other room, and no living person in the house but for them. He returned to the front room where Broker had turned on a light, and froze when he saw his friends gathered around dark marks on the floor. Blood Chapter 25 Broker ran out and returned with his black case. Bawana and Roger went outside to check if there were any hostels, while Bear and Chloe searched the rest of the house. No hostels. No humans. Zeb went to the barrel and tapped it. It was heavy, and something sloshed when he moved it. It was one of those plastic ones with a large black cap on it. He unscrewed the top and looked inside. Colorless liquid. He dipped a finger inside and tasted it. Water. Debris behind the barrel caught his attention, and he walked around it. And froze just as Broker grunted. Meg and Beth were here. Their blood. Where did they go? Chloe asked in frustration. Down, Zeb answered, aware that his voice had gone icy and remote. The beast had roused and was flooding him. There's a tunnel here. I'm sure it goes to Mexico. They gathered around the square opening, Broker squatting carefully and shining a light in it while Zeb sent a text message to Claire. Tunnel inside house. Goes to Mexico. Claire's reply came instantly, even though it was 2 am. In Laredo? Yes ma'am. In an abandoned house. No one lives here, or in the neighboring houses. There's a river there. Probably goes beneath it ma'am. What about the twins? Their blood's on the floor. Several drops of it. Looks like there was a fight. No bodies, he added hastily before she could respond. Suspect they resisted when they knew about tunnel. Left markers for us. Hold up. He waited and glanced at his friends. They were crouching around the opening, their faces lean and savage under the light. They were all armed, their weapons drawn and pointing downward. Ladder strong, he heard before his cell buzzed. No knowledge of tunnel in any agency. You're clear to go. Have warned Mexican authorities, border protection, and homeland. Leave a signal. Proceed with care. He showed the messages to his friends, and without a word, Broker Bawana and Roger broke away. They went to the vehicles and returned. Bawana and Roger with HK MP7 rifles and scopes that they handed out silently, while Broker had night vision goggles, a thermal imager, and a GPS transponder. Bawana and Roger made another trip to the vehicles for more gear, while Broker stuck the transponder beneath the barrel, patted his pockets, which were bulging with more gear, and gave a thumbs up. Their friends returned with flashlight helmets, grenades, ammo, water canteens, and more equipment. They donned the helmets silently. All of them had body armor under their clothing. Standard operating procedure. When on a mission, Kevlar had to be worn. There could be hostels inside, Chloe warned. Zeb nodded. He started climbing down, gripping the ladder with his left hand, back to the steps, and went underground. The walls were concrete, rough and uneven under the glare of his headlamp. He breathed shallowly, peering ahead into the darkness, not yet wearing his NVGs, relying on his senses alone. He reached bottom, and estimated they were nearly 50 feet below the ground probably twenty feet below the riverbed. He moved away from the bottom of the ladder to make room for his friends. The bottom widened and became a corridor that was ten feet wide. Wooden beams lying on the floor. Sacks dumped randomly. He poked one. Grout. Empty water bottles and bags of chips and food containers. What held his attention was a pair of rails to his right, on which was a hand-driven trolley. Bear climbed on it and groped inside. He emerged and tossed out several plastic baggies. Zeb caught one and fingered it. White powder. Broker stopped him when he started moving down the tunnel. Wait. 
broker produced something that looked like a scope with a screen behind it. A thermal imager. Most imagers showed human bodies in lighter shades, contrasting with dark backgrounds. Broker had customized their devices to have color. Orange or yellow shapes indicated human presence. He turned it on, and the screen lit to show the tunnel in green. No orange blobs as far as its range went. Go. Broker gave the signal. Zeb started again and fell to a crouch, his MP7 rising when the tunnel was suddenly lit. That was me, said Roger sheepish, pointing to a light switch high on the wall that they had all missed. Cables ran the length of the ceiling, and at frequent intervals, naked bulbs hung, glowing, illuminating the passage beneath the river, connecting two countries. The tunnel was an engineering marvel. Deep beneath the riverbed. No cracks in the ceiling. Walls are solid. Zeb couldn't help admiring the tenacity of the builders. The rails ran to their side and disappeared into the distance. At various lengths, he could see grease on the tracks. To make it easy for that trolley to roll. The floor was hardened mud, the walls and eight-foot ceiling were concrete. Trash littered the floor as far as the eye could see. This was dug up by some cartel. A drug trafficking route for them. Zeb knew Nuevo Laredo was home to several drug gangs, many of them splintered from the Zetas. At one point, the Zetas had been one of the largest and most ruthless gangs in Mexico, but they had fallen into decline once their leader, Miguel Morales, was killed by Mexican authorities. The gang had split into several factions after several of its leaders had started forming their own outfits. This could have been a Zeta tunnel. They had the resources and the capability. Tunnels probably run by whichever gang is on the rise now. They moved slowly, Zeb ahead, the rest of them providing cover. They had firepower with them. They had determination. Six men and one woman. Lethal intent personified. They would have climbed mountains or raised them. They would have dug a tunnel if one hadn't existed because this was a mission unlike any other they had been on. Chapter 26 The packages have been handed over. The watcher dug into his sandwich as he sat in his car behind one of the abandoned houses near the tunnel. What took you so long to tell me? That should have been done a day back, the old man grumped. I had to take care of the transport team. Both of them. They aren't a problem? No, sir. The watcher sighed and crumpled the silver wrapper his meal had come in. They were two of my best men. Everyone's expendable. We have a higher calling. Where's Carter now? In the tunnel. With his crew. The packages? I told you, they've been handed over. You know I don't like this. That other party isn't. You've mentioned that. Several times. I've negotiated with that other party. You be ready when they cross back. I will be. The tunnel had wooden beams for support at regular intervals, rising up the sides and across the ceiling. Thick and sturdy, rough and uneven in texture. They were large enough to conceal a person, and the operatives took care as they moved. However, there were no hostels. There was enough evidence to show that the tunnel was a route to move drugs. Baggies were scattered on the floor and winked under the light. There were cellophane wrappers that Broker sniffed at. Meth, he declared. Zeb wasn't interested in any of that. He was figuring out the exit in Nuevo Laredo. Could be another house. A mile later, the tunnel started narrowing to allow passage for just one person in the trolley. The tunnel ended in an undramatic fashion. Just a closing off of concrete and walls, and another ladder that went up into darkness. Broker ran his thermal imager. No one present. Zeb climbed slowly, turning off his headlight as a precautionary measure, his right arm extended to hold his gun. 
the top of the tunnel was concealed by something wooden. He heaved against it, and it opened on hinges silently. Greased. He climbed inside a dark space that smelled stale like the house in Laredo. He stilled. No sounds from outside of whatever he was in. He turned on his headlamp and shook his head at the ingenuity of the builders. He was inside a walk-in closet that was wide and deep enough to conceal three people. It was eight feet tall and had a metal rail at the top from which hung a few empty hangers. Wooden construction. Well polished. The tunnel's cover was a square door that opened to one side. He pushed open the closet doors and entered a large room. Dark, illuminated only by the glow of his light. A bedroom, going by the double bed. It had a mattress. No blankets on it. A bathroom attached to the bedroom. Didn't look like it had been disused. Clear, he whispered and moved deeper into the house while his friends climbed out. The bedroom opened into a hallway. More rooms attached to it. A kitchen. A living room. A few lurid magazines on a table. Plastic water bottles strewn in several rooms. Trash littered on the floor. The house didn't seem to have permanent residence but was used. No blood, Chloe murmured. No indication that the twins were there. Broker lit up his screen and worked out where they were. Sector Centro. He pointed to a red flag on a map. Right in the middle of a residential area. There were street view images of their location. Rows of single-story houses on either side of a narrow street. Cars and trucks parked on the sides. Metal gates or fences in front of several of the houses. Chloe went to a window and peered out, but other than the dim street lighting, she didn't see anything. Outside. Zeb pointed to the door. Someone might have seen something. It's nearly 3 a.m. Everyone's sleeping. We'll check the neighborhood till people rise. He moved to the wooden door, cracked it open and peered out. A wooden gate was outside and it creaked when he pushed it. He slowed his movement to reduce the noise and stepped out onto the narrow sidewalk. The first round clanged against the gate, mere inches from his left shoulder. He dropped and rolled instinctively just as a barrage of shots opened up and bullets pinged off metal or thumped into concrete. Car, he yelled when an engine turned, headlights flashed on and a silver car started moving towards him. Muzzle flashes came from its window. He rolled desperately as the street exploded into noise when his friends opened covering fire. Something dark a few feet ahead. A narrow ditch for drainage. He crawled urgently as chips of stone and concrete peppered his face. The car was closer. Twenty feet away. Moving fast. Two barrels poking out of its windows, bullets striking its body. He fell into the ditch and pulled himself tight. Straightened his HK, breathed deeply once and brought the scope to his eyes. Need them alive. Which is why the others are shooting the car, not the hitters. The right tire came into view. A second to control his breathing. Trigger pull. The tire exploded and the car yawed to its right. His rifle moved an inch. Another trigger break. Its left tire burst. The shooters, he could see three heads inside including the driver, kept on shooting. One of them ran out of ammo, threw his rifle out, and continued shooting with a handgun. The driver kept on driving on flat tires. The car was ten feet away. Close enough for Zeb to see his shadow hunched over the steering wheel, coaxing every ounce of speed from the vehicle. Zeb took him out in a spray of red. The car swerved, crashed into a lamppost and came to a stop. And then the other operatives were laying intense fire as he lunged out and burst into a dead run, shooting at the car, at every part of its body, except at the gunman. He went around to the passenger side, crouching beneath the window and lacing a long burst into the door. Drop your guns, he commanded in Spanish. Two shooters alive. 
one in the front passenger seat, close to him, swiveling around to face him. Another at the rear, who was shooting at the other operatives. The driver was slumped against the wheel, unmoving. The hitter in the front started raising his gun at Zeb. Don't. Zeb was close enough to see the whites of his eyes. Near enough to sense the hitter's mind working desperately. You'll die, he yelled in warning. The hitter didn't heed him. His finger curled around the trigger. Zeb fired a burst into his right shoulder, throwing the hitter back in his seat, and before the gunman could react, Zeb had flung the door open and had dragged him out. Zeb kicked his gun away, removed a handgun from the shooter's ankle holster, a knife which was strapped to his thigh, and secured him with ties. The hitter was moaning and sobbing. I told you to stop shooting, Zeb told him harshly. You won't die. Those are shoulder wounds. He looked up as time caught up. His friends had stopped shooting. Bawana and Roger were shoving the remaining hitter into the house. Broker Bear and Chloe were standing guard, covering both sides of the street. The neighborhood remained empty. Not a single door had opened. No heads had poked out. This city's used to gunfire and shooting. Its people are inured to it. He hauled his captive up, pushed him inside the house, and thrust him into a chair next to his fellow hitter. Before either man could react he drew out his blade and plunged it deep into his captive's thigh. Where are the women? Chapter 27 The three hitters were from La Familia Jaramillo, a cartel based out of Canelas in the state of Durango. The shooters had confessed quickly when Zeb buried his knife in one of them. Two men had handed the sisters over to the gang the previous day and had gone back inside the tunnel. No, they didn't know who those men were. One of them, Miguel, moaned when Bawana crouched in front of him and gave him flat eyes. Why did your gang want them? I don't know, Oscar the knifed man responded, shrieking when Zeb twisted the blade. I'm telling the truth. We are just foot soldiers. Why did you attack us? Oscar and Miguel looked at one another nervously. They licked their lips and spilled quickly when Bawana moved threateningly. They had no orders to shoot the operatives. They were asked to get back to Durango. However, the soldiers were ambitious and wanted to make a mark. They figured someone might come hunting the Gringus. Capturing or killing those pursuers would be a major coup for them. It would get them promoted in the gang. So your gang didn't authorize this shooting? Zeb asked them coldly. No. Oscar flinched and shrank in his chair when he met Zeb's eyes. Is this your gang's tunnel? No. It is the Zetas. But we made an arrangement with them, just for the Gringus. Where are they now? On their way to Canela's. Why does your gang want them? Zeb asked them again. The gunman didn't know. Bawana and Roger went to the windows and looked out. Nothing, Bawana mouthed at Zeb. Still silent. Broker was at his screen, Chloe and Bear beside him, when Zeb joined them. You believe them? Chloe asked him. Yeah. Broker the gang? That's what I'm looking up. We're going to Canela's, said Chloe, an expectant look in her eyes. Yes. As soon as our Gulfstream gets here. Zeb thumbed a text on his cell. We need to cut down their lead. We don't know what they're planning to do. Before Chloe could answer, a chorus of sirens filled the street. He crossed to the door and peered out. Police vehicles, several of them. Looks like the neighbors called them. There were still no lights that he could see in the surrounding houses. Don't need lights to make calls. You can't escape now, gringo, Oscar snarled, managing a triumphant look despite his bleeding thigh and face bathed in perspiration. We weren't planning to, Zeb told him shortly. Shall I kill him? Bawana asked, a yearning expression on his face. They attacked us. We are innocent, 
Oscar shouted, as soon as twenty cops burst into the house with their weapons covering all occupants. Zeb dropped his gun and raised his hands, a signal to his friends to copy his move. What happened here? The speaker was short, just a few inches over Chloe's height. However, he had presence. His dark eyes swiftly took in the operatives and the bound men in the chairs. They roamed over the weapons on the floor before coming back to Zeb. The Mexicans had arrived in police vehicles, but none of them wore their standard uniforms. They were in black combat outfits with no labels, titles or markings to identify them. Might be Samar, Zeb thought, thinking swiftly. Samar were Mexican Marines, an elite branch of their navy, who had stepped up the battle against the cartels. They'd adopted the cartel's style of battle. Small units that moved quickly. They remained anonymous to protect their families. They had good intelligence, and several of them had trained at the Pentagon's Joint Operations Center in Colorado. Zeb had worked with some of them. He knew they were tough, capable, and lethal. He ran through a list of names in his mind, people to call, and settled on one. They're gringos, Oscar yelled again and spat in their direction. They attacked Miguel and me for no reason. They killed Arturo. He's in the car outside. You are Americans, the short man asked Zeb, as his men collected the weapons and a medic checked the captive's wounds. See, si, Zeb answered. We're with the FBI. Oscar's jaw dropped. They're not the FBI. He's lying. They're killers. The short man took a step backwards without turning and casually backhanded Oscar in the face. I asked the questions, he told the gunman, his eyes not leaving Zeb's face. If he was surprised that Zeb spoke his language as fluently as a native, and with the right accent, he didn't show it. Zeb moved his hand to his jacket. Guns cocked in warning. Papers, he said, and withdrew his identification. A card and a badge. No one told me the FBI was operating in my country. The Mexican leader inspected the credentials and handed them to a deputy, who put a phone to his ear and started speaking softly. We're searching for two FBI agents, women. We got intel that they were here, captured by cartels. These men attacked us. We were questioning them when you arrived, Zeb explained swiftly. You are Samar, he asked the leader. The Mexican's eyes flickered, but he didn't answer. His brown eyes lingered on Chloe and rested for long moments on Bawana and Bear. How did you get here? There's a tunnel. Zeb pointed to the bedroom. A tunnel. Here. The leader's voice rose in surprise. He turned to his men and fired off a series of questions. Was there any intel about a tunnel? Any chatter? Did anyone know of it? His men shook their heads. The leader went to the bedroom, several of his men following, leaving the rest surrounding the operatives and the captives. We've got to go, Chloe hissed. We can't lose any more time. I'm working on it. The Mexican returned and fired off more orders to his men. Some of them trotted out, and through the window, Zeb could see them cordon off the house with warning signs. The deputy was still on his phone and stiffened suddenly. CC, he replied and clicked his fingers. The leader took the phone, turned away from them, and hunched his shoulders, listening intently. They couldn't hear the conversation, but there was no mistaking the surprise in his voice when he asked a few questions. He whirled once, staring at Zeb, and then turned back to his call. He hung up finally and tossed the phone to his man. You need transport? he asked when he faced Zeb. There was a smile on his face. The cold, hard look had disappeared, replaced with warm Mexican hospitality. C. To the airport. You were in the Guanajuato operation. C. All of us. The agency had been part of a joint task force, along with Samar, that had taken down a vicious cartel boss in the central Mexican city. They had gone in as FBI agents, but several of the Marines had suspected they were from a covert American outfit. You know who that was on the phone? Leto Grijalva. 
the Marine couldn't contain his awe. I have never spoken to him before. Didn't even meet him. Grijalva was the secretary of the Mexican Navy, a career naval officer who had achieved legendary status for several cartel operations he had personally been involved in. He said you are his friend, Senor Carter. We met a few times, Zeb replied noncommittally. One of those operations had been to rescue Grijalva's wife, who had been abducted by cartels. The agency's operatives had rescued her, after wiping out 15 cartel killers. Captain Jose Almaraz, senor, the same our officer introduced himself. Whatever you want, you just have to ask. He snapped his fingers and his men stepped back. He barked an order, and three men slipped out and returned with two vehicles. They'll take you to the airport, senor. Almaraz waved them to the door. Senor Carter. Zeb stopped. Yeah? You may not remember this, but you personally saved a Marine's life in Guanajuato. He was pinned down by cartel fire, and they were lobbing a grenade when you ran out, drew fire on yourself, and helped him get away. He described you. I thought I recognized you when I saw you. Anyone would have done that. No, senor. No one else did that. You were there. No, senor. That was my brother. He's alive thanks to you. Go. The same are, are behind you. No questions will be asked. Once you are on the road, I'll call you and brief you on all we know about this Jaramillo cartel. We will give you all the support you need. The drivers of the vehicles were young, and one of them grinned when Zeb climbed in. You didn't kill those men, senores. You are not known to leave cartel men alive. Our killing is yet to come, Bear replied grimly. Chapter 28 Twins are in Durango, captured by La Familia Jaramillo, Zeb texted Claire as the Samar drivers took them swiftly through the awakening city to the airport. Where in Durango? Canelas. Small town. Who talked? A couple of their hitmen. That tunnel needs to be taken down. It's very well built. Enough evidence of narco trafficking. Several agencies on it. We have the world's most advanced surveillance capabilities, and yet no one knew of its existence. We've left a marker at this end. Yeah, I've got it and passed it to Daniel. How's he taking it? He wants to be with you. He wants to pull the trigger when you find them. General Daniel Klaus had never married. His work was his life. When he had met the Peterson sisters, he had found in them the daughters he'd never had. The drivers brought them coffee, hot, black, and just the way they liked it when they reached Nuevo Laredo International Airport. Their aircraft was an hour away, and the Samar men hung around, wisecracking with them softly. Zeb sipped his drink and watched the sun rise, making the parked airliners glow. He was thinking of Megan and Beth. It was the seventh day since their abduction, and he hoped the twins hadn't lost hope. Nothing killed the human spirit more than the absence of hope. I should have killed those hitters at the house. He crushed his paper cup in sudden savagery, and it was only when scalding liquid poured over his wrist that he willed the anger away. We can come with you, senor. All of us, the captain as well. A marine handed him a paper towel and took away the crushed cup. No. My agreement with Almaraz was clear. The Samar captain wanted to accompany the operatives to Durango. They had manpower, they had intel, they knew the gang, and they could move fast. Zeb had declined the offer, and when he had explained, Almaraz had been disappointed but had understood. The cartels had informers everywhere. They had infiltrated the political ranks and had their snitches in law enforcement. If they got a whiff of the Samar coming, they would move out of Durango. Or worse, kill the twins. Zeb couldn't take that risk. No one should know we were here, Zeb had warned Almaraz. You have my word, the captain had promised. His eyes had turned cold when he looked at Miguel and Oscar. 
No one will hear of them either. Never again. The Gulf Stream turned around quickly, and when it took off, one of its pilots went to the kitchen and brought out trays of warm food. Eat then sleep. We have an hour to get there. Broker filled them in on the gang while they emptied the trays. New cartel. Just four years old but vicious. And growing. He chewed, swallowed and drank coffee. Founded by three brothers. Alberto, Renzo, and Fabiano Jaramillo. Alberto's the eldest. They're in a constant battle with the Sinaloa cartel. In fact they fight all cartels. He showed them the brothers' photographs, knowing each operative would memorize the pictures. He wiped his mouth, removed his shoes and settled back in his seat. Drugs aren't their main source of income however. They run guns. All kinds of weapons. They smuggle them in from the US, and get this, they sell them to the other cartels. And the other gangs fight them with the same weapons they buy off them. Roger laughed in disbelief. Yeah. You know where Canela's is? In the center of the Golden Triangle. Bear stifled a yawn. Yeah. Durango, Sinaloa and Chihuahua are the three corners of the triangle that's a major drug production area. Hence its name. Broker didn't have to elaborate. They were heading into Sinaloa country, right in the midst of a gang war between the long-established gang and the upstart. They would have no friends. Everyone would be either a hostile or an informer of one of the two gangs. There must be someone we can talk to, get more intel. Chloe Rose stretched and dumped her tray in the kitchen. Almarez said he'd let us know all that he found out from those hitters. Which may not be much if they're foot soldiers, Bawana said in disgust. We have a contact, Zeb said, breaking his silence. Melia Carreras. Heads turned in his direction, and then his friends looked at one another. None of them had heard of the name. Who's she? Chloe demanded. She's a housekeeper. She cleans the Jaramillo stronghold in Canelas. Chapter 29 Claire spoke to several Mexican authorities after her text conversation with Zeb. The lateness of the hour didn't matter. In her business, no one kept to any kind of schedule. She exchanged updates with the head of the Federal Ministerial Police, their equivalent of the FBI, and then called Lado Grijalva. The Secretary of the Navy revealed that the two hitters hadn't confessed anything more. Strictly small fish, he declared. You never went against the Jaramillo cartel, did you? No, sir. We knew of them, but there are bigger cartels out there that we were after. There's no reason for them to kidnap the twins, was their unspoken thought. Grijalva promised to extend any support Zeb needed, to which Claire responded dryly, You've met him, sir. I doubt he'll call on you. The Jaramillo gang doesn't know it yet, but they made a mistake. A big one. She grabbed a couple of hours of sleep and woke at 6 am. Half an hour of sit-ups, bench presses, and a fast run on her treadmill. She showered, drank her juice, and bit into a banana while she watched the news. The usual hotspots in the world were acting up, which was why she was going to the Pentagon that day. When she emerged from her house, her security detail brought her car and drove her across the Potomac River to one of the most famous office buildings in the world. An aide led her swiftly to an enormous conference room that was filling when she entered. The meeting was organized by General Klaus to discuss the deteriorating situation in Syria and Iraq. The Syrian army was bombing Daesh recklessly without any regard to civilian life. There was widespread belief that Bashar Assad, the dictator president of Syria, was using Daesh as an excuse to crush the rebel forces against him. His army and air force were shelling indiscriminately, and there were verified reports that rebel forces were being killed too. The Russians, who wished to consolidate their influence in the region, were openly supporting Assad. On the Iraqi front, Daesh was losing ground pressed back by the country's army. A Western coalition was actively helping the Iraqi army in their fight. 
However, progress was slow. The president wants a decisive plan, one that will not only bring lasting peace to the region, but also enhance our standing. General Klaus summed up in his opening statement and looked around the room. There were 15 attendees in the room. Prominent faces that Joe Public knew were Kenneth Bravo, the director of national intelligence, Nicholas Macias, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Mark Hildred, director of the CIA, his deputy director, Joseph Kleins, Pat Murphy, director of the FBI, and Nathan Himes, the FBI's deputy director. In addition, there were the heads of several clandestine agencies, which included Claire, as well as several generals. Most of the attendees were well into their 50s. Klaus was older, in his 60s, as were Bravo Macias and Kleins. Only a few of them knew Claire's identity. The National Security Advisor had introduced her and the other covert ops heads as interested parties. Bomb the heck out of them. All this helping at arm's length isn't getting us anywhere. The Russians have the right strategy, the general growled, and that opened up the fierce debate. Do nothing, Bravo said, putting forward another view. Let the Russians do the dirty work. Let them claim credit. We'll weaken them diplomatically and in the world's eye. In fact, we should encourage the Russians. Assad's not a problem for us. Hildred and Klein supported him, while Murphy and Himes took the opposite view. The discussions raged for several hours, and when Klaus brought it to a close at lunchtime, no consensus had been reached. There were two strong views. One was to take a more active role, send soldiers to war, and the other was to give the Russians a free hand and turn a blind eye to their atrocities. Both views had strong proponents, and the National Security Advisor was unable to get unanimous support for any one option. What do you think? Klaus asked Claire afterward as they stood at their waiting cars. She flipped her hair back and smiled at him. Why do I get the impression you just wanted to know which way each one of them blew? You got me, Klaus admitted. The president wanted a more united security council, and it was clear there were wildly opposing views among his team. Changes would have to be made. Bravo, Hildred and Kleins were having a similar discussion in an inside corridor. Think we'll have our way? Hildred asked Bravo. We'd better. We aren't achieving anything with our current strategy. Megan had suspected they were in or near Laredo as their captors hustled them through the tunnel. There was no opportunity to resist, no window for escape. Their hands had been freed for climbing down the ladder, but the metal collars around their necks prevented any aggressive action on their part. She had scraped her head a few times against the walls of the tunnel and hoped some hair would stick to the concrete. She wasn't hopeful that the strands would be discovered by her friends, however. There was a lot of debris around, and it would take days or even weeks to collect any DNA evidence. They were met by seven gunmen at the entrance of the tunnel. Two men helped the sisters out, and as soon as they were in the house, their hands were secured. Mexicans. Maybe a cartel, she surmised as she eyed each of the gunmen. They were the same height as the sisters, many of them in shaven, dressed in jeans, tees, jackets. All of them well armed and holding their weapons confidently. Their driver and his companion went to another room, with one of the gunmen following. She could hear them speak in low voices but couldn't make anything out. One of the heavies came forward, lips parting to reveal dirty teeth. He raised a hand and stroked Beth's hair, his fingers lingering on her cheeks. Megan saw red. Her body flew off the ground, her bunched feet catching the gunman in his gut. He collapsed with a grunt. She fell on her right shoulder. She rolled immediately, ignoring the searing agony that ran through her, raised her upper body awkwardly, and plunged her right elbow into his throat. Simultaneously, Beth fell on top of him, crushing his face with a knee. The sisters had moved so fast that none of the watching men could react in time. By the time they did, it was too late. Their fellow heavy lay on the ground, his face smashed, his neck crushed, gasping out his final breaths. They shot forward and pulled the sisters away from their fallen man. One of them slapped Beth, another punched Megan. 
The commotion brought the three men back from the other room, and for a moment they stood stock still in disbelief. The lead gunman roared in anger. He yelled at his men to back off, and they fell away. He helped Beth and Megan to their feet, his eyes blazing in anger, and rapped out an order. A hitter sullenly told him what had happened. Before he had finished, the leader whipped out his gun and shot him. They are not to be touched, he grated at his men. He made a gesture, and another heavy cut off the Peterson's gags. Their collars remained, the controls with the Mexican leader. Another hitter gave them a bottle of water, which they shared. You? Megan focused on the driver. You're Americans, aren't you? Whatever happens next is on you. If you have a conscience. The driver didn't meet her eyes. He and his partner disappeared into the tunnel. I am Fabiano, the leader addressed them. No one will touch you. Why are we here? Megan demanded. Who are you? Why did you kidnap us? Fabiano didn't answer. Gag them, he told his men, and let's go. Chapter 30 Carreras's husband was a hitter in the Jaramillo gang. Zeb leaned back and kicked off his shoes in the Gulf Stream. They were 40 minutes away from General Guadalupe Victoria International Airport in Durango. There was still time for a nap. He turned informer and snitched on the gang. The cartel found out and publicly executed him. Alberto sawed his head off slowly and then his men raped Melia Carreras. In full view of the village. He noticed Chloe's fingers clench and Bawana's jaw tighten. No one would employ her, and when Alberto asked her to be their cleaner, she had no choice. How do you know about her? Broker asked when he fell silent. Zeb handed over his cell, on which there were several text messages from Almaraz. Broker read them and passed the cell around. He says, Roger frowned, that she has never cooperated with the cops. Why would she tell us anything? I don't know. We'll have to find out the hard way. And with that Zeb turned over and closed his eyes. They emerged from the airport with no hassle. It looked like Grijalva had made calls to the right people, all of whom turned a blind eye to their presence in the country. Outside the airport in the afternoon heat were two SUVs, Fords. Zeb checked their license plate numbers against the message Almaraz had sent him and led his crew to them. Broker, he asked his friend before any of them entered the vehicles. On it. Broker brought out an electronic device and swept the two vehicles. Bawana Bear and Roger inspected the hood and the undercarriage thoroughly. No bugs. No bombs. The vehicles had been arranged by Samar but Zeb wasn't trusting anyone. The airport was half an hour away from Canela's, and after they set their sat-navs to the small town, they set off. Zeb took the Mexico 40D, a toll road from the airport, and then the Mexico 40, a federal highway that linked several cities on the seafront, on the Gulf of Mexico and the Pacific Ocean. Canela's was a small town, a village, in the Sierra Madre Occidental mountain range. It was surrounded by hills. The smell of pine was all around, since the trees were the predominant vegetation on the mountains. The town had less than a thousand people, whose primary occupation was farming. Like many small towns, it had small alleys and old houses. They stopped at the outskirts of the town and changed from their combat outfits into casual wear. Each one of them was tanned and could easily pass for Mexicans. They spoke the language frequently, and that helped their disguise. They wore loose shirts, beneath which were their armor and holstered glocks. Combat trousers, because who didn't wear such trousers when in the mountains? Their pockets were stuffed with mags and weapons, tools and gadgets. Everything that they could carry, without looking conspicuous. They walked to the village square, after leaving their vehicles, on the edge of the small town. The square was a wide open space, with a few trees in it, and several cantinas. They sat at a long bench outside one cantina while a gnarled woman served them hot enchiladas and water that tasted sweet, and went down easy. 
they spoke in Spanish, and when they had finished, Chloe smiled at their server and asked her where Melia Carreras lived. She revealed her gap teeth and rattled off directions. An alley out of the square, a left, another left, and then a right. You can't miss it, the server said. It's the only house that has a sign above its door. What kind of sign? Chloe asked. The server looked behind her. No one was within earshot. The sign of the Haramillo. She squinted in the sun and surveyed them thoughtfully. Are you here to harm her? No. We knew her husband a long time back. We are here to pay our respects. She has suffered enough. She doesn't need any more trouble. We are not bringing trouble to her, Chloe replied, and hoped the guilt didn't show on her face. She won't be at home now. Only in the evening. They split up and wandered around the town to kill time until Carreras returned. Roger engaged another store owner in conversation. He told them they were from Durango, scouting locations for a movie. Are you an actor? The white aproned man asked him as he whipped up a coffee. No, just a location scout. Is this area safe? I was told there's a lot of gang activity in this place. Which place in Mexico is safe? The owner grunted. We are cursed. Until those rats disappear, we will never be safe. So there are gangs here. See. The Sinaloas and the Jaramillos. Both fight. Both kill each other. Sometimes we get trapped in between. What about the police? The owner came to the front and wiped his face with his apron. He spat contemptuously on the street. The police. Half of them are owned by the cartels. The other half are more scared than us. Chloe had more luck. A townswoman told her the Jaramillos had their hideout away from the town, at the bottom of the hills. Yeah, she had seen two vehicles rolling in just yesterday. The Jaramillos didn't have to pass through the town, but sometimes they did. Just to show how much they controlled it. Melia Carreras was in her mid-thirties, as petite as Chloe, and good-looking. Her dark hair fell over her shoulders, and her dark eyes were large and soulful. A finely shaped nose and full lips completed her appearance. However, her face was blank when she opened the door to Chloe's knock. I just served many men, she said automatically, and then bit her lip when she took them in. Who are you? Melia, we need your help, Chloe said softly. Can we come inside? I have not seen you before. Are you from the Durango branch? Melia, we are not from the gang. She stepped back immediately, fear crossing her face. She moved to slam the door shut, but Chloe blocked it. Melia, please. We are not the Sinaloas either. We need to talk to you. Let us come inside. I don't talk to strangers. No one does. Walls have ears in this town. Leave now. Ma'am, our friends have been kidnapped by the Jaramillos. Two women. We need your help, Roger cut in, speaking rapidly. They held their breath while Carreras looked at them with those eyes, something unfathomable in them. Then she stepped back and held the door wide open for them. Chapter 31 Carrera's house wasn't large. It had a rickety couch in what looked like the living room, a narrow hallway that went to the kitchen, and a couple of doors beyond. She gestured at the couch and sat on the floor. Chloe was lowering herself into the seat when she stopped. She crossed her knees Indian style and joined their host on the floor. Zeb leaned against a wall, Bear and Bawana against another, while Roger and Broker turned their backs and looked out the single window. The presence of the men made the room smaller. Ignore them. Chloe patted Carreras's arm. Where do I start? Maybe at the beginning. Seven days back our friends were kidnapped. We think they are here, with the Jaramillos. In their hideout. Have you seen two women there? Carreras didn't answer. 
She sized Chloe up and then looked consideringly at the men. You are not Mexican. No, Melia. You are gringos. Yes, Melia. Are you police? No, Melia. She pointed at Zeb, at his chest, at the faint outline of his gun. You are all wearing guns? Chloe hesitated. Yes, Melia. You have used them? Yes. Something in her seemed to relax. Her shoulders sagged infinitesimally. Two gringas were there in the morning. I didn't see them. I heard them shouting. Several men shouting as well. In the afternoon, I was busy. I didn't pay attention. Zeb crossed the room instantly and crouched. Ma'am, were they okay? Do you know? Ma'am? Melia's lips almost burst into a smile. No one has called me that in years. I am just the Haramiya woman. I don't even have a name. Just that woman. Zeb didn't drop his eyes away in embarrassment. He held her gaze till she nodded. No one touched them, if that's what you were asking. I heard Alberto warn his men. They were not to be touched. They listened to him. Everyone fears him. Even his brothers. How many men are there, ma'am? Can you describe the house? It's security. Melia Carreras didn't tell them right away. She picked up Chloe's right hand and inspected her palm. She ran her fingers over her trigger finger and thumb. Felt the hardened skin over the digits. She raised her hand, pressed it against Chloe's chest and felt the gun underneath her clothing. Twenty-five men inside that building. The three brothers. So, twenty-eight, ma'am? No. Her hair swayed when she shook her head. Twenty-five, including them. I know I cook for them. And our friends. And your friends, she confirmed. She rose and returned with a worn notebook. She flipped pages over till she came to a clean sheet and drew the rough outline of the hideout. It had a clear driveway in the front, and at the back was a thick forest of pine trees that was almost impenetrable. The compound had a large metal gate that was manned by armed men. More armed men patrolled inside the house. She pointed out rooms, about ten of them. Each of the brothers had a room. Their gunmen slept on the floor. Any electronic security, ma'am? Broker asked her. She looked at him blankly. Electronic? Cameras, ma'am? CC. Many cameras. Her pencil made marks on the page as she scrunched up her face and tried to remember their locations. She kept on talking as if a dam had broken. No dogs. Vehicles parked outside. Usually, there were not so many men in the hideout, and even the brothers were rarely there. Maybe it's because of your friends, she guessed. That wall is high, she told them. Ten or twelve feet. It won't be easy to get in. Walls are not just for keeping people out, ma'am, Zeb told her. They also keep people in. Why are you telling us all this? He asked her when her eyes flashed in understanding. She knew all about walls. You didn't want me to tell. What if they find out? What will they do to me? Kill me? She laughed scornfully. Death will be freedom for me. If it's so easy to find out about their place, why hasn't anyone taken action? She looked at him in disbelief. Gringo, they own this town. Anything moves, they know of it. By the time the police or the Sinaloas got to their fortress, they would have disappeared. Or prepared for attack. Police tried bombing them with helicopters once. The Jaramillos knew they were coming beforehand. They hid in the forest and fired rockets at the helicopters. No air attack came again. Bear shifted on his feet in the ensuing silence, drawing her attention. Ma'am what you said out there, you had served men. What did you mean? What did you think I meant? 
You have to move quickly, she told them. They probably know about your presence in town. At daylight, they will send men to ask who you were. They haven't come to my door yet. That means you still have some time. They will know we have met you. Bear stroked his beard thoughtfully. What have I been telling you, gringo? They know everything. Thank you for everything. Zeb rose and his friends joined him at the door. She clutched Chloe's sleeve as she was stepping out. You will kill them? Chloe's silence was her answer. Go then. Go with the grace of God. They filtered out of the village, which was easier since it was dark. They moved out in pairs, and as they traveled the small alleys the smells of cooking and laughter came to them. I just served many men. Zeb's jaw tightened and a nerve twitched on his temple. Meg and Beth are surrounded by such men. A thin breeze blew between the narrow walls and cooled the beast within him. Not yet, he told the animal. But soon. They went to their vehicles and climbed in without much conversation. The moon was up and guided them as they doused their lights, with Broker calling out directions on their earpieces. Broker's route took them deep inside the jungle, about two miles away from the village and behind the Haramio stronghold. Broker had been working out several routes and attack options on his screen from the moment Carreras had described the cartel's location. There was no easy way in, since the direct approach would be well covered by shooters. The entry would have to be through the jungle. Jungle warfare was familiar to them. Each one of them had been on missions in the Congo, in the impenetrable forests of Asia. They parked the two vehicles deep inside brush, and Bawana and Bear chopped branches and covered the rides. They set off single file, Zeb in the lead. The plan was simple. It was 10 p.m. They would reach the rear of the stronghold in an hour. They would surveil and then mount an attack. The plan had a lot of holes. But they didn't have many options. They had to get inside the Haramio fortress before the gang could either move the twins or do something worse. Chapter 32 They had progressed 200 yards when they reached the first sentry. Zeb was moving ghost-like, using the stumps of the trees as cover, rolling his feet on the ground so that his weight was spread evenly. It was when his eyes were flitting from one dark shape to another that he smelled smoke. He held a fist up to halt them and stood unmoving. He lowered his kai, let it become forest and pine while he watched, heard and felt without moving his head. There that whiff again. It seemed to come from his two o'clock. He observed without staring, lest whoever was there feel his presence. Just beneath the edge of a leafy branch, he saw the red dot. It flared bright briefly, and a plume of smoke appeared. He searched around, and then spotted the dark shape leaning against the bulk of a tree. See him, he murmured. Yeah, Bawana replied after several moments. He's mine. Zeb didn't hear anything. He didn't feel his friend move. For all their size, both Bawana and Bear could move like panthers. The smoker straightened, alerted by something, but before he could turn or call out, a dark wraith came out of the forest and the two dark shapes became one. Need him alive, Zeb warned Bawana. He is. The sentry was wide-eyed and terrified when Zeb reached him. Bawana had one large hand cupping his face and a blade pricking his neck. He had kicked the sentry's legs out and easily supported his weight. The guard turned goggle-eyed when the rest of the operatives surrounded him. Talk, Zeb told him. The sentry thought of protesting, but the blade slid a fraction of an inch deeper. He talked. There were two more sentries in the forest, strung out in a straight line behind the stronghold. The three of them formed the perimeter at the rear. No such perimeter was needed at the front since it had a clear view. They checked in every hour, he confessed quickly when he stalled and Bear came close to him menacingly. No special call sign. He was Diego, the two other guards were Vittorio and Tico. They reported to Fabiano, who was the youngest. 
Gowana jerked the knife in a silent message. Don't waste time on needless details. Bear searched him and came out with a radio. A cell phone. A roll of pesos. Another roll of dollars. Smokes. Lights. A driving license. His AK-47 seemed to be well used. How many men inside? Bear read the name on the license under the hooded light of his flashlight. 22. Diego swallowed when he eyed Bear's size. A large man holding him captive, another equally large man interrogating him, Diego trembled. Who are you? He dared to ask. His groan was muted when Bawana dug the knife and stifled his cry. You speak only when we ask, Bear admonished him. Where are the Americans? Diego's eyes flew open, sweat beating on his forehead. Americans, he asked stupidly, and then flailed helplessly when Bawana made a fresh puncture on his body. I don't know any Americans, he groaned. I have not been inside the house for days. Bear sighed and punched him in the groin. Diego's howl choked in his throat, and he shook and trembled in Bawana's hold. I swear, he moaned softly when he was able to speak. The three of us don't go inside. Our duty is to guard the back and warn Fabiano if we see anything. What do you do for food? There's a trolley on a wire. They send food in it. We return it when we finish. What do we do with him? Bear asked Zeb, who was looking out into the forest, trying to spot the two other guards. Keep him alive. Broker and Chloe can keep an eye on him whenever he calls in. That trolley. Let's find it. It might come in useful. He signaled to Bawana, who nodded, and he and Bear slipped off. They went left first in the direction Diego had pointed, moving carefully, and after 200 feet they spotted Vittorio. The guard was leaning back against a pole and snoring audibly. His snoring stopped when Bear knocked him out cold. He secured his hands and feet and gagged him. Bear pocketed his radio and cell, and they turned back. Tico was awake, watchful, and spotted them because he wasn't still. He was pacing 15 feet to the right, 15 feet to the left. He saw their shadows, and his mouth opened in shock when they materialized in front of him. One of his hands grabbed for his radio, the other went for his gun. He tottered back several feet when Bear's fist broke his jaw. I think you broke his neck. Zeb inspected the fallen man. Good. Bear was almost cheerful at having rendered the guard immobile. They found the wire with the trolley, which was just a bucket that hung off the wire by its handle. Beneath the handle was a roller that was operated by a pulley from the guard's end. There should be another pulley in the house for the gangsters inside to operate. Zeb looked inside the bucket. It was empty. The wire was secured to a tree and was six feet from the ground. He pictured the layout inside the compound wall. The house was one long stretch in an L shape, the short leg extending towards the forest at the back. The L had everything in it, living rooms, a kitchen, a dining room, several bedrooms and bathrooms. One of the bedrooms in the center of the building, facing the rear, housed the sisters. There was a secondary building, opposite the short leg. They returned to Bawana and the captive, to find Broker and Chloe at work. Each one of them had a console in their hands, and were piloting a drone each as they arrived. They guided the devices carefully, mindful of the branches and obstructing foliage. One drone had a cell phone tower built into it. Both were equipped with night vision, infrared, HD cameras, thermal imagers, powerful mics, EMP emitters, radar, and low-powered lasers. Each of them was coated with stealth technology paint. They had more equipment than Zeb cared to remember, since Broker and the twins kept constantly tweaking it. Meg would have rattled off a description. Zeb didn't know he had spoken aloud until Roger replied gruffly, let's go get them. Zeb didn't have to outline tasks. They worked like a well-oiled machine. Broker and Chloe would remain behind, manning the drones, and guide them on their earpieces. 
they would ensure that Diego called in regularly and report that his fellow guards were sleeping. Zeb, Bawana, Roger and Bear would go to the compound wall and would wait until 2 am. And then they would attack. Let's pack the bucket with flashbangs. Zeb settled his HK on his shoulder. Broker, you've got those remote-controlled grenades too, don't you? And portable cams? Yeah. In my backpack. Zeb and Bear filled the bucket with flashbangs and threw in several of the explosives. Bear attached a wireless camera to the bucket and set up its feed on a spare screen. Broker and Chloe had three screens in front of them now. Two for the drones and a third for the bucket cam. Zeb was preparing to set out when Diego's radio squawked. Chapter 33 Zeb motioned to Diego, who bent his head to the cell phone that Bawana held to his ear. Yes. I'm going to sleep now. Why aren't Vittorio and Tico responding? A voice questioned in irritation. Wait, Diego answered, taking his cues from Bawana. He replied after ten minutes, while Bawana muted the radio in the interval. They're sleeping. You shout at me, but you never say anything at them. He injected a surly note and got an approving nod from his captors. That's because you are my best guard. I want you to keep improving. Those two, they are lazy, useless. Do you need anything? No. Diego licked his lips when Bawana produced his knife in warning. I will send the bucket. Fill it in the morning. Okay. Be alert and wake Vittorio and Tico. There are reports that some strangers came to Canela's. Okay. Diego sighed when Bawana pulled away the cell and pocketed it. Who was that? Fabiano, he replied. He looks after the security. He would have brought the Americans. He does all the transportation. He watched the screens and cast his eye on his captors. You'll kill them? Please let me live, he begged when no one replied. I told you everything I know. Zeb sent the trolley back, Chloe updating them on its progress on their earpieces. All quiet. Five sentries, visible. No one looking at the bucket. Looks like it's common practice to return it at night. Zeb set off with the remaining operatives and encountered no other hostels. The ground was rough and uneven and the undergrowth was thick. Branches slapped at unwary faces and there were several holes underfoot that could have broken ankles. It was only their skill and experience that let them progress stealthily. No wonder they don't need much security at the rear. An army would get bogged down in the forest. The forest came right up to the rear wall and gave way to a dirt track that was wide enough for a vehicle. Zeb halted just inside the tree line and surveyed the wall. It looked like it was ten feet high and had been once white, but now was muddy and stained from wear and the weather. Several cameras fifteen feet apart, looking both inwards and outwards, Chloe whispered. Relax, she chuckled, sensing Zeb's thought. We checked out the make of the cameras. They can't see at night. Broker's already hacked into their system and is seeing what they see. So easily. Yeah. It's not a very common system, but Broker's got its fingerprints. Over the years, Broker and the twins had compiled all the security systems they had hacked into or come across on different missions. They had developed entry programs for all those systems, and those proved to be valuable assets in every new operation. You're running the faces. Yeah. Werner's comparing all the men against various databases. We've already got a few hits. A couple of them are wanted for murder, two more for narco-trafficking. Any signs of the brothers? Looks like they're in their rooms. There's one more person with Alberto. Maybe a female. Too big to be either of the twins, she added hastily. I've got a room with two shapes. In the middle of that L, like Carreras said. Those could be them. Keep us posted. Zeb sat and settled against a tree trunk. 
It was close to midnight. They would grab an hour's nap while Broker and Chloe kept watch. Then they would go in. Day 8 Zeb woke at 1.30. He looked around and found his fellow operatives stirring. He drank from his water can, sloshed it around in his mouth and swallowed. Gowana cracked open a power bar and munched it slowly while Bear and Roger inspected their weapons. Zeb nodded at them and he and his friends rose. Each one of them would scale the wall at intervals of 20 feet. Their backpacks carried webbing that would let them climb quickly. There were just the four of them, against 22 armed and dangerous gangsters. However, Zeb was counting on surprise speed, explosive power and superior technology to even the odds. At 2 am, the drones fired an intense EMP burst for several seconds. Simultaneously, they ran to the compound wall, threw their climbing gear over it, and climbed. Cameras down, said Chloe, laconic in their earpieces. All quiet. Some stirring in one of the rooms. Probably the security room. Patrols right in front of you. Their backs to you. Zeb landed lightly on his feet, facing the middle of the L, barely making any noise. Straight ahead was the likely location of the twins. To his left was Bawana. Further away, Roger. On his right was Bear. Each one of them glowed orange, detectable only under their goggles and the drone's cameras. Orange was good. Orange was for friends. A silvery moonlight filled the compound, giving them the appearance of ghosts. Ghosts who wielded death. He looked straight ahead. Right into the eyes of a startled patrolling guard, less than eight feet away. He had landed behind the guard, who had whirled on sensing a human presence. The guard opened his mouth and grabbed his gun. Zeb shot him, the silence burst felling the gunman before sound could leave his throat. Zeb caught him before he could fall, and his gun clanked on the ground. Clear. 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 His teammates' voices echoed in his earpiece. Now? Broker asked. Now, Zeb said, giving him the go-ahead. Chapter 34 The bucket exploded. The compound lit up in dazzling white as if a thousand floodlights had turned on. The burst of sound shattered several windows and made the ground tremble beneath them. Zeb didn't stop to watch. The goggles protected him from the white light, the mufflers over his ears shielding them from the detonations. He set off at a run to the twins' room. Alberto's room was to its left, separated by one room. Renzo's was to its right, two more rooms in between. Fabiano's was in the short leg of the L. Men shouted. Groans echoed. Doors burst open and gangsters staggered out. To your ten, warned Chloe. Two men stumbled around the corner, their rifles lifting. Zeb fired at the same time as his friends. The gunman collapsed. Bawana went around the corner to clear out the other guards. Zeb focused on the building ahead. A long burst took out three men. Movement to his right. Watch out. You're two. Bear shot them. And then Zeb was on the porch. It was more like a concrete deck that ran the length of the L. Alberto's door opened. Zeb caught a glimpse of the bearded figure before he leapt back and shut the door. From behind it, he could be heard shouting loudly, cursing, organizing his men. His hitters started responding. They were still dazed by the flashbangs. However, they knew they were under attack. Some of them sought cover behind pillars and took wild shots. Others ran back into their rooms. Zeb shot at anything that moved. Any head that appeared or body part that showed. Roger tossed flashbangs into rooms as he raced down the deck and rained lead inside. A shadow came close to Zeb on his right. Glowed orange. Go, Bear told him. Make Beth take cover. Zeb roared, warning the twins. 
A stream of armor-piercing rounds flew out of his weapon and turned the sturdy door into splinters. He dived inside, his shoulders breaking a few stubborn pieces of wood. Bear covered him. And then something hit him in the chest. Not the twins. Two shooters. Slight in figure. Similar in build to the sisters. But definitely not the Petersons. Bear made an unintelligible sound behind him sounding like a curse, and at the same time Zeb's mind shuddered at the realization. They aren't here. The beast roared and leapt free, filling him with blackness. He landed on his left shoulder as one more round hit his armor. His gun hand was automatically triggering, peppering the bare chests of one gunman. The second hitter dived out of the way. Too late. Bear took his head out. They heard shouting outside. Are you okay? Chloe shouted in his ear. Bear asked too. Zeb didn't reply. The beast had taken over his body. He felt cold and emotionless. Remorseless, a killing machine. He darted his head outside. Alberto. Behind two men. Shooting in his direction. Renzo's to your left. In the distance, he heard shooting. Control bursts. Roger and Bawana at work. Three men to your right. Three to your left. One of Alberto's men is carrying something. A rocket launcher, Chloe added after a moment. Zeb brought out a flashbang from his pocket. Bear came next to him and produced one. He's loading it quickly. On his knee now. Renzo and his men are taking cover. Come out with your hands raised, Alberto called out roughly. You have three, maybe two seconds. Zeb and Bear threw themselves to the floor, their backs to each other, Zeb facing Alberto's men, Bear facing his brother's shooters. They skidded on concrete and slid out of the room, moving fast on their shoulders. Zeb tossed the flashbang with his right hand, his HK chattering in his left. No time to aim. Spray and pray. The spraying worked. An intense white burst that felt like a flash of headlights through his goggles. Blast that felt like loud firecrackers. He continued sliding, continued firing, more rounds impacting him, and then he was falling off the deck onto the ground. Each round should have felt like a baseball bat jabbing him. He felt none of the blows. The beast took their brunt and continued roaring. He thrust his muzzle over the deck and fired blindly. To his right, he sensed Bear fighting hand to hand on the deck with a lean man. Renzo. Alberto's hoods are dead. So are Renzo's. Bear will take care of him. Alberto's gone inside his room. Door shut. That woman's still inside with him. Are you okay? He didn't answer. He wanted Alberto. I'll kill the woman, the gang boss screamed from inside, his voice audible over the gunfight in the compound. Zeb left the deck like a rocket. He slammed his left shoulder against the door, while at the same time firing at it. His shoulder went numb with the shock of the blow, something white raced through him. The beast drowned it in blackness. The door gave way. He went skidding inside, his gun rising automatically. Stilled his trigger finger when he saw Alberto cowering behind a woman. The whites of her eyes showing, frightened. Beads of sweat rolling down Alberto's face as he glowered at Zeb. I'll kill the puta, he shrieked. I just served many men. Melia Carreras's emotionless voice came to him. He fired a short burst. Took out Alberto's right leg, which was showing behind the woman. The gang boss fell, groaning loudly. Zeb tossed his HK away and surged to his feet. One step took him to the woman to thrust her away. He ducked back just in time as Alberto's gun hand rose. He swatted the barrel before the cartel lord could aim, the round buzzing past his ear. He caught the attacker's wrist and squeezed till it cracked. Alberto screamed and dropped the gun. He hadn't given up, however. 
his left hand darted to his ankle and came up with a knife. He swiped at Zeb who swerved back. Alberto crawled hastily away and got to his feet swaying. Blood was pouring from his feet. His right wrist lay limp. Despite his wounds, his eyes were narrowed and a feral grin was on his face. He came fast, moaning as his injured leg took his weight, the knife jabbing wickedly. Zeb blocked with his left hand and punched with his right. Need him alive. His blow met thin air as Alberto ducked out of the way. The gang boss went on the attack again, pricking and thrusting, gasping softly, showering the air with curses, spittle and perspiration. Zeb's foot slipped, Alberto pounced on him in an instant, the blade coming straight at his throat. Zeb trapped the knife hand with both hands, rocked forward and headbutted the gang boss. Simultaneously he twisted his wrists and Alberto screamed as his hand broke. The knife fell and skittered away. Alberto flailed but Zeb blocked his blows, then grabbed him by the throat and squeezed. Where are they? Zeb grated. You'll never find out, Alberto snarled. Zeb squeezed harder, the gang boss's blows puny and weak against his body. The beast became darker and flew down his right arm into his fingers, which became a steel trap around Alberto's neck. The hood gasped and started choking. His face turned red and then started to go purple. He suddenly sagged and breath whooshed out of him. Zeb loosened his grip, but it was too late. The woman had come from behind, picked the blade up, and sunk it deep into Alberto's back. She met Zeb's eyes defiantly and left the room. Where are they? Zeb asked him urgently, laying him on the floor. The dying man's eyes flickered. His lips moved. You are gringo betrayed. What? What do you mean? Zeb leaned over him. Alberto died without any further word. Chapter 35 Zeb sagged for a moment in despair, raising his head when steps sounded. He drew his glock instinctively, grabbed the dead man by his shirt and hauled him up with a supreme effort to use him as cover. It's me, Bear called out. Zeb dropped the gang boss and got to his feet as his friend entered. Bear entered the room and swiftly took everything in. Did he say anything? He said something about us being gringos. And being betrayed. That doesn't make sense. No. Well, we've got his brother Fabiano. Zeb grabbed his HK and rushed out before Bear finished speaking. Bodies littered the compound. Several hoods propped against walls or pillars clutching their wounds. Bawana and Roger were going around securing those who were alive. In the center of the deck stood three men, their hands bound behind their backs, their legs tied by lengths of plastic, splotches of blood on their bodies. Fabiano and two gunmen. Zeb didn't slow down, and neither did his HK rise. Instead his left hand flickered, the glock appeared in it, and he fired two rounds. Fabiano fell back with a scream as the bullets punched through his left and right shoulders. Where are they? Zeb rasped, his right knee pinning the gangster's chest. I'll ask just once. Kill him, the beast growled, leaping and prancing inside him. Leave no one alive. Zeb's finger whitened on the trigger when Fabiano didn't reply immediately. The Jaramillo brother gasped hoarsely, his hands pawing the air futilely. Zeb whipped his barrel on the man's jaw, splitting his lips and breaking several teeth. Fabiano screeched, his eyes rolling in his head. Zeb prepared to strike him again when he was pulled back. Let him breathe. Bear's powerful arms restrained him. Airport, Fabiano panted hoarsely, dragging himself back, putting distance between himself and Zeb. Went to airport. Kill him if they aren't here, the beast howled. Zeb ignored it. He summoned the gray fog in his mind, with which his control returned. When? He kneeled beside the brother who flinched. Midnight? Fabiano wheezed. Alberto heard of your arrival in Canelas. He wasn't sure who you were. 
he decided to take no chances. Where are they going? Tijuana. What's there? Who's there? They'll go to another gang. Which one? Zeb rapped out, wanting to reach out and shake answers out of the cartel man, but conscious that Fabiano was slipping into unconsciousness. Don't know. Only the men with them know. Alberto didn't tell any of us. He's your brother. Bawana joined Zeb, his face thunder as he challenged the wounded man. Doesn't mean anything. Alberto didn't share. Call those men. The ones who have gone with them. Fabiano shook his head weakly. I don't know who they are. Alberto chose them without telling me. They are not from the villa. Villa. As if the Jaramillo hideout was a holiday home. Were the women hurt? Fabiano was hurt, bleeding, but even through his pain he sensed the danger in Zeb's low voice. No. He shook his head rapidly. Not touched. I brought them myself. He told them of how he had escorted the sisters from Nuevo Laredo to Canelas. No one touched them or harmed them. As if keeping them in captivity isn't harming them. He tried to crawl away when he saw Zeb's expression, but he was too weak. He raised himself on an elbow with difficulty and looked unsteadily at the operatives. Are you Sinaloa? You have your aircraft in Durango? Describe it, Zeb asked him roughly, paying no heed to his question. Not Durango. Airfield in the mountains. Our own. Where? Bawana brought out his cell phone and recorded Fabiano's description. Zeb squatted on his haunches, and for a moment the beast took over and the darkness overpowered him. Zeb! Zeb! The voice came to him from a distance, and a face swam into his vision. Someone shook him, and just like that the beast slunk away, the blackness receded, and the throbbing drum of Beth Meg Beth Meg quieted. I'm okay, he told Bear who was looking at him, concern on his face. Don't lose it. I won't. Renzo? He won't be troubling anyone again. Zeb rose and inspected his friend, and then Roger. You take any hits? A couple. Bear uncapped his water canteen, took a large swallow, and wiped his mouth. On my armor. Roger's got a graze on his cheek. You? Took a few in the chest. Zeb turned when Bawana came to them. We might be able to make it. The aircraft needed to refuel. It doesn't have night flying capability. You got the route? As good as he could tell. Let's go. They filed out quickly, Fabiano yelling and cursing behind them. Zeb slowed when a shadow emerged from one of the rooms in the shorter leg. The woman. She was dark-eyed, her face impassive, as she observed them. Senora, he addressed her. I needed him alive. I wanted to kill him. Every day, she told him flatly. You came for your women? My friends, yes. He made some arrangement with another gang. In America. I don't know who. I served your friends. They were weak. But not afraid. You know which gang? No, senor. You should go. There will be other gunmen who will come. What about you? They might find you and question you. The Sinaloas came and killed them all. They left Fabiano alive as a message. You need to leave. I will. As soon as I spit on Fabiano. Let's go. Chloe broke radio silence, and when Zeb looked up, one of the drones was hovering above them. They left at a run, returning the same way they had entered. They retrieved their climbing gear and jogged swiftly through the forest until they joined Broker and Chloe, who had packed up their gear and were waiting. One last glance around to make sure they had left nothing behind. 
no sign of their presence. Diego lay on the ground, bound and out cold. The other sentries, we knocked them out, Chloe said, reading his mind. Zeb took off in the direction of their vehicles, urgency powering him. They were not afraid. The woman's words came to him, and as he ghosted through the forest, a deep warmth filled him. And on its heels came the drumbeat, louder this time. Beth Meg Beth Meg Chapter 36 Zeb drove fast once they reached their vehicles, Bawana pointing out the route. The road was narrow winding and curved through the hills as they climbed. In some places there was passage for just one vehicle, and in others the edge fell off, giving them a view of the town and the stronghold beneath. Even through the darkness, they could make out the natural beauty of the place. A paradise, if it had not been for the cartels. You won't save them if you drive us off the cliff, Broker mumbled as he clutched at a handle with white knuckles. Zeb's answer was to floor the gas. Another steep curve took them to the top of the hill, which had been flattened out. Floodlights in the distance on top of a tall post. A structure on one side, a hut. Yellow lights inside it, visible through a window. A fuel truck parked next to it. Something black and long in a field of dirt. The runway. No aircraft, however. There was a gate, a wooden barrier, separating the approach road from the airfield. Two men rushed out of the hut when the vehicle's lights fell on the building. Both of them were armed, and they shaded their eyes when Zeb drove closer. He could see them shouting at each other. A third man emerged, something long and shiny on his back. He unlimbered his weapon and raised it to his shoulder. Bawana! Zeb warned his friend. Yeah, I've got him, came the calm reply. Zeb could picture the second vehicle in his mind. Roger driving. Buwana in the front. Chloe and Bear in the rear. Buwana punching open the roof. Unlimbering the Barrett. The ground was uneven, and the vehicles would sway and pitch. There would be no time to aim. On cue, a clump of earth burst in front of Rocket Man. His two friends fell back. One of them rushed inside the hut. The remaining one grabbed at his rifle. Another explosion of dirt. Rocket Man steadied himself and brought his eyes to the scope. And then he flew back as if punched by a giant fist. Seconds later, his fellow shooter collapsed. Zeb smashed through the horizontal pole that was the gate, hearing concentrated bursts of firing coming from Roger's vehicle. Don't kill them all, he reminded them, and drove full tilt at the hut into which the surviving man had run. He and Broker dove away just as it crashed into the side. A window shattered. Several logs fell off the roof and tumbled to the ground. He got to his feet and fired into the window with his Glock, without looking. He deliberately aimed at the floor. He withdrew his gun hand and ran to the front. Saw Bawana and Bear lay covering fire while Roger and Chloe threw a flashbang inside. That ended the resistance. Don't shoot, a panicked voice shouted from inside several minutes later. How many of you are there? Zeb called out. He signaled with his eyes to Broker, who drifted away to check the fueling truck. 4. Throw your weapons out. Come out with your hands held high. Several AK-47s handguns and knives sailed out. The first man staggered out, weaving his eyes shut. He collapsed to the ground and curled into a tight ball. Bawana approached him cautiously and hauled him away from lines of fire when he turned out to be weaponless. The second man was similarly affected by the flashbang. He tottered out and joined his companion on the ground. The third and fourth were in better shape. Their faces were red and their bodies trembled as if in shock, but they could move steadily. Chloe patted them swiftly. Clean. She stepped back as the men stood shivering in the cool air. Where's the plane? Zeb asked them. Gone. An hour ago. 
Fabiano said it can't fly at night. The speaker didn't ask how they knew the Jaramillo brother. They were in a hurry. They decided to take the risk. Zeb didn't need to lay a hand on the gangsters for them to confess. Perhaps it was Bawana cutting down Rocket Man and his friend, or perhaps it was the flashbang. The two men readily told them everything they knew. Three men had arrived in a vehicle with the twins. Two had waited nervously while the aircraft was fueled and readied. The third had driven back to Canela's. The two arrivals had allowed no one near the sisters, who were bound and gagged and had something around their necks. Describe it, Zeb commanded, and the men drew back when they saw his dark face. Something metallic, one of them said. A light on it would sometimes glow. There was a remote, the other man added. It was with one of the two men. A collar. I've seen it used a few times. If a victim has one, no other restraint is necessary. Bear came forward, slung his HK over his back and withdrew his combat knife. It winked wickedly under the floodlights and seemed to hypnotize the gangsters. CC. The first man nodded, his words coming out in a torrent. Like a collar. We didn't have anything to do with it. The five of us, we just guard the airfield and prepare it for the plane. How were they? Chloe stopped his flow. He looked uneasily at her. Tired. Weak, he mumbled. No one touched them, he added hastily. Where did the plane go? Zeb resumed his questioning. Tijuana, he said, confirming what Fabiano had told them. What's there? The gangster didn't know. He cried out in alarm and stumbled backwards when Bear tossed his knife high, but he had no better reply. Tunnel, the second man spoke up. There's a tunnel there. Tunnel? How do you know? He too took a few steps back in fright when Zeb crowded him, as did the rest of the operatives. I heard them. His voice cracked in fright. Those two men, they said they would take the gringa through the tunnel. Do you know where it is? Zeb glanced at his watch. They had spent half an hour in questioning. Which gave the Jaramillo gangsters a lead of 90 minutes. See, the gunman replied, surprising them. I helped dig it. There was a trace of pride in his voice. The tunnel ran from Tijuana to San Diego, the hood told them. It was used to smuggle weapons into the country. A Jaramillo tunnel, he confirmed. Not used by any other cartel. The other gangs didn't know it existed. Drugs? Zeb asked him above Bawana's piercing whistle, a signal to broker to hurry back. Drugs also, but mostly weapons. Our gang is big on guns. That too corroborates with what broker found out about the Jaramillo cartel. Zeb turned when he heard Broker running. There was something in his friend's hand. A sneaker. A woman's shoe. That could be one of theirs, Chloe breathed. I found it on the runway. They turned to face the two gunmen who spoke in one voice. There was a fight. Chapter 37 Megan knew she and Beth were greatly weakened by the time their captors brought them to the Jaramillo hideout. Beth's eyes had sunk in their sockets and there were dark circles under them. Her skin looked like parchment stretched tight over her bones. I'm sure I don't look any better. It was an effort to keep alert. However, she tried. She heard the name Jaramillo uttered by one of the men as they drove them from outside the tunnel. Have I heard of that gang? She racked her brains but no memory surfaced. She was sure it wasn't any cartel they had gone up against. It was a long drive, over twelve hours. They were in one vehicle, another following them. They stopped occasionally for food and comfort breaks. They used the houses of gang members for their bathroom breaks, she was sure of that from the way the house owners spoke obsequiously to Fabiano the man who had introduced himself as the leader. 
Where are you taking us? She asked him a few times when their gags were removed. He hadn't replied. They had almost passed out from exhaustion when their convoy finally reached the large house in the mountains. It was late at night, but several men came out and surrounded them. Dark men swarthy, well armed. Several of them had tats on their face and arms. She tried to remember the markings, but it was too much of an effort. It's not as if we might live through this, she thought, and then forced herself to be positive. Fabiano spoke to another man, who was tall, bearded, and had gleaming eyes. Some kind of leader, from the way the gunman looked at him. Alberto, as she heard the gangsters call him, gave instructions, and Fabiano and a few others hustled Beth and her to a room. Once inside their gags were removed, as were their restraints. The callers remained. Why have you brought us here? she shouted. The door slamming shut was her reply. In the morning, a dark-eyed woman brought them food. It was warm hot and melted like butter in their mouths. They consumed it rapidly, while the woman watched them without speaking. By her side were a couple of gunmen. Where are we? Why are we here? Megan didn't let up on her questions. The result was the same. No one bothered to reply. They were taken to a bathroom, and for the first time since their captivity, they showered. They wore their same clothes, but that didn't matter. She felt alive for the first time in a long time. She observed the house carefully when they were brought back to their room. An L-shaped building. Cartel men hanging around. Many of them cracking crude jokes, quite a few of them eyeing the sisters. Not one man came close to them, however. This Alberto must be a feared man. She pressed Beth's shoulder reassuringly when they were alone, and got a wan smile in return. We're alive unharmed. That counts, she told her sister fully knowing they were empty words. She was woken up at night by footsteps, and then the door flinging open. Come, Fabiano told them roughly. You are going. Where? He had already turned away. She and Beth struggled when three hoods came and bound and gagged them again. She need one man and Beth lashed out at another. No gangster raised a hand to them, however. Alberto was watching when they went outside into the brightly lit yard. Three men hustled them to a vehicle, and without any ceremony, they were driven away. She knew they were climbing by the way the engine sounded. Their vehicle twisted and turned as it navigated the road and then it slowed. They couldn't see outside. All they could hear were voices. The vehicle progressed again, and then came to a halt. Their doors were opened, and hands grabbed them and pulled them out. Airport. She blinked her eyes and looked around. No private airfield. A private jet shone white under floodlights as it was being refueled. A small building was the only construction on the site. The three men who had brought them were talking to five other men. She caught a few words but none of them meant anything. She spoke from behind her gag and choked when one of her captors turned and pressed the remote to her collar. No talking, he ordered when she straightened and breathed deeply. I'm all right, she told Beth with her eyes. They got their opportunity when they were being hurried across the flat ground to the aircraft. One of the men who had driven them was ahead, another at the back. Further behind were two men. She knew they would be subdued quickly, but she had to act. She hopped forward as quickly as she could, the bindings around her legs slowing her down. She hurled herself at the gangster in the front and brought him down, she on top of him, he on his face. She clubbed his back with an elbow, and when the second man came running, Beth threw herself at him. They fought savagely, lashing and kicking while their captors tried to pull them away. She was bleeding by the time they were hauled up. Beth too. The men pushed them roughly towards the flight of stairs and forced them to climb. They were halfway up when one man shouted and pointed. One of Megan's sneakers was lying on the airfield. Forget it, the other man said. We're late. We need to make the crossing. 
Chapter 38 The two gangsters knew they were in trouble as soon as they mentioned the fight. One of them, the tunnel digger, dropped to his knees, raised his hands in the air and spoke quickly, telling them everything that had happened. When is the crossing? Zeb narrowed his eyes at him. As soon as they reach it, the gangster replied. A sudden movement interrupted them. One of the gunmen who had been lying on the ground, disoriented by the flashbangs, sat up. He looked at them in bewilderment, and then sprang at a nearby rifle. He had barely reached it when Zeb fired, at the same time as Bawana and Chloe. The shooter flew back, his chest one big mass of red. Where are they going, after they cross in the tunnel? Zeb swung his glock around an inch to cover the digger and the standing man. I don't know, the kneeling man babbled. We know very little. Zeb contemplated them. Highly likely he's telling the truth. If any of them knew more, they would have told. Alberto's dead. Renzo too. Fabiano is wounded, in your villa, down below. There were twenty-two cartel men in that place. Many of them are dead. We are just six. What does that tell you? That you'd kill me if I was lying? The digger's voice quavered. That's right. I swear by the grace of God, he whimpered. None of us know anything more. They secured their captives while brokers summoned their Gulfstream. It landed just as dawn was breaking, the sound of its jet engines breaking the stillness of the mountains. Zeb saw the gunman twist on the floor and look out the door as their aircraft taxied. He put them out of his mind when the staircase rolled down. Tijuana, he told the pilot who greeted them. The pilot nodded, his eyes on the hut, on the weapons on the ground, and on the vehicle smashed against the wall. No luck, he asked searchingly. No, Zeb told him. They've been taken to Tijuana. That's where we will go then. He called Claire when they had taken off, and heard the disappointment in her voice when he had finished briefing her. Alberto said something about betrayal, he told her. He seemed to be surprised that we weren't Sinaloa gunmen. Beats me, she came back after a long silence. It doesn't make sense. Nothing of this makes sense. He saw Broker and Chloe nod in agreement from the corner of his eye. Bawana Bear and Roger were asleep. All the gunmen we have captured, every single one of them from the U.S. to here, said they weren't touched. So they weren't captured to be killed, tortured or raped. Not immediately, Claire responded soberly. Give me the coordinates of that tunnel. No one goes near it, he warned. There might be eyes on it. Yeah. I'll inform Grijalva about the Jaramillo brothers. He'll be happy. The old man was happy too. It was midday, and normally he didn't drink during the day, but the news he had received called for a celebration. He poured himself a shot of a 25-year-old single malt scotch and called the watcher. By God he went and did it. Carter wiped out the Jaramillos. What the Mexican police and the army couldn't do, what our people couldn't achieve, he completed. In one night, he chortled. The watcher stifled a yawn and stretched his legs in his SUV. He was parked in the parking lot of a big box store in San Diego. All three are dead, sir. Ilberto, the most vicious one, is dead meat. Renzo, too. The youngest one is still alive. He will die in prison. He gulped his drink and poured himself another. You were right, he acknowledged. The watcher sat straight. It was rare that the old man admitted a mistake. What happened? Looks like one of Fabiano's men misbehaved at the tunnel in Nuevo Laredo. Those sisters took him down. Are they? They are unharmed. You've got to trust me on this, the old man grumped. There was just that one incident. These are nothing but low-level thugs, sir. We shouldn't have. How many times do I have to tell you? Did you see the results? The old man swore. Yes, sir. The ends justify the means. Yes, sir. 
How's it going in DC? He asked to change the subject. The usual political dance. The old man swore. Half the folks want to condemn Russia and Syria. They think we can defeat the terrorists without Russia's involvement. He laughed cynically. You're keeping watch? His mirth died. Yes, sir. Your men are ready? Yes, sir. Zeb woke to the smell of coffee. Bawana was in front of him, two mugs in his hand. Zeb took one, thanked his friend, and folded his legs so that Bawana could sit next to him. The airplane was descending. Twenty minutes, a message flashed on a screen outside the cockpit. They came into Mexico, via the tunnel, in Nuevo Laredo. They're heading to another tunnel, in Tijuana. They're being handed from gang to gang. Why? Your guess is as good as mine, Bawana. Zeb sighed. He fumbled in his pocket and retrieved his cell. There was a message from Claire. No one knew about Tijuana Tunnel, either. He showed the screen to Bawana, who tightened his lips. They drank quietly as their friends awoke and took turns heading to the bathroom. They're wearing those collars. Bawana's voice was as smooth as silk, but his face would have made the most hardened criminal quail. There are some dead men walking. Chapter 39 They landed at 8 a.m. at a private terminal at Tijuana Airport. Two SUVs in their preferred color black were waiting for them. A Hispanic man bobbed his head when he recognized Zeb and gave him the keys. Tijuana was on the Gold Coast, the largest city in Baja California. It was a large thriving town and its economy was closely linked to that of San Diego, just across border. It had two border crossings, one at San Isidro and the other at Otay Mesa. The first one was the busiest border crossing in the Western Hemisphere. Thousands of commercial vehicles, cars, and even pedestrians crossed at the two points each day. Zeb wasn't interested in the official border crossing points. They were heading to Garita de Otay, which was east of the airport. Specifically, they were going to a business and industrial park. There was construction all over when they reached the park. Buildings going up, semi-finished warehouses, construction vehicles and equipment parked on the sides of streets. Soil here is strong. A tunnel doesn't need to be reinforced, broker briefed them in their earpieces. They parked their vehicles in the lot of an industrial unit and set out individually, every one of them wearing casual clothing. Their backpacks and long bags had all the equipment they needed. Zeb went ahead, his cell held to his ear, speaking occasionally. Any watcher would think he was another worker. The directions that the Jaramillo gangster had given had been explicit. The tunnel's entry was in an under-construction warehouse. There weren't guards in the daytime because they would have been a giveaway. Zeb hadn't believed him, but the man had been as good as his word. Too many people around. Any of them could be watchers, said Roger, who was approaching the warehouse from a different direction. I'm going in, Zeb told them and entered the warehouse. It was enormous, the size of two football fields, a large rectangle with both long sides open. It was empty, and his footsteps would have echoed if he had been wearing hard boots. There were pallets, oil barrels and cement bags lying all around, and the smell of dust hung heavy. Thermal shows no bodies, broker again, but this is a danged big place. I can't scan everything. Zeb looked up, trying to spot cameras. The roof was high above, with girders crisscrossing. He shook his head at himself. Too high to make anything out. He walked down a row of pallets and spotted Chloe coming from the other end. You're all here. A chorus of yas came back. Load up. He concealed himself behind a 12-foot stack of pallets and removed his HK from his backpack. He filled his pockets with mags and wore his NV headset over his forehead. He went to where an iron pillar rose from the ground, painted white and red. 
Ten yards to its right, if one was facing north, had been the digger's directions. Bawana came from behind a stack, and soon the rest of the operatives joined him. Ten yards to the right of the pillar were more stacks of pallets. It wouldn't be in the open, Broker commented irascibly, and raised an eyebrow in Bawana and Bear's direction. The men got to work while Broker and Chloe kept watch. There were voices outside. The sounds of hydraulic diggers and cranes operating nearby. However, the warehouse itself was devoid of any human presence. It made Zeb uneasy. Do we have any choice? The stacks moved an inch, and then more, sliding easily once the initial resistance was overcome. Zeb wiped sweat from his face and stepped back when Roger pointed a triumphant finger downwards. Set in the gray concrete was a squarish wooden door. There was a rope handle through it, and it showed signs of use. Broker knelt and peered closely. Zeb knew what he was looking for. Meg or Beth would have left clues. Something to indicate they had been there. There weren't any signs of the sisters' presence. Bear grabbed the handle, and the door swung open easily. The tunnel's entry was large enough for even Bear and Bawana. A ladder showed itself when Bear snapped a flashlight on. He was preparing to enter when Broker stopped him. Fibers. Broker pointed to the top rung of the ladder, where something was hanging off the uneven wooden step. He got to his belly and produced a large magnifying glass. The fibers turned out to be from clothing. He sifted through them, and then his fingers stopped moving. He held his palm up, and there nestled between white filaments was a long brown hair. Let's go, Zeb gave the order. He stopped Bear as he made a move, and went in first. Bawana was the last to descend, and as he closed the door above him, he applied a thick putty to its edges and attached a GPS tag to its surface. The putty would harden in a few minutes and would seal the tunnel shut from the inside. Anyone coming up their back would have to break down the door. That would give them enough warning. The Garita de Otai tunnel was larger, deeper, and better dug than the Laredo one. Two large men could walk side by side comfortably. Its interior had the same layout. A set of rails to the side, but this tunnel had more trolleys. It was also cleaner. They made quick time once their NVGs and imagers showed no presence of hostels. There was inside lighting, and at regular intervals, there were plastic tanks filled with water. Pickaxes, shovels, and construction equipment were stacked neatly in several places. A regular highway, Bear snorted. Zeb agreed with his friend. More than 190 tunnels discovered by Mexican and U.S. authorities. But I'm betting this one's the most advanced one. The tunnel was a shade over 2,500 feet in length and started curving upwards when they reached its end. The rails ended at the bottom of another wooden ladder, and when Zeb looked up and aimed his flashlight, he saw the exit door flush against the roof of the tunnel. The tunnel opened into an abandoned building on American soil, the cartel man had told them. What used to be a flop house in San Diego. There was no easy way to emerge from a tunnel. Climbing out was when an operative was the most vulnerable. Any gangbangers could pick them off easily. Not as if we have any choice. Zeb latched onto the last rung with his left hand. Grabbed his glock with his right and lunged open the door with his head. It slammed open and he heaved up in a rush, his gun ready. Large room. Paint peeling off walls. Smell of urine. Stale air. Littered floor. No hoods. He climbed out, helped Chloe, and the operatives fan through the building. It was a single-story structure with three rooms and a single bathroom. There were markings on the wall where bunk beds had once been attached. Two rear exits, both sealed from the inside, one front entrance. Zeb peered out from a dusty window at the front, keeping his body well away from the glass. The building was in a service area. There was a gas station to their left, with a diner attached to it. In front was a small yard that had a driveway that joined a service road. 
The road, in turn, merged into a crossroad at which were a set of lights. We're in Otai Mesa, Broker mentioned, and pointed over Zeb's left shoulder. Over there somewhere is the border crossing. Zeb was watching the vehicles on the road. Not only was it an industrial area, but there was the border too, which meant a regular flow of traffic. He lifted his binos and focused on some of the vehicles in the gas station. His radar didn't ping. There were a few vehicles on the opposite side of the crossroad. Black SUVs like the ones they used. They were too far away to make anything out. A clanking sound got his attention. To their right was a garage on the same service road. More vehicles there. Mechanics at work or customers talking to them. It's a good location for a tunnel. There's enough vehicle and people traffic that a few smugglers wouldn't be noticed. Broker again, stating the obvious. Let's ask at the garage. Zeb lowered his binos. They're closest. If we're lucky, someone might have seen people exit from here. They packed up and strapped their HKs to their shoulders. He opened the door and took a step out, Chloe behind him, the others readying to emerge. A black jeep drove past the garage, coming in from their right. Zeb looked at it casually and set off on foot to the auto shop. He had barely taken two steps when he was shot. Chapter 40 the round grazed his left shoulder and punched into something with a smack. No time to see what it had hit. He threw himself to the ground, his Glock coming into his hand without thought, and triggered at the jeep. It was accelerating, but it was also heading towards the crossroads. A large semi was ahead of it, making it slow down. Zeb took off at a run, aware that Chloe was yelling indistinctly, his friends firing. Three steps took him to the service road. A car came up from behind, slammed on its brakes hard when Zeb stepped right in front of it. The driver bit off an oath when he saw the Glocks in their hands. Zeb put them behind him. One of the jeep's windows had rolled down, and he could see a rifle poking out. He timed his shot just before his right foot was landing, and when his left one was rolling. The jeep's rear window shattered. Maybe my shot, or that of the others. The vehicle's taillights flared bright as it neared the semi. Ten feet away. Now eight feet. He emptied a magazine through the rear. Reloaded in a blurring move. His breathing steady. Sunlight glancing off the jeep's roof, a bird flying high above in the sky, the smell of gasoline and grease from the food joint in the air. And then he was flying, his left hand reaching out to grab the rear handle. A barrage of shots sounded, and the jeep lurched and rolled to an ungainly stop. He yanked the rear door open. Dropped to the ground right away when two heads turned around and an AR-15 raised. He thrust his hand up and fired a long burst, then crawled quickly to the passenger side. From behind, more shots crashed into the vehicle's body, shattering its windows, rocking it with the impact. Stop, a voice screamed from inside. I'm. Zeb rose, wrenched the passenger door open and hauled the screamer out, his glock to the man's temple. Driver's down, bro, Bawana called out from the other side. Lorenzo Limon, the shooter cried out when Bear and Bawana loomed over him. They were still at the jeep, which had just two men in it. Limon and the dead driver. Behind them a crowd had gathered, and Broker stepped away to deal with them. Who are you? Why did you shoot at us? Zeb inspected the hitter. His right thigh was smashed, and his face was dripping with sweat. Tell me why I shouldn't kill you. There were gang tats on his forearms and neck, none that Zeb recognized. I'm just a soldier, Limon cried out again. I don't know anything. It was Raymond's idea to take a shot at you. Raymond's the driver. Bear jerked his head at the body slumped against the wheel. That's him. We were told to keep watch. But Ramon, he always wanted to be a big man. Words flowed out of Limon like a river during a flood. His fear was apparent. His eyes kept darting, looking at one operative, 
and then another. It was clear he didn't like what he saw in their grim faces. We. Who's we? Zeb grated. Barrio Hoods, said Limon, surprised that his interrogators didn't know of them. He shrank back when Bawana crouched in front of him and shrieked when the operative poked a finger in his thigh. Get to it. Quickly. Limon got to it. He told them how he and Ramon were asked to keep watch on the house after the women left. Who gave you orders? My boss. You saw the women? He recoiled when five heads bent towards him. Yes. They came out with two men. Manuel took them. Where did they go? Zeb resisted the urge to grab him and shake everything out of him. He might pass out. That will delay everything. Airport. I heard Manuel say airport. Manuel and him took them. Don't know anything else, he moaned. I need a doctor. My leg, it's hurting. When? Ha. Huh. When did the women arrive? Limon rocked from side to side, cradling his thigh as he tried to think. Two hours. Something like that. He was trembling in shock. What about the two men who came with them? Limon raised a bloodied hand to wipe sweat from his face. They left. I wasn't watching them. Get me to a doctor. He grimaced as he tried to straighten his leg. All in good time. Describe Manuel and the other man. Something turned in his eyes. You think you're badasses, he began spitefully. You don't know who you're dealing with. Barrio Hoods, didn't you say? You know who Ramon was? Why don't you tell us? He's Lutermesa's brother. You killed him. And Lutermesa is. He's Barrio Hoods. Tire squealing, an engine growling. Down? They threw themselves to the asphalt just as an automatic rifle chattered and peppered the jeep's side with rounds. The hostile vehicle raced away towards the crossroads and blew through the signal before disappearing in traffic. Get its plate. Zeb rose and checked his friends out. None of them had been hit. No. Someone was watching us. Decided Limon was talking too much. Chloe bent over the gangbanger and shook her head. Lorenzo Limon wouldn't be watching anyone anymore. Zeb ran to the garage, where mechanics and customers were emerging cautiously from inside. He headed to a balding blue coveralled man who exuded authority. Pete was inscribed over his pocket, the name matching the Pete's auto shop neon sign. You saw that other vehicle. Pete eyed Zeb cautiously and looked at the jeep. Who are you guys? You can't just shoot up. Did. You. See. That. Other. Vehicle. Saw one man in it. In the rear. Black haired. The window was down. Didn't know he was going to shoot, Pete replied quickly, not liking the body language of the brown haired man questioning him. You take down his license plate? Why would I do that? Are you from some gang? The cops will be here soon. You gangs have. Stop. Pete stopped. Zeb looked at him curiously. The garage owner didn't seem to be frightened, even though he had witnessed an intense firefight and a drive-by shooting. What? You think some gangbangers shooting each other up is going to scare me? I've seen worse. And I've got my Mossberg, he said meaningfully. Zeb? Broker called out and glanced at his watch. Zeb nodded. They were losing time. Combat had a way of elongating time, but a mere ten minutes had elapsed since they had come out of the house. Cops will arrive soon. They'll delay us. I need two rides. Two SUVs, he told Pete. Your best ones. 
This is a garage, not a dealership. The bald man trailed off when he saw the roll of bills in Zeb's hands. Follow them. Luder Mesa leaned forward in his seat and watched the five men and one woman climb into two SUVs, one white, the other red. They had circled after he had shot Limon and had come up from behind the garage. He was alone in the rear. At the front were Lupo, the driver, and Miguel, a senior lieutenant in his gang. Lupo and Miguel were his two most trusted men. They were also two of his best shooters. Not as good as him though. Luter Mesa was one of the finest shots in the gang world of San Diego, which was one of the reasons the Barrio Hoods was the fastest growing gang. We should get away. This is bad. Lupo met his eyes in the mirror. Yeah, Miguel agreed. We held up our end of the deal. The women have been taken away. We've been paid for that. Our deal didn't include my brother being killed. He brought it on himself, Lupo challenged his boss. He knew there was no great love between Luter Mesa and his younger brother Ramon. He shouldn't have fired at those people. Your instructions to him were clear. He and Limon were only supposed to watch. Watching the house hadn't been the deal. Mesa had been paid to take the two women to San Diego International Airport, where they would board a plane. The Barrio Hoods had been paid handsomely for this service. However, Luter Mesa was smart. He figured there was more money to be made in seeing who followed the women. And that's how Ramon and Limon had ended up as watchers. It had gone south the moment that idiot brother of his had opened up on the arrivals. The speed at which they'd reacted had impressed him. He didn't like Limon talking to them, however. Their vehicle had been on the opposite side of the road. They had to go to a set of lights, make an illegal turn, and that had taken time. Our deal didn't include my brother dying, Luter Mesa repeated. In our gang. Blood has to be avenged by blood, Lupo and Miguel chorused. Chapter 41 Two-hour lead. They could have boarded any flight. Zeb drove out of the garage while Broker punched in the coordinates to the airport. Limon didn't get to describe their escorts. He closed his eyes for a second and willed the negativity away. While they planned elaborately for every outcome, they went into each mission with a positive outlook. No planning in this one. We're just reacting. He blanked his mind and focused on his driving. He took a left at the lights, just as several cruisers swept inside the service road. He surged forward, Roger following, intent on putting as much distance as he could between them and the cops. He reached to his jacket to pull out his phone, but traffic was heavy, and he needed both his hands on the wheel. What? Broker asked him. Claire. Broker pulled out his sat phone and dialed her number. He put the call on speaker and placed the phone between them. Broker. Where are you now? She asked immediately, picking up before the first ring had ended. Back in the country, ma'am, Zeb explained swiftly and heard her exhale in disappointment. Always one step behind. There was no recrimination in her tone. Yes, ma'am. You want me to take care of the cops? Yes, ma'am and see if anyone saw anything. Or any cameras spotted them, or their getaway vehicles. I'll also get someone look up flights. Brokers on that, ma'am. Zeb glanced at his friend, who had his screen in front of him. The tunnel. We sealed it from the inside at the Tijuana end, and on the outside, at Otay Mesa. But it needs to be filled. I'll get the agencies on it. The one in Laredo has already been sealed from our end. We have a problem, Roger piped up several minutes later, an underlying trace of amusement in his voice despite their urgency. Zeb felt a burst of pride in his crew. They were singularly focused on the rescue. They were all aware of the risks to the twins. They had been on the move non-stop for eight days, under attack almost every second day. Yet not one of them had cracked. 
No wonder we've never failed a mission, never let down Claire or the president. And with that, a tremendous burst of confidence surged through him and cleared away all pessimism. Yeah? I'm low on gas. Very low. They were on the I-5 heading north, making good time. The airport was about 10 minutes away. He glanced at his dash, the blinking light registering with him. So am I. Looks like Pete didn't throw in gas. He'd say he runs a garage, not a gas station, Zeb heard Chloe retort. There's one coming up. Exit 12. Beneath the underpass. Delaying the fueling wasn't up for discussion. They might lose time now while filling up, but that was better than the time lost if they ran out of gas. Zeb flashed his turn signal and started easing off the highway. Where are they going? Lupo muttered to himself when he saw the turn signal light up on the SUVs they were following. They were well behind them, several cars in between. However, there was no trouble keeping their targets in sight. The red SUV at the back stood out. All he had to do was keep that one in sight. They're exiting the I-5, he told Mesa needlessly since his boss had spotted the developments. There are six of them. Two vehicles. Miguel eased his butt on the leather seat and blew out a breath. There are just three of us. They aren't expecting us. This isn't our first rodeo, Mesa reminded him. Follow them. Zeb took the exit ramp, Roger close on his tail, and searched for a gas station. There. A familiar yellow and red sign. He indicated again and drove into the parking lot. Four pumps in two rows. No other vehicles. He went to the first row, Roger to the second. Standard operating procedure, again. When fueling, each vehicle had to have a clear exit. He jammed the nozzle into his tank while Broker got out, stretched his legs and placed his screen on the roof of the vehicle. Bear and Chloe went inside the store to use the bathroom, while Bawana joined Broker. Broker should have gotten flight details by now. But it isn't commercial flights he's after, he corrected himself. The screech of tires on concrete. He looked up. A black SUV darkened windows, racing into the parking lot. It was closest to Roger's vehicle. Its windows rolled down and two barrels emerged. Incoming. Roger was diving away even before Zeb finished. Broker and Bawana disappeared out of sight. The chatter of automatic rifles filled the gas station. Their vehicle's windows burst. Zeb rolled underneath his ride, just as the sound level rose. His team fighting back. He darted a glance behind him. Bear and Chloe, crouching at the store's door. Shooting back. He heard Roger firing back. Broker and Bawana were nowhere to be seen. The attackers had the advantage. They could pin them down, and they had what sounded like AK-47s. Zeb and his team had their Glocks. They were outgunned. Not more than two seconds had passed since the attack. Time slowed, the way it did for him during combat. His tank overflowed, and a stream of gas poured onto the concrete and made its way towards him. That gave him an idea. He saw the hostile vehicle turn towards him. Accelerating. He could imagine the shooters looking for him beneath his SUV. He rolled out and sprang up in one smooth motion. Grabbed the nozzle and stepped into view just as the black vehicle came up. Two heads wearing shades, two AK-47s turning his way. Driver looking ahead. He depressed the nozzle and aimed the spray at the two men. Gas flew in an arc, covering the five feet easily. It splashed on the roof, hit the shooters right in the faces. Their confident smirks disappeared. Their mouths turned into O's, the driver sending a panicked glance his way. Zeb reached into his pocket. Drew out a lighter. Thumbed it and hurled it at the vehicle. Something struck him in the belly. He fell back against the vehicle and slid to his knees. 
and then the hostile vehicle went up in flames. Time sped up. Sound returned. The steady crack of glocks. Chloe leaning over him. Where are you hit? Armor. He coughed and got to his feet. Bawana and Bear were approaching the burning vehicle, carefully. Roger and Broker going behind it, to the driver's side. The passenger doors opened. One hitter fell out, his hand clasping an AK. His finger twitched on the trigger and then spasmed when shots rained into him. The second hitter at the back crawled out. He was badly burned and looked like he had taken a few shots. A Glock spoke. Zeb looked over the flames. Roger raised a thumb. The driver had been taken care of. Zeb kicked the second shooter's AK away. Who are you? He bent to the man, assessing his injuries with his eyes. The hostile's face had borne the brunt of the fire. There were two shots in his chest and his breathing was labored. His lips twisted and parted to show bloody teeth. Mesa. Luther Mesa. He nodded painfully, sucked in a breath, and with superhuman effort he clutched Zeb's hand in a tight grip. Where are the women? Wouldn't you like to know? His eyes seemed to mock Zeb despite the extent of his injuries. You're dying, Zeb told him simply. What do you have to lose? The eyes turned dark. His grasp weakened. Tur. Luder Mesa drew his last breath without a further word. Zeb rose quickly. They had to get away before they were delayed by the police. He could see the clerks inside the store. One was staring at them with wide eyes, while another was speaking frantically on a phone. The shootout had taken less than ten minutes. Probably five. Anyone hurt? Bear raised a hand. His left eyebrow was bleeding. Concrete chip, he said, nothing serious. We'll attend to it later. The driver. The other hitter. Dead, Roger replied, not bothering to conceal his satisfaction. Let's roll. They were on the I-5 speeding, in less than ten minutes after they had completed fueling. Chloe had run inside the store, smiled widely and tossed a large roll of bills. They had been involved in a shootout that had destroyed most of the pumps. They'd set a vehicle ablaze. That didn't mean they were thieves. Cameras, Zeb realized suddenly. There'll be security cameras at the site. Taken care of. Broker grinned. I fired an EMP burst. That should damage all their electronics. Where did you and Bawana disappear? We ran to the store. There was a large box filled with sandbags outside. We hid behind them. Zeb nodded absently. He had noticed the box but hadn't paid it much attention. You're okay. Broker looked critically at him. You've taken a lot of hits. I'll survive. That armor's doing its job. It's the latest. Still under trial with the NSA. Broker said proudly. I finagled several sets for us. That lighter, he asked after a while, it's the one I gave you, isn't it? Zeb couldn't contain his smile. I thought it was a good time to test it. Despite what Hollywood portrayed, dousing a vehicle with gas and throwing a cigarette at it didn't do much. The lighter Broker had given each of them had an incendiary fluid that ignited and accelerated a blaze. Zeb sobered quickly. Tur, he said. Any idea what he meant? No. Chapter 42 San Diego International Airport was northwest of downtown, and the busiest single runway airport in the country. They parked their vehicles well away from public spaces, in an area that had been cordoned off for construction. The shattered windows and bullet holes would have invited unnecessary attention. Claire will take care of the cops. Still, let's not take the risk. 
Zeb straightened his clothes as best as he could, wincing when his back was turned to the others. Now that the adrenaline had dissipated, the impacts from the rounds were making themselves felt. His move didn't work. You should let me look at those, Chloe told him when he turned around. Not now. He set off quickly to the terminal building. Broker, what's taking you so long to crack the flight schedules? I got those a long time ago, Broker protested. He was carrying his screen with him. I'm checking manifests for two women. Also, the security cameras. They wouldn't fly commercial, would they? Bear murmured when they entered the busy concourse. You never know. However, I'm also checking private aircraft. That's taking a little longer. Zeb watched the check-in counters and the lines in front of them for a moment. Bear's right. They wouldn't fly commercial. Their captors wouldn't risk their being seen. The twins' faces are on TV every day. High above them, coincidentally, a screen flashed the Peterson's images, along with the police toll-free number. He went to a map of the terminal and headed out to the VIP area. Better signal here, Broker muttered to himself as he trotted behind. They attracted curious glances. They weren't carrying any luggage. They had made themselves as presentable as possible. However, there was still grime on their clothing. Zeb's jacket had a large oil stain and Roger's had damp patches. No commercial, Broker announced when Zeb took them up a flight of stairs. The camera images. Werner's working on them. Ten private aircraft in that two-hour window, he briefed them when they reached the secluded section. Four of them business jets. He stopped, rested the screen on a coffee counter at a store and typed furiously. All four are legit. Zeb searched the hushed area outside the VIP zone's sliding doors. He didn't know what he was looking for, but trusted himself to know when he saw anything unusual. Four more are okay too, Broker continued his commentary. Chloe went to a food counter, smiled, and placed an order for several coffees. Broker. Who's the security chief? Zeb interrupted him. Ron Forrester. Ex-Marine. You want to call him? I've got his number. Zeb dialed it as his friend recited the digits, his eyes moving ceaselessly. They lingered on a brown-haired woman, moved on when she turned out to be someone else. One flight went to Mexico. No, it's legit, Broker replied quickly when everyone stiffened and looked in his direction. Chloe returned with several paper cups and handed them out. Zeb took one, sipped and held his phone to his ear. Mr. Forrester. Yeah? Who are you? How did you get this number? My name is Zeb Carter, sir. You might have heard of the Peterson twins' disappearance. His cup fell to the floor when Broker shoved against his shoulder and thrust the screen in front of him. Everyone huddled around the screen. Someone sucked in a breath sharply. Chloe gasped. The twins had been caught on one of the cameras. Beth and Megan, looking up, directly at it. Both were gaunt looking, Beth's eyes were dull with fatigue. Megan's were sharp in contrast. Alert. She was sending a message to them. We were here. Liquid spilled to the floor. Zeb glanced down and saw Bear had unconsciously crushed his coffee cup. The hot drink had dripped over his hand, but he showed no agony. His jaw was clenched. Everyone's faces were tight. Broker switched browser windows and pointed to the last private flight. Turkey. Someone said the name aloud. Another voice said, didn't Mesa say Tur before dying? Zeb didn't heed them. He had faced death before. He had been in the tightest of situations on several missions. There had been just one other time several years back when he had felt like he was slipping into a deeper nightmare. Turkey. The name mocked him. Not good. Not good at all. Freeze. He came out of his trance-like state instantaneously. 
saw that they were surrounded by uniformed officers. San Diego Harbor Police, Customs and Border Patrol officers. All of them with their guns raised and aimed. His crew moved instinctively. Never stay bunched was one of their mantras. Don't move. Travelers screamed and fled from the scene. More cops poured in and directed passengers away. Do you have any weapons? A steely-eyed cop, a captain, asked them. Yes, sir, Zeb replied. What's going on? The phone in Zeb's hand squawked. Who's that? Ron Forrester, sir. The security chief. Yes, sir. The officer was nonplussed for a moment. He recovered quickly and held his hand out silently. Zeb gave him the phone. He spoke softly to Forrester, his cold eyes never leaving Zeb's. He says he doesn't know you. He doesn't. Remove your weapons. Carefully. Toss them to the floor. Slowly. Fingers tightened on triggers. Officers crouched as the operatives brought out their weapons. Each of them had two Glocks, several magazines, and knives. Bear and Bawana had flashbangs too, and a couple of grenades. We're licensed to carry our weapons. License for those two. The captain pointed at the grenades. They were separated and led away quickly to the interiors of the terminal, where the security offices were. Zeb was guided to a cubicle, bare to the one next to his, each operative to a separate interrogation room. Another uniformed officer came inside Zeb's room. Nap Stephen, he introduced himself. I'm with the counter-terrorism unit. He didn't elaborate. Stephen looked tough and competent, with his short hair, strong jaw and cool green eyes. Who exactly are you, Mr. Carter? Why are you carrying so many weapons? The wall shook, and a thump could be heard from the next cubicle. I told you. We're from a security consulting firm in New York. Our friends, the Petersons. You know about them. We're tracking them. With so many weapons. Another thud from the other side of the wall. You'd better go check before shots are fired. I know my team. They can tear this place apart. Stephen straightened and cuffed Zeb to the metal table, which was bolted to the floor. He went out without a word, and soon Zeb heard raised voices, indistinct from the other cubicle. Stephen returned after fifteen minutes and stopped dead when he stepped inside. Zeb's hands were on the table, the handcuffs lying beside them. Chapter 43 Stephen slapped his hand to his holster and started to draw his gun out. He yelled out for backup. That won't be necessary. I'm on your side, Zeb told him calmly. Officers rushed inside and pointed weapons at his head. Your officer raised a hand to my friend, didn't he? My friend wouldn't use force otherwise. Stephen's face turned red, but before he could speak, another man bustled in. He was wearing a San Diego police uniform. Trey Muller, he introduced himself. Assistant Chief. He leaned forward and murmured in Stephen's ear. Are you sure? Stephen asked him. Make your call. Find out for yourself. Stephen left the room, leaving Muller with Zeb. The other officers remained, their guns still pointing at the seated man. I don't think that's necessary, Muller told them. The guns didn't lower. Stephen returned. He's one of ours. No threat, he rapped out to his men. Stand down. The officers left. Matt? Stephen stopped one of them. Yeah? Get a few chairs, please. Just who are you, Mr. Carter? Stephen was seated on the other side of the table. Along with him were Muller and Forrester. Forrester was big and florid, his jovial exterior not concealing sharp eyes. Like I said, a security consultant. 
we're tracking our kidnapped team members. Is that all you are? Do you know what your friend did? Bear. Is that what his name is? Stephen began heatedly. How would I know? I was handcuffed here. With you. Do we really need to go into all that? Muller asked Stephen pointedly, who flushed and subsided in his chair. The assistant chief waved a hand in the air as if to clear it. I got calls from people I never met in my life. From folks so high up in office that my head nearly toppled looking up their names. He smiled to take any bite out of his words. That said, you and your people, you're good folks. We're supposed to help you. I have to ask, he said, a smile in his eyes, did you really need to shoot that gas station up? Just self-defense, sir. We didn't hurt anyone. Except the barrio hoods. There was the faintest trace of satisfaction in Mueller's voice. There's a mechanic shop. Pete. He's come on TV to say he was glad to be of service. In bringing down the gang. He looked at Zeb questioningly. He sold us some vehicles, sir. That tunnel. We didn't know of it. Thank you. Got the same calls, Forrester added after a while when Zeb didn't respond. The ladies were here. They boarded a private flight to Turkey. A few of the ground staff saw them. They didn't recognize them, not then. One of my men is giving. He searched for a name. Broker, all the details. He smiled thinly. It looks like Broker didn't need our help. He has his ways. Zeb rose, and no one stopped him when he walked out. Even Stephen had stopped glaring. Ordered the Gulf Stream, Chloe told him as soon as he joined them. They were in the VIP section, a few cops and airport security personnel, hanging around further away. You know whose aircraft that is, he asked, rubbing his wrists. The cuffs had been tight, and of a make he hadn't had much practice on. Luckily, they had given way before Stephen had entered the room. Working on it. Broker helped himself to a cookie on a nearby plate. The serial numbers are fake. And that's stopping you. Roger goaded him. Now I'll crack this. If you guys leave me alone. They left him alone, drifting away to give him space to work in. Who laid out the hospitality? Zeb eyed the plate and a jar of coffee. Forrester's men. Returned our weapons too. Requested us not to use them in the building. Zeb? Chloe prompted when he pulled out his phone. Yeah? They're looking exhausted. I know. He knew who she was referring to. He held a finger up and mouthed Claire to her. Barrio Hoods, their boss began abruptly. The FBI has been wanting to nail Mesa for a long time. He was suspected of supplying weapons to domestic terrorists. Why didn't they act on it sooner? Evidence, Zeb, she replied. Not everyone has your methods. Ma'am, you're saying? I'm saying there are many in law enforcement who are happy Mesa ended up in the morgue. There were two men with them. Yes, ma'am. Their backs are to the cameras, but brokers working on it. Possibly Mesa's men accompanying them. Mesa didn't say why. No, ma'am. I figure he didn't know. In any case, he died before he could tell us anything. Zeb? Yes, ma'am. Why are you still talking to me? Why aren't you in Turkey? Why did the Barrio Hoods attack them? The old man screamed. It was nighttime in DC, and he was alone at home, only the watcher at the other end of the call to vent at. I told you. These are low level gangsters. You can't control them. Carter's men killed Mace's brother at the tunnel. Looks like he was out for revenge. Did Mesa say anything? No, sir. He died before he could. Our sources have confirmed that. What about Mesa's men? 
The two who are with the packages. They'll be dealt with. Where's Carter now? The watcher glanced at his watch and stretched out in the bombardier jet he was in. Crossing the east coast now. He'll be over the Atlantic soon. And you. A half hour behind him. Your team's with you? The watcher looked at the five hard-faced men sleeping in their seats. Yes, sir. You need to give Carter a clue. He needs to go in the right direction. Yes, sir. Chapter 44 Day 9 Zeb woke just past midnight and looked out the window. They were crossing the Atlantic, and all he could see was dark water, far below. The lights were dimmed in the aircraft, his friends sprawled out in their seatbeds, fast asleep. It had been a long day, starting in Mexico. They had flown out of San Diego in the evening, and stopped at JFK to refuel. They would reach Istanbul Ataturk Airport by noon. Leads increased. We lost a lot of time at San Diego. Then we refueled. They had to refuel too. Broker checked out that aircraft. Similar to ours. It would need to fill up somewhere. Still, they're about six hours ahead of us. Enough time to disappear in Turkey. His eyes narrowed to slits as he thought about the country they were heading to. Turkey was a progressive country, a moderate one. Used to be. Its president is now taking back more power for himself. The country straddled Europe and Asia and had a growing economy and population. Important also because of its location and who surrounds it. Greece and Bulgaria on the European side, Armenia, Azerbaijan and Georgia to the northeast, and Iran, Iraq and Syria to the south. Terrorism and conflict on one side, Europe on the other. Refugees streamed out of Syria and Iraq into Turkey, the majority of them wanting to make their way into Europe. It's also the first stop for those who want to join the terrorists in Syria. Impressionable men and women from Europe or other parts of the world slipped over the border to join terrorist groups in Iraq or Syria. Largest group in that region is ISIS. He shifted quietly on his bed and stared at the window. Turkey's got its own problems. Kurds rebelling against the government. We're heading into a cauldron of danger and discontent. And then there's the dude who owns that aircraft. They were met at noon at Ataturk Airport by a uniformed officer, behind whom were two aides. There was a distinct air of authority about him as he approached them. He had a neatly trimmed mustache, black eyes under bushy eyebrows, and a weathered face. His short steel-gray hair was neatly parted. A wide smile broke his face on seeing them, and he held his arms out to hug Zeb. You come to me only when you need help, Tufan Hanum, the chief of the General Directorate of Security, chastised Zeb. Hanum was the head of the country's police force and was responsible for law enforcement across its length and breadth. The agency had helped him take down several terrorist cells in the past, and that association had turned into a warm friendship. He bowed to Chloe. When are you going to leave that bearded man and live with me? He thumped Bear on his back and led them away swiftly after he had greeted Bawana, Roger and Broker. They piled into two unmarked vehicles, Hanum climbing in after Zeb, and went to a modern hotel in the Beolu district of the city. Istanbul was sprawled across two continents, with the Bosporus Strait separating the European and Asian parts of the city. It was a city full of history, where the modern lived alongside the traditional. Covered markets and upscale shopping malls coexisted. Constantinople and Byzantium were its older names, its location on the only sea route between the Black Sea and the Mediterranean Sea had given it prominence. All of them had spent several months in Turkey and were familiar with Istanbul. They had lost the wide-eyed tourist look a long time ago. Despite that, Zeb couldn't help feeling a twinge as they crossed the Golden Horn, an estuary that joined the Bosporus and entered Beolu. There was culture, there was history. 
Now terrorism threatened both. Akar Dermaz. Hanum shook his head in distaste when they were seated in a quiet corner of the hotel. His men stood several feet away and made sure they weren't disturbed. His presence meant that service a tray laden with jugs of tea and several edibles was prompt and flawless. He's a bad one. We know, Tufan. Did you set up the meeting? Broker replied, the faintest trace of impatience in his voice. Hanum didn't take offense. He smiled, poured tea for all of them, and settled back. What do you know of him? Other than that we came close to killing him. Bawana rumbled. Broker had traced the bombardier to Dermaz, an arms dealer in Istanbul, but after that he hadn't had much luck. Dermaz was a starting point, however. At one time, the dealer had sold missiles and defense systems to African despots and Eastern European military forces. He had been suspected of arming terrorist and militia groups, and the agency had tracked him for a while. Rather than terminating him, they decided to use him and had shut down several fanatical groups after getting him to set up meetings with the terrorists. Those operations, along with the Turkish police, had elevated Hanum's standing and secured him his current position. They had also resulted in Dermaz being discredited. The arms dealer had lost his clientele, and when he found out he had been on the death list of several Western agencies, he'd closed down his business. He lived off his wealth now. However, his underground network was still one of the best, and he had a finger on its pulse. He reported he gave the plane away. He had defaulted on his payments to one of his suppliers. He made good by giving away the aircraft. This was almost a year back. I checked. The report is true. The supplier is a private military contractor. He mentioned a well-known name, an American outfit. They don't have it anymore, he continued when he saw the question on their faces. They sold it to a dealer in your country. In Arizona. You could have told us Hanum, Zeb rebuked him. You were in flight. You needed your rest. Zeb looked at Broker, who rose to make a call and then wandered off to work on his screen. In any case, I have arranged a meeting. Hanum didn't look put off by Zeb's reproach. They had worked together for far too long and knew each other very well. In the next hour. In the old district. Do you want me to come along? No, Zeb replied, and Hanum nodded in understanding. You haven't heard anything. I would have told you, Hanum responded. My people are on the lookout. Nothing. We checked the security at the airport. No trace on the cameras. We know that the plane landed at 7 am. It's still out there, on the tarmac at Ataturk. My people dusted the aircraft. The twins were definitely on it. Enough DNA traces. What do you need from me? Hanum asked softly when no one spoke for a while. Nothing, brother, Zeb replied in fluent Turkish. Just look the other way. That won't be difficult. They met Dermaz in a tea house in Fatih, in the historical part of the city. The arms dealer was large, rotund, his white shirt battling valiantly with his belly, a wide belt keeping it all in. His balding head gleamed in the lights, and his smile was strained when they came to him. Are you going to kill me? Chapter 45 Bawana and Bear pulled up several chairs from nearby tables and sat facing Dermaz. Give us one reason why we shouldn't. Zeb brought out his Glock and placed it on the white tablecloth. The tea house was empty of customers. The servers were in a far corner, looking at them fearfully. I don't own the plane anymore. I told the police. You know who does. I don't. I swear. Why would it matter to me, after I gave it away? Dermaz. Zeb leaned forward and fixed cold eyes on the dealer. You must have made some calls when the police questioned you. What did you find? The weapons supplier swallowed. 
It is rumored to be owned by a Russian company. They rent it out to anyone who need it. You got a name? Equipment rental. The name Dermaz Sebastian in annoyance. That is the name, Dermaz cried. Do you know anyone there? No. I called this morning. I got voicemail. What have you heard from your network? Dermaz wiped his face with a towel and sighed. Almost anything that goes down, I hear something. This one? Not a whisper. Whoever has them is totally off the radar. They rose after half an hour, during which broker confirmed that Equipment Rental was a genuine company in Moscow. Its website advertised all choppers and aircraft for hire. He was running Algos to look into its ownership, but that would take time. If you're lying. Zeb looked at the arms dealer. You'll kill me. I know. Zeb wore his shades before stepping out into the bright sunlight and heading to their vehicles, which were parked nearby. Broker had arranged for their standard color, standard make SUVs to be delivered to the hotel in Beolu. It was hot outside, the sun beating down on them mercilessly. There was a hint of salt in the air, and the street was busy with traffic and tourists. He fingered his phone absently, his mind still on the meeting with Dermaz. His cell had buzzed, warning him of an incoming message, when they were inside the tea shop. He drew it out and was thumbing it when a voice sounded from behind. Carter? He dropped, rolled to his shoulder, and drew out his Glock. His fellow operatives were crouching, all of them weapons out, surrounding a blonde-haired man who seemed to have come out of nowhere. Oh, the man exclaimed. Durant. Lenny Durant. I thought you were expecting me. There was a shout from across the street, and a uniformed police officer looked in their direction. Broker. On it. Broker dialed Hannum while Zeb holstered his gun. Durant. I don't know you. The newcomer looked baffled. I was told clearly. Text message. Zeb remembered the cell in his hand. It had dropped to the ground when he had dived. He picked it up, turned it on and saw the message blinking on his screen. It was from Claire. Talk to Lenny Durant. Urgent. I'm with the CIA. Durant mopped sweat from his face and closed his eyes in bliss when Bawana turned the aircon to full. They were inside Roger's SUV, seven of them, a tight fit, but it was the most secure location on the street. We too heard of the kidnapping, and have been monitoring chatter and our assets. I have a snitch. He gratefully accepted a bottle of water from Chloe, glugged from it, and wiped his mouth. In the PKK, the Kurdistan Workers' Party. You should meet him. They watched Durant, who fell silent, his eyes darting across them. What? What does the PKK have to do with the sisters? Durant shrugged. Gumas will tell you. His group isn't mainstream PKK. He reached out to me just a couple of hours ago. I haven't debriefed him myself. Word got to me from stateside that you folks were here. Someone left me your location. Here I am. Zeb called Claire. Durant's with me. Can you send me his creds? I am with the agency, guys. Durant reached into his jacket and froze when four glocks rose. Just reaching for my wallet. He brought it out carefully and tossed it to Roger, who opened it and brought out a driver's license, several business cards, all stating his name and a bland title that he said he was a trade liaison. We don't advertise that we're with the CIA, he said self-consciously when Roger looked up from the card. A rapid knocking on the window made Durant jump. A traffic cop. Move, the cop yelled when Chloe lowered the window. You have overstayed your time. You'll get a ticket if you don't leave. His tone softened when he took her in. Merhaba Bayan, he started off, hello ma'am, and then corrected himself. You speak English? We are leaving soon, she replied in his native tongue, smiling at him. 
He was preparing to argue when Durant leaned across and produced an official card. They are with me. The traffic cop looked at it and back at Durant and then slunk away, muttering something uncomplimentary about Americans. Claire came back quickly with Durant's identification, his build, the color of his eyes and hair, but there was one more check Zeb wanted to do. Durant kept quiet when Broker snipped off a hair of his and ran a DNA test on it. He's the real deal. Broker shut his case and stowed it under the seat. What if I hadn't been? You would have been dead, came the unequivocal reply. Durant didn't ask any more questions and guided them to Tarlabasi. Tarlabasi wasn't far from the well-known Taksim Square of Istanbul or Istiklal Jadesi, the most visited avenue in the city. It was a neighborhood where immigrants and workers lived. Kurds had arrived in the district when the Turkish-Kurdish civil war started, fleeing their strife-torn villages. Syrian refugees had followed, and Tarlabasi had become home to the displaced and the poor. Unlike the square or the street, Tarlabasi was more like a slum, a neighborhood that time seemed to have forgotten. It had narrow winding streets, tall buildings that looked like they could collapse any time. Children played in the streets, and laundry hung high above, strung on lines that ran across the streets from one building to the opposite. Durant got them to stop their vehicles on the outskirts of the district, and they proceeded on foot. Too conspicuous, he explained. We'll be noticed. A soccer ball rolled to Bawana's feet, and two boys came running chasing it. Bawana kicked it, sent it flying, and the kids chased it, laughing. A few men were seated on narrow chairs next to their buildings, reading newspapers, drinking tea from glass mugs. A woman hung out her laundry in the far distance while berating her daughter. Durant walked purposefully, without looking at anyone in particular. He passed a barbershop and approached a street market that sold fruits, vegetables and flowers. He bought several vegetables, and when the vendor, a rough-looking bearded man came over to help, he jerked a shoulder in Zeb's direction and muttered below his breath. These are the Americans. The vendor didn't look up. He was wearing a shawl over his shoulders despite the heat, and his sneakers were torn and muddy. He smelled of perspiration and fruit, and a fly buzzed persistently about his head. He weighed fruit and wrapped it in brown paper, put it in a plastic bag, and handed it over to Durant. Only then did he raise his head and grin toothily at Chloe. Will the Bayan have some fruit? The Bayan would. She bought oranges, and when he packed them for her, he looked around and gestured with his eyes. They followed him discreetly to the back of his stall, behind a cloth partition. He dropped his smile and looked them up and down. You are CIA? he asked them. No, Chloe replied. We are friends of the women who have been kidnapped. She brought up their security firm's website on her cell phone and showed Gumas their photographs. He looked keenly at the pictures, compared them to the bunch in front of him, and then relaxed. I am PKK, he declared, and watched them for a reaction. He got none. You know the... We know, Chloe said, cutting off any history lesson. What do you know of the sisters? My cell is a splinter cell, Gumas continued. Some of us are here. Some in another city. I heard whispers in the morning. What? Chloe asked her face taut. Two American women were seen. Sisters. Green eyes. Brown hair. They were taken from the airport to a vehicle. You were not there. No. I am new. I am not yet trusted. I am on the, he searched for a word, the outside. Why did your group want the women? Gumas looked uneasy for the first time. They are taking them to Izmir. That's on the east coast, nearly six hours away, Zeb calculated swiftly. What's there? he asked the PKK man. More members from my cell. It's a new group. We do things the PKK don't like. But we need the money. Do what things? 
Some of our fighters, he licked his lips, they sell women to other groups. Which other groups? Bear glared at the vendor, who stepped back instinctively from the large man's gaze. To anyone. Even to Isis, he whispered. Chapter 46 They questioned Gumas for another half an hour, and when he became increasingly nervous, let him return to his stall. They hung around until he shut down his stall for a late lunch break and joined him in a narrow alley, a dead end. Durant stood at its mouth to give them privacy and warn them if anyone approached. Gumas cooperated with them. He answered their questions and described the rest of the cell. There were fifteen of them, he explained, all men. Five of them were in Istanbul, while the rest were in Izmir. Why are you split up? Broker challenged him. We buy materials here. Bomb making materials that we can't get anywhere else. Izmir people make the weapons. Sometimes they set them off there, sometimes we set them off here. He didn't seem worried that the operatives would haul him off to the police. Durance cultivated him. Offered him some kind of a deal, Zeb figured, as he thought over Gumas's revelations. They don't trust you but you know all this. He asked the vendor. I exploded my first bomb one month back, near a football stadium. No one died, but my people know I will do the job. They don't tell me everything, but I have eyes and ears, he replied defiantly. The five PKK fighters lived in the same house in Tarlabasi. Nothing was really a secret when dwelling in small confines. You aren't worried that you'll be seen with us? Guma smiled slyly. Three of them took the sisters to Izmir. They will not return today. The other man is sleeping. I locked him inside. I will say I forgot he was in the house. Can we trust him? Zeb asked Durant when they were back in their vehicles. I do. He's given us valuable intel. On both sides. ISIS as well as PKK. Why is he helping us? His mother and sister. They were raped and killed by the same cell he has joined. Durant didn't mince his words. He has sworn revenge. The cell doesn't know who he is. No. His family Kurds is from Balakasar, two hours away from Izmir. He left them when he was young to find work in Istanbul. The family went to Izmir to seek work there. They cast away their Kurd identity. Luck wasn't on their side. The cell attacked a fruit market just like that one, he pointed behind them, and captured several women. Gumas's folks were among them. Their bodies were found three days later. Gumas made contact on our embassy's website, and that's how we cultivated him. What if he carries out attacks on Turkish people? His is a splinter cell, but they're still fighting for Kurds. Of course, they'll attack Turkish establishments. But Gumas, he warns me, I inform the police anonymously. It's worked so far. They dropped Durant off in Beolu, where he had approached them. Just before leaving, Bawana glowered at the CIA man. What if he's lying? I'll kill him myself, Durant replied. It was close to 3 p.m. by the time they set off to Izmir. Gumas had given them detailed descriptions of all the men in his cell. He had also described the house where the men would be holed up. The cell's plan was to reach Izmir by night and set off the next day. He promised he would alert them if he heard of any change in plans. He would also reconfirm the sisters' presence once he spoke to his group, and would inform them. Zeb called Hanum and asked him about the splinter cell. Yes, Hanum confirmed, such a cell existed. Zeb described Gumas and the other men. They are all members. We will arrest them if we find them. Why do you ask, brother? It's best you don't know, Tufan. These people are enemies to my country, Hanum said gravely. Now they are my enemies. That satisfied Hanum. Broker briefed them on the PKK as they left Istanbul behind. It was a party based in Turkey and Iraq that represented the Kurds, 
who were almost a quarter of the population in Turkey. The PKK had waged a war for close to three decades, seeking self-determination. It was a group that had started off in southeast Turkey and was active in Turkey, Iraq and Syria. They attacked government establishments and often turned on the Turkish military. Training camps in the mountains bordering Iraq and Syria. They have major bases in the Kwandil Mountains in northeast Iraq. At one time the Syrians helped them set up camps in the Bekaa Valley. That's in Lebanon, isn't it? Bawana asked surprised. Yeah. Goes to show how complex this is. Our country and NATO have declared them a terrorist organization. The Turkish military bombs their camps in Syria and Iraq. Hasn't the PKK fought ISIS? That's the YPG, the People's Protection Unit, a Kurdish military group in Syria. They formed the SDF, Syrian Democratic Forces, an umbrella group for Kurdish, Arab, Armenian and many other nationalities. They fight ISIS and our special forces help them on the ground. The YPG is the largest group in the SDF. The YPG and PKK both fight for the Kurds in different countries. Both are allies. And the twins have been brought here? To be sold to someone? Chloe said, heavily. That's what Guma said. We have no other intel. Thirty miles southeast of Istanbul, they reached the Osman Ghazi Bridge, which spanned the Sea of Marmara, a body of water that was surrounded almost entirely by the country. They paid the toll and wore impassive faces when police officers at the bridge gave them questioning looks. Hanum had made calls throughout his police network, and that smoothed their passage, not just at the bridge, but also at various checkpoints on their route. They stopped a couple of times to rest and feed themselves, but those stops were not for long. They were driven by a sense of urgency that hadn't been with them stateside. Too many unknowns. Too close to terrorists. Zeb's musing was interrupted when Roger voiced a thought. We're being jerked around. Took you long enough to work that out, Sherlock, Chloe retorted. Hey, you guys need me for my looks, not my brains, Roger replied in an injured tone, and that was the extent of the levity. Jerked around is right. Whoever's behind this is manipulating us. To what end? No answers came to Zeb's mind, and he focused on Black Tar. His grip tightened on the wheel, and for a moment, the car swerved as he thought of the Petersons, captured by vicious terrorists. Broker looked at him sideways and turned back to his screen when Zeb lifted a few fingers in acknowledgement. The highway was even and well-maintained. Trees flashed by as they powered through villages and cities. Agricultural lands and orchards went by. On any other occasion, they would have slowed to enjoy the country its sights, and the hospitality of its people. Now's not the time. Izmir was on the Aegean coast, a port town with a population of about 2 million. It had been rocked by terrorist attacks in recent times, both by ISIS and by PKK, as had the rest of the country. It was getting dark by the time they reached the city and drove through its outskirts to its center. Gumas made contact when 9 p.m. arrived. Your friends reached Izmir earlier. Are they still there? Zeb messaged back. Don't know. No one's talking to me. Need to be careful. The building they were seeking was in a dead-end street in the outskirts of Izmir, opposite to where they had entered. A half-erected building faced it. A wall, about four feet high, closed the far end of the alley. Beyond the wall was a playground. At the entrance of the street were residential buildings with TV antennas mounted on them. Electric cables crossed the road high above. They made one pass and then Zeb had an idea. Let's steal a couple of vehicles. Chapter 47 They understood immediately. Their SUVs would stand out in the street. They were dust-laden from the long drive, but still, vehicles of that kind weren't common. Certainly, not in their target street. Chloe and Bear stayed behind in the street to keep watch on their target building. 
they were concealed behind a truck that was filled with bricks. Behind them was a dilapidated building. No danger of any foot traffic. Zeb and Roger drove a block away and slipped out after they had parked in a public lot. They scanned various vehicles and Zeb hit upon a Peugeot, a French model that was common enough. It was dented and scratched, a sedan that had enough room in its back seat for their gear. Roger chose a Ford Focus. They broke into their vehicles in turns while the other watched. Both vehicles were ancient enough not to have alarms. They transferred their gear swiftly and returned to their street. Any more news? Zeb messaged Gumas when they entered the street and parked at its entrance. The informer didn't reply. They filtered out of the vehicles, using the shadows of the buildings for cover. The under-construction building opposite their target offered sufficient cover. It had scaffolding and cranes, trolleys to carry equipment in, and a cement mixer. It didn't have a single human being but for them. Zeb didn't need to discuss a plan with them or their roles. Broker and Chloe would be on the outside, on the third floor of the half-complete building. They would have long guns and drones. They would be the strike team's eyes and ears. The rest would go inside the target building. Two drones took off into the Turkish night, noiseless and dark, not a single ray of light reflecting off them. Their cameras turned on and showed occupants on all the floors. Orange bodies, most of them sleeping. On one floor, the second, a man seemed to be watching TV, while on the fourth, another man was reading by a night lamp. The apartment they wanted was on the third floor. Five bodies in the large room that faced the street. Three of them lying on the floor, two kneeling. Rifles, several of them, some stacked, some by the sides of the sleeping men. Zeb's lips tightened. The problem with operating in countries such as Turkey was the lack of intel. There were no building plans they could draw upon. No mandatory fire escapes. We should figure on two more rooms. Five people that we can see, three rooms. One bathroom, one kitchen, Bawana said quietly as they watched the screens. Gumas hadn't been helpful in that regard. He had been to the place just once and hadn't ventured inside the apartment. This isn't the West, Bawana, Chloe cautioned as she played with the controls. It could have just that one room, a kitchen, and a bathroom. She navigated her drone to the right side of the building. The Splinter Cell's apartment didn't extend that far, but she made the drone hover and let the images unfold. Let's hope all the apartments have the same layout, she murmured. Zeb looked up and behind him, at the floor of their building. He walked carefully over wooden beams and around slabs of concrete. They are all the same, he declared, at least in this one. The drones went to the rear and discovered the kitchen and the bathroom. Broker froze on one image and put his palm across its width. I think Bawana's right. There might be three rooms. The apartment's long. We know where the living room, kitchen, and bathroom are. There's still space to fill. Two more rooms. They could be in one of the rooms. He didn't have to specify who they were. Day 10. They watched and waited. Nothing stirred on the street when four ghosts slipped out from behind the shadow of the cement mixer. TV man's gone to sleep. So has reading man, Chloe briefed them in their earpieces. Those two dudes are still kneeing. Awake. Talking. No sign of any movement in the building. Broker, you've run the plates of all the vehicles in the street? Zeb asked his friend. Yeah. Every car or truck is friendly, except two. The van in front of that building, and the truck ahead of it. Zeb took them in. Both black in color. Signs of use, both parked facing the mouth of the street. They're registered to an electrical company that doesn't exist. It didn't matter that they were in a foreign country. Werner had entry to all the databases in countries friendly to the US. And if they weren't friendly, Broker was at hand to program hacks. They crossed the street, and at precisely 2 am they entered the building. 
It didn't have a security code. Its entrance was just a hole which opened into a narrow hallway, on which were five doors to five apartments on the ground floor. To their right were stairs, and further away was an elevator. Beneath the stairs was a fuse box that presumably controlled the lights in the building. Concrete, Zeb thought as they climbed swiftly, noiselessly. That was a blessing. Wooden stairs would have creaked. Not many buildings have wooden stairs here. Their vibram souls gripped the steps silently as they climbed. They froze when a child cried. Bear pointed at an apartment on the second floor. Its door didn't open, and they resumed. All clear, dudes haven't changed position, said Chloe, aware that they had paused. They reached the third floor and peered cautiously around the landing. Four doors. A thin sliver of light beneath the one they wanted. Doors not flush. Zeb looked at it and got an idea just as Chloe spoke. Two more dudes awake now. Four of them kneeling. I think they're looking at something, but can't make it out. Zeb drew out a cable that was pinned to his fatigues with clips. One end of it was a high-resolution camera, the other could plug into their cell phones. The camera drew its battery from the phone and transmitted images back to the phone. Roger took the cable, knelt, and inserted it carefully beneath the door. Zeb connected the other end, and in a second, images started streaming in. The four men were sideways, their right shoulders to them. There was a large piece of paper on the floor. A map, Buana mouthed. Zeb nodded. The sleeping man snored loudly. One of the kneeling men laughed, rose and stretched. He went deeper into the apartment and out of sight. Zeb tapped Roger's shoulder, who nodded and stood. They would blow the door down. Use flashbangs to subdue the men while Zeb and Bawana went deeper into the apartment to rescue the sisters. As plans went it wasn't much. However, improvisation was the name of the game. And then the door opened. Chapter 48 their eyes had been off-screen for a fraction of a second while they pulled down their masks and wily X goggles. A fraction was all it took for their plan to implode. Watch out! Chloe yelled, but by then the door had opened. The man who stood in front of them was of Zeb's height. He was bearded and dressed in a white shirt and dark trousers. In the dim light his skin was deeply tanned, almost brown, and his eyes were dark. He stared in astonishment at the four figures in front of them, and then the room exploded. Zeb and Roger lunged forward knocking him down, Zeb's HK slamming into his head. The man's yell, and the sudden opening of the door, alerted the room's occupants. One man shouted and kicked at his sleeping companion. The three other kneeling men dived for their guns. Zeb went to the left, Roger went to the right, and Bawana and Bear took a step inside. Their HKs rose and sprayed a withering burst of fire. The first fusillade took out two men. The sleeping man crawled away quickly, stopping when Zeb shot him. One man left. Room filled with gun smoke. The surviving hostile was fast. He had leapt to the far end of the room as soon as the door had opened. He clawed at his waist, screamed in anger, and triggered rapidly with his handgun. His shots went wide and embedded in the opposite wall. He fell back when the four operatives nailed him. Zeb indicated, I'm going in. He and Roger crouched as low as possible and approached the passage linking the various rooms in the house. Sounds of movement inside. A head peered around a door. Vanished when they fired. A gun barrel poked out and chattered in their direction all rounds going above them. Sounds of whispering. They crossed one door to their right. It was empty. Ahead were the kitchen, bathroom and one more room from which emerged the sounds. More than one man for sure. The twins too. Zeb's mind raced. They couldn't have a firefight in that room, not with the sisters in it. We have to draw the men out. Something clattered and slid over the concrete floor before he had finished. 
A flashbang. Bear tossed one more. The whispering turned into shouts. Three bodies surged out just when the devices exploded. In the white light and blast that followed, the HKs got drowned. The three hostiles fell, and Bawana finished them off with a single tap each. He stepped over their bodies and entered the room, HK ready. When he returned, his face was an angry mask. Not here. They searched the apartment, not that there was much to search. There was no furniture, no closets in which the sisters could be concealed. Bare concrete walls and floors mocked them. The kitchen sink had dirty dishes, and a black trash bag had food waste and paper plates in it. No signs of female presence. Bawana and Bear searched the dead men and got out their cell phones. Roger collected them and went out to deliver the devices to Broker. Zeb went back to the living room and knelt beside the unconscious hostel. From outside he heard Broker shout over a bullhorn. Police action. Stay inside your homes. The residents will heed the warning. He could hear the stirring and cries throughout the building, but he knew no one would venture out. Not after that warning. His friends came to him and crouched next to him. Let's ask some questions. Bear couldn't hide his bitterness as he slapped the gunman, trying to rouse him. Zeb nodded. He didn't trust himself to speak, his mood matching that of his friends. They had made haste from Istanbul, figuring Izmir was where they would rescue the Petersons. They hadn't anticipated any more handoffs. But that's because we didn't know, he thought savagely. He stood upright and went to the window, knowing Broker and Chloe would have eyes on him. Broker sounded out his warning again on his bullhorn, and that reminded Zeb. He compartmentalized his thoughts, summoned his training and discipline, and stowed away emotion. Cold logic was all that mattered now. He drew out his cell phone and dialed. Tufan? We are in Izmir, he stopped when his friend broke into his conversation. You are? Okay, we'll wait. Hanum's here. Fifteen minutes away. He was in Manisa on some business, was heading here, Zeb informed his friends. Broker Chloe, you heard? Yeah. Manisa was a town to the northeast of Izmir. Zeb remembered passing it on their way from Istanbul. The unconscious gunman was coming to when Zeb put his cell away. He groaned and raised his head, blinked rapidly, and looked around. His eyes alighted on the bodies on the floor and lifted to look at the hard-faced men in front of him. He crawled back rapidly till he came to the unyielding surface of the wall. Who are you? He quavered. Bear slowly got down on his haunches, holding the man's eyes. Question is, who are you? He asked in Turkish. Roger returned, the phones in his hand, and nodded at Zeb. The fear on the bearded man's face deepened at his arrival. He looked towards the door, as if expecting more men. I don't know anything, he moaned. I just followed orders. Vehicles, Broker snapped in their ears. They acted instantly. HKs came to their hands as they took positions. Zeb and Bawana went to the window and looked out, taking care to shield their bodies. Bear and Roger hauled the captured man and dumped him against a far wall. They retreated from the closed door, staying well away from lines of fire. The captive offered no resistance. He was frozen, scared, his mouth opening and closing convulsively. No one paid him attention. The hostile's weapons had been secured, and the sole survivor had been searched. He posed no threat. It's Hanum, Chloe reported after a while. His men are spreading out and taking charge in the street. He's climbing up with several others. There was a sharp knock on the door, and Zeb opened it. Hanum stepped in, along with four armed police. They spread out inside the house while more police went to each door in the building and questioned and quieted the residents. There were several bombings today. Yesterday, he corrected himself when he realized the new day had dawned a few hours back. 
One in Istanbul, some unrelated killings there as well, another car bomb in Manisa, Hanum explained swiftly, his eyes going over the dead gunman. One terrorist survived. He revealed the location of another cell, here. This one? Hanum shook his head. No, this is new to us. What have you got? We haven't questioned him yet. We haven't even searched the apartment. This was on the floor when we arrived. Zeb pointed to the map and hunkered down. Hanum followed. I should have studied it as soon as I found it, Zeb castigated himself as he examined the document. He whistled softly when he recognized the city. It was in a western country that he knew well. He recognized its streets and the penciled cross on it. Paris, he told Hanum who nodded. Avenue de Lombal. I'm pretty sure that's where the Turkish embassy is. It is, Broker confirmed in his earpiece. I cracked the cell phones. There's a lot in them. What? This cell is working with another splinter cell in Paris. They're going to bomb it in two days' time. Hold up, Zeb told his friend and relayed the information to Hanum, whose eyes narrowed. Your friend is sure. Yes, Zeb assured him. Hanum rapped orders to his men, one of whom produced a secured radio, another taking away the map. The security chief hunched over it and spoke softly for several minutes, and when he finished, he looked at Zeb. We'll take care of that. Inform the French too. What about your friends? We haven't questioned him, Zeb repeated. We are going out. To calm down the street and ask questions. Hanum stared meaningfully at Zeb, then signaled to his men and walked out of the apartment. Gowana shut the door behind them and drew out his knife. Answers quickly, he told the terrified shooter. Chapter 49 Tarun Chalik, the surviving terrorist, confessed everything he knew the moment the knife sank into his shoulder. They were here, he babbled. Three men took them away before you arrived. What time? Zeb grabbed him by his hair and raised his head. Chalik looked away. Six, no, seven p.m., he corrected himself hastily. They used the bathroom, ate some food, and then our men took them away. Where? Iraq. Iraq, he screamed when Bear towered over him. Where in Iraq? Hodge something, I don't know. I swear. Call them. Roger tossed one of the cells to Chalik. I don't have their numbers, I don't know, he sobbed. Only Farat, he jerked his head at one of the dead men, spoke to them. You know their names? The ones who took them. Arslan Oren, Tugra Khan, and Sinan Agkai. He eyed Farat's body fearfully, as if expecting retribution from the dead man. Khan, he is leader. Broker. Zeb called out to his friend while Bear held a bottle of water to the captive's mouth. There are a lot of numbers on those cells. Most of those phones are dead or not responding. I'm tracking last locations for those numbers. Give me time. Guma said they sold women. You have brought women before. Sold them to others? Chalik sensed the tension in the man's eyes. He tried to wriggle away but he was trapped, not just by the wall but also by their eyes. Yes, he acknowledged reluctantly. Sometimes. How often? Roger demanded. Maybe once a month. He looked down and twisted his hands nervously. He had no other injury on him other than the knife in his shoulder, but he was a broken man. What little resistance there was in him was draining away rapidly. White women are rare, he continued quietly. Those two. Our friends, Bear interrupted sternly. Your friends. His body twitched nervously. Khan said they would get a good price. He was going to sell them. I don't know. He didn't tell anyone anything. Not much. He runs our cell. He's a bad man. You bomb innocent people. You kidnap women and you call him bad? 
Gowana barked a contemptuous laugh. It is true, Chalik insisted. He is worse than all of us. Ask him how they looked, Chloe urged her friends in the target apartment. Zeb sensed what she wanted to know. Did Khan touch them? No. I swear, Chalik shouted when all four operatives loomed over him. We gave them food. Water. They went to the bathroom. And then they left. No one spoke to them. Their mouths were tied. He means gagged. There was something around their necks. Khan had some remote. The callers. Zeb Broker's voice burst through urgently. All the numbers are between here and Istanbul. In several towns. All stationary. There's one that started moving. Where? Beyond Konya. Midway between that town and Adana. Konya's about six hours away. Southeast. Konya? Zeb pictured a map of the country, trying to place the town. Konya. That's them, Chalik cried out. I heard Khan say they would stop for a while there. What's there? Nothing. Just a stop to rest and proceed to this place, Hodge. We can call the numbers, Roger interjected. They might have a protocol. Asked Chalik. Chalik didn't know. His voice turned hoarse when Bawana questioned him. Khan alone knows that. There is a call sign, however. Yes. To identify ourselves. To show we are not cops. And you don't know what that is. There was no need for me to call anyone. I was always with Khan. Others called him or he called them. You believe him? Broker asked them. Yeah, Zeb replied, straightening. He's too scared to lie. He went back to squatting and eyed Chalik thoughtfully. The beast was impatient inside him. It wanted to move. It wanted to pursue Beth and Meg, but he controlled it. Going in blind was a surefire recipe for disaster. What vehicle are they going in? I don't know. They set off close to 4 am, after handing Chalik over to Hanum. I can help. I have men resources, Hanum suggested. We can track and stop that vehicle. No, brother. Your men might be compromised. I don't think they know we are following. Let's keep it that way. Hanum wasn't offended at Zeb's comment. He knew how terrorist cells worked. He was aware there were many PKK and rebel sympathizers in his force. I will. We will clamp down over here. There will be no reports that we captured this house. He looked at Zeb and then at the other operatives who were loading their vehicles with their gear. When this is all over, I want to meet them. You will, Zeb promised. The sisters are unlike anyone you have met. They took turns driving, going well above the speed limit. No cop would stop them, and even if he did, Hanum would wield his juice. Bawana was in Zeb's vehicle, and they spelled each other while Broker either dozed or worked on his screen. They were several hours out of Izmir when Broker stretched and uttered a name. Hajij. The packages are on their way to Hajij, the watcher told the old man. They'll detour wide of the hotspot. He didn't have to explain what he meant. There was only one hotspot en route to Hajij. Mosul. Time had no meaning to either of them. Both of them snatched sleep when they could. The watcher's team was with him, and they relieved him whenever needed. He had watched the Petersons being taken away by Khan, and had dispatched two men to follow. He and the remaining men awaited the arrival of Carter. He and his crew were hidden in a residential apartment that was next to the under-construction building. The apartment owners had been paid a generous sum to take a vacation. Carter had acted in the efficient manner he had come to expect. If he was honest with himself, there was admiration as well. Hanum's arrival had worried him for a moment, but none of the cops came to their door. 
Even if they had, he had a foolproof story ready. What about Durant? Taken care of. You aren't following the news? Of course I am, the old man snapped back, but it says the body was unidentifiable. They'll find it was Durant. And that other guy, Gumas? He won't be telling any more stories. Good. Was killing Durant necessary? He asked the old man. You know my rule. No loose ends. He was on our side. So what? He could have suspected something. Gumas was helping us. He too could have heard something. Carter will know it's too coincidental. I'm counting on it, the old man cackled. I don't like Khan. He is unstable. Arrogant. Cruel. I would put a bullet in him. That time will come, the old man replied. My contacts. They tell me that Splinter Cell was planning an attack in Paris. We stopped it. Carter stopped it. It's the same thing, the old man gloated. Why do you think I came up with this idea? I still don't like it. We are now dealing with terrorists. I had another meeting in the Pentagon today, the old man said abruptly. They're still deciding which approach to take in Syria. My way is quicker. Faster. More efficient. You are seeing the results. The watcher didn't argue. The old man was right in that regard, but still. These are terrorists. He can't predict their behavior. What does your intel say? He asked the old man to stop his triumphant gloating. The same. The man will be there. Carter will meet him at some point, and then poof. Are you sure? Of course not, Roker said irritably. But Werner says that's the only possible town, given what Chalik told us in the direction of travel. Hajjages. Just north of Tikrit in Iraq, yes, Zeb said, completing Chloe's sentence. An ISIS suicide bomber blew up a wedding party there earlier this year. Isn't it close to Mosul? Mosul was in the thick of the battle against ISIS. Iraqi forces, Syrian Democratic forces, advisors from Western countries, they were all there. The terrorists fought hard, often used civilian neighborhoods to conceal themselves in. They didn't care if civilians were killed. The coalition forces did. Hence the battle was slow and tense, and each street, each house was bitterly fought for and won. We'll skirt around it. Give it a wide berth. He sensed the fear in them. Were the sisters going to end up in the hands of the most vicious terrorists the world had ever known? He tried to say reassuring words but gave up. They had been together long enough that empty words weren't needed. It's nearly a full day away, Bear mused aloud, diverting their attention. Why would they go by road? There would be ample opportunity to stop them. Roadblocks. Choppers. They know the country, Chloe argued. You can bet this isn't their first gig. They probably have snitches in the police. They can escape at the first sign of danger. Besides, they have the sisters. They have hostages. Bear fell silent. No one had anything to counter Chloe. Broker, there's no chatter at all? Nothing in the airwaves or over the darknet? She asked. No. We would have discovered it by now. Don't forget, it's not just us looking for them. There's some bad news. Broker opened the window to let some fresh air in. I lost that signal outside Adana. It's likely it was a burner. They've destroyed it. Bawana slowed involuntarily when he heard the news. What now? We continue to Hajjaj, Zeb said unequivocally. Daylight arrived. They stopped at a roadside stall an hour away from Konya and drank hot tea. They chatted with the vendor, seeking information, but he wasn't helpful. Several vehicles stopped at his stall. He couldn't remember every one of them. Two white women. 
Sisters. Chloe prodded his memory. I would love to see such women. He grinned and shook his head. But I haven't. Chapter 50 Zeb paid the vendor, and while the operatives climbed into the vehicle, he looked down the road they had arrived on. There were trucks in the distance, a few cars that whooshed past. Toyotas Fords several French models. A few heads poked out of windows and looked at him incuriously. Another vehicle stopped at the vendor, and a family climbed out. Kids ran to the stall and inspected the food being offered. Zeb didn't pay them any attention. The beast was up and pacing. It was disturbed. His radar wasn't pinging, but... I'm overreacting, he thought. We've been moving so fast, there's no way anyone could have followed us. He started the SUV and got off the dirt track and onto black tar. If you're being led, it wouldn't be difficult to follow you. I would have spotted it, he told himself, and floored it. Countryside flashed past, and occasionally they got glimpses of blue in the distance, the Mediterranean Sea. They were curving around it, and would hug the border of Syria, before entering Iraq. Adana flashed past just before noon, a larger city, and then Bawana took the wheel, and Zeb climbed to the back. He called Claire, who was expecting his call. Hanum briefed me, she said when he had broken the previous night down for her. The French are grateful. Several arrests have been made. These guys weren't on anyone's radar? The splinter cell. Yeah, but what they were planning, nope. Gumas didn't know? If he did, he didn't pass it on to Durant. Who, by the way, is dead. Car bomb. Yesterday. Remains were so mangled that they could be identified only today. Gumas is dead too. Hanum's people found a body, knifed. Turns out it was Gumas. Zeb weighed the developments in his mind. He didn't like the proximity of events. The PKK could have found out, he suggested. Even though it was a splinter cell, they could be aware what that bunch was planning. That's Hanum's theory. He's hauled in a few PKK people and is interrogating them. He could sense weariness in her voice. First time I've heard that. But then she's as involved as us and probably hasn't slept. Plus, she's got the Pentagon and the politicians to deal with. Things aren't going well on your end? You could say, she half laughed, Daniel is getting impatient. The various chiefs aren't coming together. Zeb, you're heading into ISIS country. Intel won't be good. Support won't be great. I know, ma'am. Problem? Bawana looked up when he had hung up. Durant's dead. Gumas too. He explained swiftly, knowing those in Roger's vehicle were listening too. Related, the Texan raised his voice over the sound of a passing truck. We should assume so. I saw you look back a time or two, Bear cut in. You think we're being followed? They knew about Zeb's radar. Not sure. They pressed on. The nature of traffic changed as they reached Mardin, which was almost on the Syrian border. They had covered the ground in 13 hours. Normally it would have taken them 16. The phone that Broker had been tracking, Khan's cell, was still offline. I hope we're on the right track. Zeb overtook a truck and fell behind a convoy of military vehicles. There was a significant Turkish army presence. Trucks filled with soldiers. Air Force jets that flew overhead frequently. A few choppers. There were several roadblocks, and they were stopped a few times. Hanum had supplied them with Turkish papers that claimed they were police personnel. Those got them through the passage. At a previous stop, they had also worn loose clothes, similar to what native Turks wore. There was one moment when an aggressive police officer had questioned them at a checkpoint. American, he asked, disregarding their papers. No Turkish, Zeb replied calmly. His accent was neutral, his enunciation perfect. 
The police officer came closer to them, looked Chloe up and down. Turkish. No. I think American or British, he concluded. Who are you? We are with the General Directorate of Security. Check our papers. You are overstepping your authority, officer. Zeb drilled him with cold eyes. The officer flushed. He slapped a hand to his holster, but before he could say a word, the jeep screeched to a halt. A senior officer jumped out and surveyed the scene swiftly. He snatched the papers from his subordinate's hands and read them. He waved his hand without giving them a second glance. Move on. They crossed the border at Habur Sanir Kapisi, on the Turkish side, and entered Iraq after passing long lines of commercial and military vehicles. This time they were carrying papers from the United Nations, signed by the Secretary General, that declared them to be neutral observers. They had to be accorded safe passage and protection by any country. The papers worked their magic. Alert border officials on the Iraqi side scanned them, made calls to superiors, stamped their fake American passports and sent them through. Not one of them inspected their vehicles. I wonder how they would have reacted to our gear, Roger drawled, and drew brief smiles. Iraq at 10 p.m. was no different from Turkey at night. The European route E90 that they had been traveling on in Turkey, which went all the way to Lisbon, had ended at the Iraqi border. The E90 had different names in different countries, but was fundamentally one highway. On the Iraqi side, it turned into Highway 2, which went through several cities, including Mosul, and ended at Baghdad. The highway felt and smelled the same on the Iraqi side as it did on the Turkish side. Just the military uniforms are different. And the license plates. Broker was hunched over his screen, getting as much intel as he could on Hajjaj, talking softly to various military and intelligence agencies. American, British, Turkish, he spoke to all of them. He used a call sign and an identifier that Claire had given them. No coalition force or covert ops outfit would question them. They had to use it sparingly, that was a given. But Broker went deeper. He called on their extensive network that they cultivated over the years. Relationships forged in the heat of battle. Lives they had saved, people they had helped. He called on all of them. At 11 p.m., they went off the highway to a dusty track that saw very little traffic. They stopped and changed into the loose robes that Iraqis wore. Chloe wore a black one but left her head uncovered. She was prepared to wear the face veil if the situation demanded. They all were prepared to do whatever was necessary. Appropriate clothing was just one part of it. Broker called out directions as their powerful beam cut through the dust enveloping their vehicles. Their detour would take them east, away from the highway, towards Dahok. They would cross rural areas and go past a well-used road near Acker, follow Great Zab River, go between Erbil and Mosul, cross Highway 80, drive along Little Zab River, and then go alongside the Tigris until they came to Hajjaj from the northeast. The plan was to reach Hajjaj at their favorite attack time. There was a reason they went hot at around 2 am. It was when the human body was at its lowest ebb, when reflexes were the slowest. Operatives overcame the body's natural slowdown through sheer training and combat experience. To those unused to such hardship, it was maximum vulnerability time. They still didn't have a target house in Hajjaj, but they would worry about that later. Werner was scanning chatter continually while, on another window, Broker was tracking coalition forces and special ops locations when all their cell phones buzzed at the same time. Broker looked up at Zeb and Bawana. Did you get that too? Roger asked. Yeah, Zeb replied and drove to the side of the road, halting. He took the call on the SUV speakers. Zeb. Tune into a TV station. Any station. Now. Claire shouted, desperate, close to breaking point, something they hadn't heard in her. Ever. Broker fumbled with his sat phone, opening a browser, while the other SUV's occupants leapt out and ran to them. 
Bear swung open broker's door and they leaned in. Loading a TV channel's website took two seconds. Zeb saw the rolling banner first. Peterson's video released. And then his breath caught when he saw Megan and Beth, hands bound, collars around their necks, looking at the camera. Chapter 51 Megan found herself surprisingly alert, despite the long hours of captivity and hardship. She knew they had been in Turkey. In the hands of a PKK cell. She and Beth not only understood the language, they could speak it fluently. Zeb had insisted on their learning Middle Eastern languages and all other major world languages. He practiced with them and often spent days conversing with them in a language that he picked randomly. Those skills came into play now. She and Beth hadn't been able to exchange many words. Their lips were raw from the continual gagging and their throats were dry. They weren't touched, however. Not one man had leered at them. She was surprised, as well as impressed at the restraint. That started giving way to fear when they were bundled into a van in Turkey for another long drive. Iraq, she heard one of the men mutter to the other. Khan, she heard him called. He seemed to be the leader. Khan did leer, and at one point he licked his lips when he stared at their chests. The two other men had said something to him, and he had behaved, but Megan caught him watching them in the mirror. She looked at Beth and attempted a smile. So what if they were driven to Iraq? So what if ISIS was thick on the ground there? They still hadn't been molested or killed. She had scraped her head, elbows, whatever part of her exposed body she could, when she came across walls, banisters and furniture. Beth had caught on quickly, and she had followed suit. Her sister caught her glance and mouthed, we've left a DNA trail all the way from the east coast Mexico to here. That's Zeb. He'd better not say he had nothing to follow. Megan winked, and for a moment the sisters shared a smile. It slipped fast from her face when she turned her head and looked out the very dark window of the van they had been bundled into. Maybe Zeb's behind us. That's why we're constantly moving. Terror gripped her when they crossed the border very early in the morning. She woke up when the van slowed to a crawl, and from the window she could see long lines of vehicles and police officers. Khan and the men seemed to have the right papers because no one stopped them or questioned them. Or they've paid the right people. She glanced at Beth who was still asleep and kicked out at the van's wall. Its inside was lined with rubber, and her sneakers didn't make any sound. What little emerged was drowned out by the traffic. What is it? Beth mumbled and struggled to an upright position. Megan gave her shoulder for support and chinned in the direction of the window, outside which a sign was passing. A rock, it said, and with it Beth's breath escaped in a gasp. Khan became bolder during the day. He followed them when they stopped in the countryside for comfort breaks. He would have come with them behind the bushes if his men hadn't stopped him. They heard him arguing several times with his men. They are our women now, they heard him yell. We can do as we please. Remember our orders, the other men cajoled. We are being paid a lot of money for them. Think of what we can do with that money. That seemed to cool Khan down. Nevertheless, his hand brushed Megan's chest accidentally when they were climbing into the van. She whirled on him and headbutted him so savagely that his nose burst and blood splattered her. Khan screamed in agony, and when his men rushed to help him, he slapped them away. He turned Megan's collar on, and while she choked, he wiped his face gingerly with his shirt, cursing and swearing all the while. And then Beth attacked. She launched herself in a dive from inside the vehicle, her left shoulder catching Khan fully in the chest. The captor flew off the ground and fell, Beth on top of him. She growled and punched him with her face, with her elbows, with anything, throwing her entire weight in her blows, her face a mask of fury. Khan's companions stood in shocked silence for a moment, before they rushed forward and grabbed her. One of them retrieved the remote that had fallen and turned off Megan's collar. 
Conroe spitting and snarling raising his hand to strike Beth, but another man caught his arms and the two men yelled and swore at one another. Calm of some sorts returned fifteen minutes later, when Khan was persuaded by his friends to behave. He glowered at the sisters as they climbed inside the van again, his left hand carefully dabbing at his face with a rag. The PKK men carried on their heated discussion inside the cab, most of which escaped the sisters. Are you all right? Beth mouthed at her. Yeah, she nodded. I'll live, she summoned a wry grin. What have we done to the PKK? Nothing. She shrugged. It was in the evening when they finally arrived, after driving carefully, taking several lengthy routes away from combat zones. They were in a house away from the main village, a single-story structure, pale in color. Goats grazed outside it, and the smell of urine against the walls was strong. The van was driven around the back of it, and one man slipped out to check the house out. Empty, he called out to Khan. Like they said it would be. Khan grabbed Megan by the hair and hauled her out of the van. He stayed well away from her legs when she tried to kick him. Another man protested, but escorted Beth inside. They shoved the sisters inside, shut the door, and drank water from plastic bottles. They chattered among themselves, talking of a handover. Khan dialed a number on his phone, We are here, he said in his native tongue. Yes, they are unharmed, he grumbled at the speaker on the other end. Yes, the Peterson sisters. He pronounced their name carefully, emphasizing each syllable. Yes, Hajjaj. Where else would we be? They are coming. In a few hours, he told his men. They're nervous, Megan sensed. Figures. We are in ISIS territory. It's not the safest place in the world to be. She hadn't seen any signs but knew they had traveled south from the border. Hajjaj, she wondered. Where is it? South was Mosul, but they hadn't passed through any major city. We traveled for ten hours since we crossed the border. I'm sure we took detours. We're likely somewhere between Mosul and Baghdad. It's probably a small village, which is why I don't remember it. They're going to hand us over to someone else. Isis. Yelling broke out among the men, capturing her attention. Khan was insisting on making some video, while his men were opposing it. Khan finally brandished his revolver threateningly, and that silenced his friends. He beckoned to the sisters, and when they didn't move he snarled and dragged them by their hair, lining them up against the wall. He waved the remotes in the air threateningly, to secure their cooperation. One man stood guard, watching the outside from a window, his AK-47 in his hand. Another brought out his cell phone while Khan made a mask out of an old tee, ripping holes in it for his eyes and mouth, and wore it over his head. He signaled to his men, and they began filming the video. Chapter 52 Day 11 The familiar roaring filled Zeb's ears as he watched a masked man stand behind the sisters and launch into a lengthy attack on the west. It was evil, he thundered. It corrupted people. The terrorists were on a holy mission to purify the world. These two women, he pointed his gun at the twins, were an example of Western decadence. American women, he spat. They lived like whores and had no moral values. They would meet a sorry end. He rambled on for another minute in the same general manner, and then the video ended abruptly. Zeb heard something smash. The sound came from a distance, over the beast's baying. His eyes focused. It was Bawana. The large man had crashed his fist into the roof of the SUV. It had shuddered from the impact. Chloe had a horrified look on her face, while Broker swore continually. Roger had his jaws clamped shut. Bear's face had mottled and turned dark in anger. It took a supreme effort for Zeb to control himself, to banish the blackness that was threatening to consume him, and to order the beast to stay away. He stepped out into the night and gulped lungfuls of air, letting its coolness enter him. 
and then he was back to himself. Broker, play it again. He eyed the dent on the roof where Bawana had smashed it. Broker, who was still inside the SUV with Chloe and Bear, who had joined him, played the video. This time they watched it without allowing their emotions to interfere. Not a black mask. Something crude. Looks like a dark tea, he pointed out. No sign of any flag. Bawana thrust his head closer to the screen and nodded. ISIS terrorists usually displayed their flag in such videos. He's talking generalities. Not saying he will behead them. Zeb had to swallow before he could utter the words. The video shakes. ISIS videos are professionally shot. This one, it could be from a cell phone. Stop. Chloe leaned forward in excitement. Broker, roll it back a few frames. Broker reversed the video and played it again. Can you play it in slow-mo? The footage ran slower. There. Look at Meg's fingers. Zeb watched carefully and felt a hot flame light in him. Chloe was right. Megan was signaling them, using her thumbs and forefingers to spell out letters, in a code just the eight of them could understand. Zeb and Broker had developed it when they had started out, and over the years, the operatives had refined it. They could spell with their ten digits, the position of the thumb on each finger indicating a letter. A continual sequence was a word. A pause was the start of a new word, and they had signs for numerals. An onlooker would think the captives were flexing their digits for circulation. The signaling needed stealth, since they could not flex for too long without raising suspicion. Megan got it just right. Her thumbs were sliding almost imperceptibly along her fingers. Only Chloe's eagle eyes had spotted the motion initially. Hajij, the petite operative exclaimed. She's confirming their location. Broker rewound and played it again, this time slower. Right from the beginning. The signaling started when the masked man went behind the men. The sisters' hands were bound in front of their bodies. So that the world can see they are captives. Zeb shoved extraneous thoughts from his mind and observed Megan's fingers. Not just her. Chloe pointed. Beth too. Khan. Beth saying the man behind them is Khan, Roger declared. Zeb straightened. Broker, send that video to everyone's screens. Watch it while we're on the move. Half a minute later they were away, leaving a cloud of dust behind. Zeb drove fast, as rapidly as the road allowed. There were potholes and the track was uneven, but their vehicles coped. The shocks evened out the ride and insulated them to a large extent from the rough surface. Outside the village. Megan saying they are in a solitary house at the outskirts. Chloe kept up her narration from the other vehicle. She says there were goats when they arrived. Beth says Khan is with two other men. AK-47s. Handguns. They're awaiting someone. They are to be handed over, Roger broke in. Something chimed in the vehicle. Zeb risked a glance to his right. A message on Broker's screen. He ignored it and continued watching the video. The warning sound came again, louder. Broker swore softly and pulled up another window. He went rigid. Can't you go faster? Any faster and we might knock out the transmission. This isn't exactly the Indy Speedway track. What happened? Werners tracked a call. Someone confirming the Petersons are in Hodgidg. GPS signal says the phone's in that village. You got a bird. Zeb realized his question was superfluous the moment the words escaped him. Broker gave him the look, one he gave to those who were behind the technology curve. I've got several birds in the sky. All sweeping this area. Raj, you heard him. We all heard Broker. Broker, what's the timestamp? Chloe spoke over them brusquely. The video. 
That was 11.40 p.m., local time. The call broker, she grumped. I know when we saw the video. The bird captured it at 8 p.m. Zeb involuntarily glanced at the digits in the dash. It was close to 12.30 where they were, in the remote areas of Iraq. You're tracking. Yeah, I'm tracking that cell. I've got the NSA and several other agencies following that cell. It's still in Hajjaj. Broker, Zeb said quietly, calm down. I am calm. For Christ's sake, you'd think I was new to this. Zeb tuned him out and called Hanum. It didn't matter that he was likely to be asleep. The security chief wouldn't mind a late night call. Not after the video. Tufan, you've seen the video? Yes, I was wondering when you would call. That person in that video. Show it to Chalik, the survivor in Izmir. Ask him to confirm it's Khan. My people are making arrangements for that. You'll know in the next hour, where are you? We're heading to Hajjaj. I can send people from Tikrit. It isn't far. No. He made a video, the old man screamed. Who in hell told him to do that? The watcher bit off a reply. That's what you get for dealing with lowlifes. It wasn't even a great video. Everyone knows it wasn't ISIS. Heck, even ISIS has denied the video. It's all over their social media. The old man ranted for several more minutes before quieting. Khan has to die. I'm sure Carter will take care of that. The watcher smiled in the dark as his vehicle raced in the night. Khan might leave Hajjaj. That might pose a problem. He won't, the old man replied confidently. The YPG leader, Badar Eras, asked them to stay in Hajjaj till daylight. That will let Carter reach there. The Watcher knew about Eras. The plan had been to get Khan to hand over the women to the YPG commander, who would whisk them away. The old man and the Watcher had debated over how Khan would die. The man in DC could ask Eras to kill the PKK man. The YPG had no love for the splinter cell and would be happy to execute Khan. But the video had changed the dynamics. Now Carter would do the killing. You have men watching Khan? Yes. The watcher narrated what his men had told him. Ares arrived at 12. Took the sisters away. How will all this play out? He asked the old man, even though he knew. He was uneasy. This was hostile territory, and he didn't trust any of the players in the game. He wanted reassurance from his boss. We have gone through this several times, the old man barked. Ares will take the sisters towards Raqqa. In Syria. You will take photographs of them. I will use those pictures. Carter will meet the man. And then you know what will happen. You will take care of Carter and his men. Leave his women alive. We don't need to kill them. We won't talk again. Use voicemail. Send me text messages. The YPG are friendly to us. Yeah. They are our allies. You know that. They might let on to the Petersons. Those women are no fools. They won't, the old man replied smugly. Ares knows how he has to behave. No kindness. Treat them harshly, the way Khan did. In any case, he's no angel. Enough of this. Where are you? A mile behind Carter. A mile. The old man's voice rose an octave. You don't have eyes on. Don't need to. It had been easy to slip the trackers underneath Carter's vehicles while the operatives had been meeting Hanum. The highly sophisticated devices could not be detected by commercial scanners and were used by American and British special ops. The watcher wasn't worried that Carter might find the devices. If he did, Carter would suspect Hanum's men. And if the operative removed the devices, I know where Carter is going. After all, we are laying out his route for him. 
Chapter 53 Khan couldn't sleep. Eris had been surly and monosyllabic when he had arrived with two vehicles bristling with armed men. Several women too. He had counted four women among the twelve-strong YPG group that had arrived. YPJ. He yawned lustily and stretched. Not YPG. The YPJ, Kurdish Women's Protection Units, fought alongside the YPG in the war against ISIS. A couple of them had caught his eye. Eris had seen his eyes lingering and had thrust himself between Khan and the female soldiers. He had taken possession of the Americans and listened silently while Khan demonstrated how the collars worked. Where are you taking them? Khan had asked, taking one last look at the green-eyed women. Raqqa, in Syria. Khan's blood froze. Raqqa was the self-proclaimed capital of ISIS. Why, he had ventured. Leave only in the morning. Eris hadn't answered his question. Lots of fighting in the night. Someone might mistake you for ISIS. He had grinned unpleasantly, and then the night had swallowed him and his soldiers. Khan had called the man, the one who had made all the arrangements, and paid him. He was nervous. He didn't know why he had to stay till the morning. He and his two men could leave right away and cross the border in a few hours. The man didn't answer his phone. Khan was about to give the order to his men to leave Hajj when a thought chilled him. Eris said someone might mistake us for ISIS. He might be out there. Watching us. To kill us. He decided to stay till daybreak. After all, he and his men were well armed. They were good fighters. Better than Eris. He was sure of that. His one regret was that he didn't have the American women. He scratched his butt and lay down to sleep. It was God's will. He was woken by Oren's snoring. He rose in irritation and kicked his man, who turned over and thankfully stopped making a racket. Khan went out into the night and urinated on a bush. He glanced at his watch. 2.30. They would sleep till 5 and then leave. It didn't matter what Eris said. The YPG man wasn't around to give him any orders. He yawned once again and was lying down when the door shattered. It was made of wood and was sturdy, but the explosion pulverized it and filled the room with splinters and fine powder. Khan stared, his mouth open, his mind struggling to comprehend this development. Through the swirls of dust, two large men entered the room. One was dark, as dark as ebony, his eyes white against his face. The other had a thick beard and looked mean. Who is Khan? the dark one rumbled. Oren scrambled quickly and grabbed at his gun. Sinan was rolling away while Khan himself was scrabbling for his weapon, watching more men and one woman pour through the hole where the door had once been. The bearded man took a casual step towards Oren and swung his foot. Oren screamed at the solid impact and fell to the floor. Sinan reached for his gun, and then his body jerked under a hail of bullets. Who is Khan? the dark man thundered. Khan pulled his hand away from his AK-47. Me, he quavered. Where are the women? Gone. The dark man picked him up bodily and flung him against a wall as if he was a doll. Zeb watched as Bawana interrogated Khan. His friend looked ready to tear into the PKK's man chest and rip out his heart. He'll do it too. Bawana, he cautioned when one blow broke Khan's jaw and blood streamed out of his mouth. I don't know anything else. Badar Eras took them. He's the YPG leader, Khan wailed. Why did you take them? I was paid. He cowered when all the operatives crowded around him instantly. Who paid you? Broker grabbed his shirt and lifted him of the floor. A man. He said he had been watching us in Istanbul. Knew everything about us. Told us we should pick the women up at the airport and bring them here. To Eras. Describe him. Khan described a man of Zeb's height. 
dark hair, dark eyes, no tats, no identifying marks, beard, no beard, Turkish. He spoke Turkish. I don't know what he was. You trusted him. I had no choice. He knew everything about us. He could inform the police. He paid you. Ten thousand dollars. Khan's eyes flicked to the belt under his shirt. Bawana ripped it off him and glanced once at the bills stuffed in them. You have a number for him. Where's your cell? Khan dragged out his phone, cursing, swearing, crying, and handed it over. Bawana tried the number for Eras. A cell rang outside. Bear went outside, Roger covering him, and returned with a phone in his hand. Beneath the bush. Burner phone. He scrolled through the phone's contents. Just one number on it. Cons. Who asked you to make the video? Bawana resumed his questioning. No one. My idea. Why? Bawana slapped Khan when the PKK man fell silent. I wanted to show them I was boss, Khan replied balefully. Did something happen? What happened to your face? Bawana pointed to Khan's injuries. The PKK man didn't answer. Bawana rested a knee on his chest. Khan screamed. They attacked me. How? Why? I felt their breasts. Just from outside, he cried when he saw Bawana's face tighten. Nothing more. Bawana composed himself. Did Eras say anything? Where he was taking them? Raka, Khan whispered. In Syria. Bawana broke Khan's neck. The operatives had lost half an hour as they navigated through Hajj carefully, tracking Khan's phone. It was stationary, but they had to drive through the village to get to the isolated house. That late in the night, there was no one visible in the small village, and if anyone took any notice of motor vehicles passing through, they didn't show their heads. Broker and Chloe had launched their drones, and after assessing there were only three bodies inside the house, Bawana and Bear had volunteered for the entry. They reassembled outside after Bear confirmed Oren was dead. The splinter cell was finished, but that didn't matter to Zeb. Let's roll, he told the others. They've got just three hours on us. Why YPG? Chloe couldn't contain herself. Drive and talk. There are two major routes to Raqqa, Broker briefed them when Zeb had reversed and set out of the village. One is 19, the road that goes to Hadita, and from where we take Highway 12. We cross the border to Syria near Kame. The other one is to go north. Highway 1. Get into Syria at Rabia, and then take the M4. The northern route goes through territory held by the YPG. That one will go past Mosul. Hasaka Kobani Manbij, it goes through or near those cities. All Kurd controlled. Khan said Eras arrived with two vehicles. Twelve fighters. Now fourteen if we include the sisters. Zeb made swift calculations in his mind as he waited for a sleepy goat to cross the track ahead of them. They'll be safe in the Kurdish areas, but everywhere else, they'll have to deal with ISIS or Turkish or Syrian military. North. We go north. What do we know of Badar Eras? Zeb asked when they were on Highway 1. It would take them to the border, black tar and occasional patches of concrete that slipped smoothly under their wheels. Bad news, Broker sighed as he rubbed his eyes and began a brief history lesson. Kurds in Syria were predominantly based in the northern and northeastern parts of the country. Assad's government had discriminated against and persecuted them for years. Like the Turkish Kurds, the Syrian ones too longed for independence and had carved out Rojava, a region in the northern part of the country, for themselves. Rojava was semi-autonomous and was also known as Syrian Kurdistan. It's more than Kurds, however. Broker gripped his armrest tightly as Zeb drove over potholes without slowing down. 
The region has a Syrian Democratic Council and is a multi-ethnic democracy in its own right. PYD, the Democratic Union Party, the largest Kurdish party in the region, those guys created the YPG. Get to it, Roger griped and signaled to Zeb that he would take over the driving. The vehicle swerved for a moment to cries of woe from the second SUV, before Roger settled and accelerated. It's very simple. Broker rolled his eyes at Roger's wink. The YPG, which is part of the SDF, fights ISIS. We arm them because they've proven to be the most efficient fighters on the ground. We provide air cover, intel. We train them. We don't send ground troops. They provide that. However, Chloe queried. However, the YPG and their women's arm, the YPJ, are formed of many smaller militias. There isn't one single leader. Highly democratic. Even commanders have to take turns cooking or doing the laundry. Ares is one such commander. But he's been accused of ethnic cleansing in several villages. Evicting Arabs, Turkmen from villages. Burning them. His men have been accused of rape and brutal executions. And we're supporting him. Bear questioned, heavily. Well, not him specifically. We're supporting the YPG. But yes, we don't want to associate with Erez. In fact, there's talk back in DC of distancing ourselves from him. Putting pressure on the YPG to exclude him. And he's got Beth and Meg. Yeah, and that's not all. He's got a personal vendetta against Tariq Ayab. Chapter 54 The air got sucked out of both vehicles with Broker's bombshell. Ayab. Everyone in the world knew of him. He was a rising leader in ISIS and one of the most vicious ones to emerge from the terrorist organization. Western media called him the Butcher of Raqqa. He routinely beheaded victims on video. In a couple of instances, he had killed them on a live stream. His fascination, however, was with American women. His men had captured a couple of female charity workers, Americans, the previous year. He had raped them and then beheaded them. He had taunted the Western world as he performed his gruesome acts and had said he would kill a hundred women before he died. He was high up on the kill list of every coalition force. Drones sought him out but never found him. Iraqi and Syrian forces were constantly on the lookout for him, but thus far Ayab had stayed out of reach. Badar Erez is setting a trap. Using Beth and Megan as bait. Roger and Bear coax their vehicles to go faster in the night, in pursuit of the YPG commander. Claire woke to a media storm that had started brewing in the night. President goes back on promises. Sends troops and operatives to Iraq and Syria, one headline read. She turned on her TV and watched Talking Heads report on unnamed sources, confirming the presence of American forces in those countries. There were special U.S. advisors in Iraq and Syria. That wasn't new. There were even a few troops. However, none of them engaged with the enemy. That was the commitment the president had made to the nation. Air support, intel, training, weapons and equipment, that was the extent of American involvement. So where did this come from? She channel surfed but there wasn't anything more. Just those references to unnamed sources. The government had wheeled out its denial quickly. A spokesman for the White House had attacked the reports and said they were untrue. Did I miss something in the night? She checked her email and her phone logs. Nope. She hadn't received any briefing from anyone. No intel had crossed her desk about U.S. involvement. She watched for a few more moments and then turned off her TV. We should have let the Russians, the Syrians and the Iraqis just get on with the job, Hildred growled, looking each attendee in the eye. The same 15 people were in the same conference room in the Pentagon. General Klaus had called the meeting, impatient at the lack of progress. The president wanted a clear strategy to deal with ISIS, and all his advisors could do was argue among themselves. 
We have been through this several times, Mark, he said shortly. It's not up for debate. Have you read the headlines? Watch the news? Bravo challenged Klaus. Looks like there's already a strategy. To commit troops. Those headlines are wrong. You would know, wouldn't you, if we shipped out boots? Yeah. But who's to say we don't have advisors or covert ops at the spear's tip? Fighting on the front. Hildred looked suggestively at Claire. My operatives are busy. Trying to rescue their kidnapped team members. You know that. Pretty much the whole world knows that, she replied coldly, not caring if her cover was broken. That's what we thought. He reached into a brown envelope and brought out a couple of photographs, sliding them across the table to her. She picked the first one up, and it was only her years of experience that helped her keep an impassive face. The picture showed a dark-haired woman with a bunch of male and female soldiers. YPG and YPJ she made out from their arm patches. The dark-haired woman was pale, her features indistinct, her hair obscuring most of her face. She had been climbing into a covered truck when the image had been taken. The second picture was nearly identical, taken from a different angle, but it didn't show the woman any more clearly. She looked at the photographs again and forced herself to stay calm. That knows, it looks like Beth's or Megan's. But it could just about be anyone. A bird took those pictures early in the morning, near Talafar. That woman, Hildred circulated copies of the photographs across the table, is not a Western aid worker. My people checked. No other country's aid workers are in that region. Our analysts, Pines chimed in in support of his boss, almost apologetic as he addressed Claire. They say the woman could be brown-haired. Her features, the visible ones, are similar to the Petersons. Beth and Megan Peterson have been kidnapped, Claire said, turning glacial. They are not aiding or abetting the YPG or the YPJ. I suggest you get more proof before making any accusations. We identified those soldiers around her. Hildred was unperturbed. They're led by Badar Eras. Only the faint ticking of a wall clock could be heard in the ensuing silence. If that woman turns out to be American and an operative. I think we know what will happen, Klaus said dryly. However, Claire has confirmed her operatives are not involved. You folks don't have any real proof. I suggest we discuss more relevant matters. We'll be embarrassed. Big time, Klaus admitted to Claire, if any of our people are seen with Eras. If that woman turns out to be our soldier or operative. The Turkish government doesn't want us in the region. They prefer dealing with ISIS on their own. Assad doesn't want us either. He has Russian help. The president has his no-boots policy, and we have made clear we will not help brutal commanders like Eras. If that woman turns out to be one of ours, Klaus smiled mirthlessly picking up on her thoughts, we'll have a political storm the likes of which we haven't seen recently. The president will be embarrassed, humiliated. Our military policy might get reversed. They were alone in the conference room, after the meeting. No consensus had been reached, and Klaus, disgruntled, had dismissed all the attendees. He had signaled with his eyes to Claire, stay back. We'll deal with this. He waved a hand around in the room. You and I. This is important, but... Not as important as the twins. She gripped his shoulder in silent appreciation, and a sudden smile spread across her face. Don't let anyone else hear that. The spooks I'm sure they wouldn't like that. They shared a laugh, which faded quickly when he looked at her questioningly. Ares has them. Zeb suspects he's setting a trap to bait Aab. General Klaus's face grayed. He knew all about Aab and Eras. All the Western intelligence agencies knew. Aab had burnt a village near Raqqa, killing close to a hundred civilians. Among those were Badar Eras's parents. The YPG commander had sworn vengeance on the ISIS leader and had turned out to be as bloodthirsty as the terrorist. Where's Zeb? Hunting them. 
They need anything. No. What? Klaus asked her when she took a deep breath. Zeb suspects they're being led. He called me at night from Hajjaj. Yeah, we considered that. You and I. He got any ideas? The British, she raised a finger, but he can't see the motive. Another finger went up. Mossad, but they would act directly. They wouldn't use us, especially not Zeb, in this manner. The Brits and the Mossad are two of the three agencies in the world who could mount such a mission. The third. There was dread in Klaus's voice. Its people were in this room. The spooks. Blood drained from his face. Why? They set the narrative today, Daniel. They've always wanted us to back off. Let the Russians do the job. In fact, provide tacit support. If they can prove that was one of the twins, it won't matter that they are captives of eras. The media will take over. The spooks will dictate the agenda. Zeb's just speculating, he protested weakly. The spooks would never do this. There would be hell to pay. Let's hope you're right, Daniel. Find them. He clutched her arm tightly. Find the sisters. I want them back. Zeb's on it. Look into his suggestion. Discreetly. Very quietly. On that too. She patted his hand. They walked in silence and went outside to their respective cars. Klaus was climbing into his when she stopped him. Daniel, if Zeb is right, you know what will happen. General Daniel Klaus, National Security Advisor, nodded. Zeb Carter would go off the reservation. Chapter 55 They had stopped once in the early morning as dawn was breaking to drink tea from a vendor. They had encountered little traffic as they drove through the night and the breaking morning. Broker had arranged for several satellites to watch the route they would take. A steady stream of images came to his screen. He ran the plate numbers, wherever visible, through the Iraqi and Syrian databases. In most cases, the vehicles were commercial that early in the morning. He got Hanum to check the others out. They all came back clean. Hanum had spoken to his Iraqi counterpart and had arranged for checkpoints on Highway 1 at Zeb's request. No one resembling Badar eras, no militia vehicles, had been apprehended. Khan said two pickup trucks. Brown or black, Chloe muttered in frustration when Broker updated them on his findings at their stop. Lots of those. Broker pointed to a vehicle that sped past filled with goats. All they have to do is cover the back with tarp, and no one can see what or who is underneath. And they might have cops on their payroll. Bawana paid the vendor, and they returned to their vehicles. Don't forget, there are several detours they could have taken to get to the border. But, there's just one crossing. At Rabia, the rest of the crossing is heavily militarized. They set off to Rabia, hoping to catch up with Eras before the YPG commander entered Syrian territory. Raqqa, Syria. That was all that registered with Megan before they were bundled into two trucks outside by the armed women. One of them stumbled as she helped her inside the truck. That brought Megan closer to her, close enough to scan her uniform. YPJ. She looked at the men swiftly. You are YPG and YPJ, she mumbled through her gag. The leader, the man who had spoken to Khan, glanced in her direction but didn't answer. He gave orders to his people and they set off, the twins in the second vehicle, surrounded by the four women and two men at the front. The first vehicle had the leader and five men. The backs of the trucks were covered with heavy tarpaulins, with not even a hole for light to shine through. She tried to eavesdrop on the women's soft conversation. No luck. She didn't understand the language. Not Turkish. Kurdish dumbass. YPG and YPJ are mostly Kurds. 
She and Beth slept intermittently as their truck jolted and swayed over rough roads. Fear had coagulated at the bottom of her belly, a constant dull throb that sped up her heartbeat whenever she thought of their situation. They stopped early in the morning for a break, and this time she and her sister paid more attention to the conversation. It was definitely Kurdish. Unfortunately, it was the one language they hadn't learned. Her heart leapt into her mouth when she recognized a few phrases. Arabic. She looked at their captors carefully. Most of the men were bearded and heavily armed. Dark-eyed. Tanned. Rough clothing. Some of them stank. The leader was clean-shaven and had an air of authority about him. He was close to six feet and his AK-47 wasn't far from his hand. He was dressed in faded BDUs that had no markings on them. Eras she heard others call him. The women were fair, dark-haired and black-eyed like the men. They wore fatigues and held their weapons competently. Some of the men prepared a fire and boiled water, and when the tea was ready, they distributed it in paper cups. It's not the women who are cooking and serving. She recollected from some of her reading that women had the same standing as men among the YPG and the YPJ. Rajda, one of the women whose name she had heard, approached them carrying two cups. She removed their gags and their wrist and feet bindings. She pointed them in the direction of some bushes and said something rapidly. Go. No escape, she repeated in broken English. Three women escorted them and watched their every move carefully. Rajda offered them the cups when they returned, and then her eyes alighted on their collars. She spoke rapidly to Eras, and a heated discussion followed, with all the women chiming in. Eras surrendered, raising his hands in the air dramatically, and gestured at Rajda, who removed the collars, crushed them under her heel, and destroyed the remotes. Thank you, Megan told her and meant it. The YPJ fighter's eyes didn't warm. She thrust the cups at them and watched them drink impassively. You know we are American? We are helping you in the fight against ISIS. Why have you captured us? Why are you taking us to Raqqa? Dude, you had better take us to an American base. Beth caught Erez's attention. If you know what's best for you. The YPG commander didn't show any sign that he understood her. He strode across swiftly and slapped Beth across the face. Megan charged and then doubled up, gasping, when Rajda sank her fist in her belly and kneed her in the face. The fighters bound them swiftly, gagged them, and hustled them up into the truck. Looks like they aren't allies, Megan thought dully as she wiped her mouth on her shoulder. This is much better. The old man congratulated the watcher as he recorded a voicemail message. It was night, and if he went to his window, he would be able to see the glow above the capital. He wasn't interested in watching his city, however. He was studying the picture of Megan Peterson as she drank tea, surrounded by YPJ women. The sisters weren't bound. One of the armed women was laughing in the photograph. Great picture, he commended the watcher. The previous ones you sent were okay, but the sisters weren't identifiable in those. I can use these. He waited for a response and then shook his head at himself. Those other photographs served their purpose, however. Those folks in the Pentagon believe some of our people are fighting with the Kurds. I will release these new pictures at the right time. For maximum impact. He grimaced at having to communicate in this manner. However, security had to be maintained. Especially at this time, when the operation was nearing its end point. He looked at a map on his screen and traced the route Erez would take. The YPG man was still a few hours away from the border. Carter was three or four hours behind him. He rose and poured himself a shot of whiskey, his hands trembling slightly in excitement. He glanced once at the photograph on his desk. Him and his brother, a lifetime ago. His brother in his oilman's outfit smiling, both of them in Syria. He retrieved the map and circled Talsaman, a small village 17 miles from Raqqa. 
It was a ghost town, nothing but demolished buildings and empty houses. It had been taken by the SDF forces after fierce fighting with ISIS, and now all that remained was the shells of buildings. It was where Erez would take the Petersons. It was where there would be a showdown between Erez and Aab. Carter II. Tal Saman was where it would all end for the old man. Let me know when you're inside the country. I will then send the message. He finished the voicemail and pressed send. The message would emerge from one of Erez's cells. It would be brief. That he had two American women, prisoners, that he wanted to sell in the slave market of Raqqa. Badar Erez couldn't enter Raqqa. It was heavily defended by ISIS. But he could go to Tal Saman and sell his captives to buyers. It was highly believable. Eris had done just that on several occasions. He had sold prisoners to those who came to Tal Saman. The exchange happened under highly secure and controlled conditions. Neither Eris himself nor any of the ISIS commanders ever turned up. It was foot soldiers who did the actual trade. Eris didn't care that slaves ended up in ISIS hands. All he cared about was the money he got, which he used to fund his war against them. He liked the irony of it. Using ISIS money to fight against them. No one else in the YPG or YPJ knew of Erez's side business. If the other commanders had known, he would have been summarily executed. Even the women in his group didn't know of his dealings. Erez's slave trade wasn't as secret as he thought it was, however. One of the CIA's spooks had learned of it and circulated his findings internally. The old man had been the first to read the memo, and he had researched Badar Eras. He'd liked what he read, and he had acted instantly. He had erased all records of the memo and had arranged for the spook to be transferred to North Africa. He had then approached Badar Eras. It had taken time, but the men had finally met in the Quandil Mountains. He had shown Eras the memo. You know what will happen if your fellow commanders know of this. Eras had stiffened and stealthily reached for his gun. Killing me won't solve anything, the old man had laughed. If I die, copies of this will go to the YPG, to the Western media. You will die within 24 hours. What do you want? Eras had demanded. You and I want the same thing. Tariq Aab. And with that, Badar Eriz's dark eyes had glowed with an inner fire. What's he to you? He had challenged the old man. He killed my brother. Executed him on TV. Chapter 56 The YPJ women made the sisters wear abayas, the dark cloaks that many Arab women wore in the region. They forced them to cover their faces with veils. For your protection, Rajda told them harshly when they resisted. The four fighters had to restrain the twins and force the dress over the sisters. Why don't you release my hands and see how far you get? Beth fumed at them from behind her gag, her eyes stormy. Megan repressed a smile and snuck a kick at Rajda when the woman came too close. They were subdued, however and sat in angry silence in the dark confines of the dresses. Use your anger. Don't let it swallow you. She remembered what Zeb used to say, and let herself lean back against the truck and rest. The sullen silence in the truck didn't last. The YPJ women started speaking among themselves, and Megan heard snatches of Arabic. One of the women was Arab, she gathered. Newly joined up with Azar's group. Tal Saman, she heard. Hold there till Aab comes. Trap him. Her mind whirled. So we aren't going to Raqqa? Why did Azar say Raqqa to Khan? Why wouldn't he? It wasn't like he was obliged to tell Khan anything. Where's Tal Saman anyway? She knew she was deliberately skirting around Aab's name, for it brought up images of rape and beheading in her mind. She knew who the terrorist was. 
Beth and she had researched him enough, and at one time had even come up with a game plan to take him out. The agency had never gotten the go-ahead for that mission, and that plan lay locked in her computer. She'd said something about trap. Eras is hunting Aab? Beth nudged her shoulder. Sis. Yeah, she grunted back and hoped Beth could understand through her gag and from beneath the abaya. Zeb. Heard one of them say. Behind us. It felt like honey, that rush of joy that raced through her blood and fired up her nerves. She closed her eyes, her heart beating wildly, and struggled to control her rapid breathing. Sure. That's what she said, Beth replied snarkily. The next moment, cold fear replaced the hope. How did Azar know of Zeb? Tufan, will I have any problems at Rabia? No, brother. The authorities in both countries have been informed. Don't carry weapons openly. They won't expect UN officials to be armed. In any case, I think you know the Iraqi interior minister well. Zeb did. The minister owed him several favors. The border checkpoint was visible in the distance. It was 10 am. They were still on Highway 1, having decided to ignore the off-track roads. Traffic had slowed to a crawl, and Iraqi police were inspecting each and every vehicle. There were a lot of ambulances, aid vehicles, and commercial trucks. Not many passenger cars. Who wants to go from one war-torn country to another? Zeb removed a placard from beneath his seat and displayed it on the dash. Government, the sign said simply. It worked in some countries. He hoped it would work here too. A helmeted officer tapped on his window. Papers, he demanded. Zeb produced their papers. United Nations? Going to Syria? Zeb nodded. The officer was joined by two more men, who inspected the operatives carefully and compared their faces to the identity documents. You speak English, Mr. Carter? Yes, Arabic too, Zeb replied in Arabic. What's in that? He pointed to a box in the rear. I can't say it contains rockets. Spare batteries for cell phones. Laptops. You know minister? The letter had been signed by the interior minister. He's a good friend. That settled it. The officer waved them through the metal barriers, where they went through a similar questioning by the Syrians. The Syrian side didn't keep them waiting long. Their credentials for the Syrians were signed by their defense minister. It had his office seal and his distinctive scrawl, all arranged by Hanum. It had a number that anyone could call, in case of emergencies. The Syrian checkpoint didn't dare to call it. Zeb accelerated away from the checkpoint, and once they were on the highway, Bawana resumed the discussion they had been having. Those pictures. They aren't conclusive, he said savagely. Claire had sent them the photographs that Hildred had circulated. She said they had been leaked and were publicly available. A media furor had broken out. Several anonymous sources claimed the women were the missing Peterson sisters. That they were really American special ops. They were in Syria, alongside the YPG. That by itself would have created a few ripples and then died down. But several anonymous sources came forward. They claimed the Petersons were fighting ISIS. They proved that the president's promise was false. The stories gained momentum and got the White House to release several denials. However, the damage had been done, and the American military policy in Syria came under intense scrutiny. Zeb and his crew had known of the developments. They were hard to miss, since every media channel was playing the story. In the night, following his call with Claire, Zeb had told them of his theory. That the CIA could be behind everything. It's not something I want to believe. I don't want to distrust them, but... 
Broker had believed his theory. Chloe too. The rest of his crew were undecided. Those pictures. I think it's one of the sisters, Chloe said. The way they hold their heads is distinctive. It doesn't prove they're working with the YPG, Bawaner insisted stubbornly, even if the dumbass media is making it out that way. For Christ's sake, Roger burst out, none of us believe that. Forget the media. They're not our problem. The CIA, however, that's what they stated to Claire. That it is one of the twins in those photographs. Haven't you heard what Zeb's been saying for some time? Bear honked loudly from behind to warn a goat herder off the road, and accelerated to come close behind Zeb's vehicle. Bit hard to believe our own people would be behind this, Zeb, he said with misgiving when Bawana remained silent. And what would be their purpose? I don't know, Zeb admitted. Think of this, however. We took a few big names off the board. Fiorentini, the Haramio family, that splinter cell that was planning a Paris attack. Those were big targets. Huge wins. Why didn't they act themselves? We're quicker. Faster. Maybe they tried and failed. Not all of those would be CIA problems. Fiorentini, he would be the FBI's headache, wouldn't he? Look, this is all speculation, Zeb confessed. However, the way Hildred's implying the twins are involved, his political angle, I can't help thinking Langley is involved somehow. Michigan 6, Mossad, and CIA. He glanced out of the corner of his eye to see Broker's eyes flying over his keypad. His friend had an intense look of concentration on his face. Zeb knew that look. Broker was onto something, chasing down a line of inquiry. They're the only agencies capable of yanking us from one country to another. He didn't interrupt Broker. Of leaving a trail for us to follow. No other agency is capable of that. No terrorist organization can do that. The North Koreans, the Iranians, countries hostile to us. They have sophisticated intelligence wings. But they don't have the scale and the reach. Just Michigan 6, Mossad and CIA. He held three fingers in the air for them to see. And then it's just a process of elimination. MI6, there's no motive. Mossad's the same. And in any case, Thompson and Levin. They're close to us. Very close. They wouldn't act in such a manner. Sir Alex Thompson was the head of MI6, and Avichai Levin was the Mossad chief. Both were friends. Zeb had helped both in several missions, and in the last one had saved one man's daughter and avenged the killing of the second ones. Silence returned to the two vehicles as they contemplated his words. They passed husks of villages and towns, devastated by war. Buildings raised by bombs, carcasses of vehicles, mangled beyond repair. The terrorists used vehicles packed with metal and explosives as mobile bombs, and their effects were visible all over the country. In some places, they saw bunches of refugees cowering under dilapidated buildings. In the wide open countryside, they saw a few families next to the highway, cooking on open fires. Zeb looked away and met Roger's eyes. Saw the reflected bitterness in them. This is what ISIS has done to a fine country. Syria, Iraq, these were once seats of culture. Now large parts are in ruins, their people homeless. Zeb, Awana said, bringing his attention back to their discussion, if what you say is true, they could have plans for us. You can bet on it. You're not even worried. You're keeping things from us. Zeb could see Bawana stabbing in the air in frustration in the mirror. You've known this all along. You can't keep your cards so close, he said aggrieved. I didn't. Zeb shook his head. We all knew we were being manipulated. However, it was only when Claire updated us in the night that it came to me. You asked me why I'm not worried. Right now we have only one goal. We secure Beth and Megan. Everything else comes later. What do you think the end game is? Bawana asked after digesting Zeb's words. I've been thinking about that a lot. 
I think we're supposed to take out Eras. Zeb didn't know how wrong he was. In a building in Raqqa, Tariq Ayoub paced as he held a phone to his ear. The terrorist was dressed like so many other men in ISIS. Thick unkempt beard. Fatigues. A faded army jacket on which there was no insignia. A sig tucked into his waistband. They were in the middle of the city, in a building full of apartments several stories high. Ayab was on the ground floor, surrounded by his men. The other apartments were occupied by civilians. All the top floors were occupied by innocents. It was the ISIS way. They surrounded themselves by innocents, knowing that the Western forces wouldn't attack a building full of civilians. There were tunnels beneath the city, through which ISIS commanders could escape. Some of those underground passages were dummies, filled with explosives to kill any attacking force. The city had landmines everywhere, and only the terrorists knew of the safe routes through the explosives. Shukran, Ayab ended the call and fingered his beard thoughtfully. Pasha, he explained when one of his fighters raised his eyebrows. He's out there tracking down that rumor. If YPG has them Pasha will find out. Word had spread through the city that the Petersons were in Syria, possibly with YPG. Everyone knew who they were. Several TVs in Ayab's stronghold were permanently tuned to American and British TV channels. Ayab and his followers were following the developments as they broke. ISIS was hunting the sisters. It would be a major coup if the terrorists grabbed them. Ayab was hunting them too. He wanted his hands on them. He knew the official line was that they were from some security firm. He had also watched reporters talk about the unknown sources. He believed those sources. The Americans are searching so diligently for them. They wouldn't do that for civilians. He snapped his fingers, and an aide sprang to bring him a cup of hot tea. He smacked his lips when he finished drinking. American women, he decided. He would rape them first. Then saw their heads off slowly. Chapter 57 The watcher got the old man's message when it was noon. He was still behind Carter, who had stopped outside Hasaka, a city that had been captured from ISIS by the YPG. He replayed the voicemail. Send the message. I am releasing the new photographs. Hasaka was under YPG control, and its presence could not be missed. YPG and YPJ fighters dotted the city in their vehicles as they patrolled it. The Kurdish fighters had taken back the city from ISIS a couple of years back. They had then battled with the Syrian military and pro-government forces, and finally taken over the entire city the previous year. Zeb and Broker's special ops contacts pointed them in the direction of the Kurdish fighters' camp, just outside the city. They identified themselves as American operatives when they approached, and were greeted warmly. They asked for intel on Badar Eras, who had the American women. You have heard of them. Broker asked Nazrao, a burly commander who headed the camp. The whole world has heard of the sisters. We watch the news. We made inquiries. None of our people have them. They could be with Eras. The commander brought them the ubiquitous cups of tea. They sipped in silence for a moment, and then Nazrao shook his head. Eras. He's not with us anymore. The moment we saw those photographs, our council decided. He is an outlaw now. We will treat him like ISIS. We will shoot him if we see him. How many fighters does he have? Broker scanned the camp and was quietly impressed by the YPG's organization. Several men were cleaning weapons, American supplied. There were HKs, AKs, AR 15s, grenades, rocket launchers. There was comms equipment. A medic's tent. He saw a few white men, possibly American or British. One of them nodded in his direction. He nodded back. The commander followed his gaze and smiled. Without your help we would be nowhere. 
Eras, he said, steering the conversation back to Broker's question. He has twelve fighters with him. No one has seen him. Your fighters? Chloe asked the YPJ leader, whose name was stitched to her jacket. Resin. He has four YPJ women in his group. They were part of the twelve. You have their pictures? The YPJ woman shrugged. So did Nazrao. Photographs, databases, they didn't have them. We will shoot him on sight, the YPG man repeated. He is bad. Very bad. The women too, Rezin said harshly. They don't deserve to live. Not after what we found out. What's that? Chloe asked. They capture women. Sell them to the slave market in Raqqa. The YPG and the YPJ had questioned their fighters once they'd heard of the photographs. Erez was a lone wolf operator. He and his band didn't frequent any of the YPG camps. He roamed the country, attacking ISIS fighters wherever he found them. Other YPG groups came across him, and that's how they knew where he was and what he was up to. A female fighter near Tal Saman had come forward with what she knew. She had seen Erez a few months ago. He had three women with him. Not YPJ women. These women had their hands bound and their mouths taped. The female fighter had been scouting ISIS locations and had initially thought these were terrorist prisoners. She hadn't given it much thought then. It was only when she heard the American news that several other incidents at that Tal Saman sighting came together. In Tal Saman, she had also seen a few men who she knew worked in the Raqqa slave market. They had been too far for her to sight them with her rifle. The YPG had investigated further. They called all their fighters and commanders in all locations. More reports emerged. More sightings. Eras with bound women. In the vicinity of Tal Saman. Slave traders seen in his proximity. We are not organized in, Nazrao searched for a word, levels. Hierarchy. Broker supplied. That's it. Chain of command is loose. We work in independent teams. We can work fast, move fast, that is the advantage. The disadvantage is that such news, he was referring to Eras, does not spread quickly. We always wondered how Eras got his weapons. Rezin pointed at the cache of arms heaped outside a tent. He said he got it from ISIS fighters he killed. He always had money. Now we know. We will kill him. Her eyes hardened. To us, he is no different from ISIS. You know of his history with Ayab? Nazrao asked them. We know. He has gone mad. Nazrao picked at his teeth with a matchstick. He is obsessed with Ayab. He will do anything to get to that terrorist. Maybe that's why he started trading women. To get money. Vengeance requires money. He smiled, but his eyes were flinty. Werner grabbed the message from the ether once they set off from Hasaka. It was nearly three hours away, but they had to move slowly, carefully. They were nearing the edge of the Rojava region. Once away from it, they would be heading to ISIS territory. Syria was like the Wild West. Bands of terrorists or gangsters roamed the country outside the big cities. They preyed on fleeing refugees and sometimes attacked Syrian army or YPG camps. ISIS had spawned several rebel groups, and to the civilian eye, they were indistinguishable from one another. Broker yelled so loudly that Zeb braked instinctively, and Bear nearly rammed into him from behind. Zeb steered off the highway onto dirt and pinned Broker with his eyes while the operatives from the other vehicles came running. What now? Bawana glowered, fingering his Glock, willing to plug anything that looked remotely dangerous. Hear this. Broker held up a finger for silence and pressed the play button. A voice came, speaking slowly, static and scratchy sounds in the background. American Horrors Twins on TV. I have them. 
Tall Saman, 8 p.m. We'll wait two hours. They set off again immediately. They could confer while on the move, and didn't have valuable travel time to lose jawing around. Tall Saman was where they had been heading to, in any case. No detours were required. Broker hadn't been able to detect who the speaker was. He could pin down that the call had emerged somewhere near Ross Alain, which was nearly an hour away. You have all those satellites, all that fancy gear, that supercomputer, and that's all you can come up with? Somewhere near Ross Alain? Roger sneered. Broker's jaw clenched, but he didn't reply. He remained hunched over his screen and kept running algos. He knew it was fear and desperation that were behind his friend lashing out. He's using burner phones, whoever it is, Zeb said calmly, some kind of masking technology to hide GPS signals. Aha, Broker agreed. I sent that recording to Nazrao to check if it was Erez's voice. It was too short to make out any accent. You got any satellite views of the roads ahead? Chloe was equally measured in their earpieces. There wasn't any point in all of them losing their cool. Yeah, but traffic's increased. Military vehicles. A lot of checkpoints. So far, Eras isn't in any of them. Roger sighed, made the peace sign with his fingers, and fist bumped Broker. I've been thinking, he said after a while. That's progress, Bear commended him. Roger raised his chin disparagingly. The trick was to ignore the barbs, not that they were flung with offense. It could be a trap. Chapter 58 It could be a trap. Zeb peered out intently, over the line of vehicles ahead of them. Movement had slowed down. A truck had fallen on its side, they gathered from onlookers. The line of vehicles was navigating around the accident carefully, reducing their speed. 4 p.m. 150 miles to Tal Saman since they had heard Erez's call. They would reach it by about 6 p.m. at their current speed. They would arrange themselves, light up their drones and take positions. We have no choice. Even if it's a trap. However, it doesn't look like it is. Nazrao said the voice could be Erez. He wasn't sure though. The YPG confirmed Tal Saman was where the rogue commander sold his captives. At night. He always traded them at night. It could be true, he mused. He allowed Hope's flame to burn brighter inside him as he steered around the wreckage and accelerated. In DC, the old man had leaked the latest batch of photographs to the media the previous night. It was as if a fuse had been lit. The photographs showed Megan and Beth surrounded by YPJ women, drinking tea. They showed Eras in the background, looking fierce. The rumor mill went into overdrive. The twins worked for an outfit called The Agency, a source whispered. Black Ops. They were as good as soldiers, fighting ISIS on the front lines. Not advisors like the White House had said, but down and dirty fighting. Reporters and TV vans converged on the most famous address in the world. What happened to no troops on the ground was the most common question. The president made a short statement. The Peterson sisters had been kidnapped, he emphasized. Everything else was rumor, speculation, and untrue. The agency. Is that false too? The president didn't answer. He had the Turkish president on the line to placate. Assad, the Syrian dictator, was conducting his own press conference, accusing the Americans of hypocrisy and betrayal. The Russians joined the media party. Look at the Americans, they crowed. They say they will not send troops. Look what they are actually doing. They have thousands of soldiers in Syria. They are actively fighting ISIS. Claire was alone in her house in Georgetown. She watched the news for a while and then turned the TV off. She had met the president in the early morning and had found him to be surprisingly relaxed. She had offered her resignation. Why, he had asked baffled. 
Our cover has been blown, sir. If you believe the news reports, my people are fighting ISIS. The president had leaned back behind the resolute desk and had crossed his arms behind his head. Claire, how long have you and I worked together? Seven years, sir. Ever since you took office. And before that, you were serving the previous occupant of this office. Yes, sir. Did he have cause to fire you? No, sir. I respect your judgment. Daniel has been briefing me on some of the stuff that's happening over there. He jerked a shoulder in the direction of the river. You're not going anywhere, I'm afraid. But sir, the media. The reports. Leave that to me. He grinned, the same smile that had won him millions of votes across the country. It's a long time since I had a real challenge on my hands. I'm looking forward to this. Nothing has changed in our foreign policy. Besides, this will blow over soon. It always does. He rose, his face turning serious. Find your operatives, Claire. I don't want to see them on TV, in the hands of those murderous people. Back home, Claire read through the numerous messages Zeb had sent her. I hope they're getting some sleep, she thought as she went through his meeting with Nazrao. Looks like there's a storm on your end. Ignore it, she replied. Met the prez. Nothing's changed. Anything on our friends? I have people looking after them. Broker's looking too. He's cagey, but I think he's onto something. All that comes later, she texted back. Find them. Ayab woke up to the news, and he couldn't control his excitement when he saw the photographs. It looked like Allah had sent those sisters to his country, just for him. He made calls all day, urging his informants to find out where Badar Eras was. He called Marwan Pasha, his right-hand man. Where are you? He snapped at his man. Near Tal Abayad Saidi, Pasha replied respectfully. What are you doing there? Hunting eras. I have been on all the major routes and the off-track roads. No sign of him. Keep looking. A shout alerted him in the evening, and one of his aides brought him a phone. He straightened when his superior came on. Nam Saidi, he replied, and hung up. He dialed Pasha immediately. He's coming to Tal Saman. At 8 p.m. With the women. Why there, Saidi? He is known to sell slaves for the market in Raqqa. That's not far from here, Saidi. I will set out immediately. I need the women alive. And Eras. Kill him and his people. You are not coming, Saidi. I will. As soon as you tell me you have got them. The video man is with you? Nam Saidi, Pasha replied with excitement. We will. Yes. Allah is with us, Pasha replied reverently and hung up. Eras knew his call had been heard by Ayab. He had made it deliberately, on the phone given to him by the old man. That cell wasn't an ordinary device. It had technology that hid it from satellites. However, the old man had shown him how to unmask it briefly. It was vital that his call could be picked up by satellites and the ISIS receivers. It was how he would suck Aab into his trap. Erez drove rapidly through the evening, keeping to roads even the natives weren't aware of. He intended to reach Tal Saman by 6 p.m. and lay in wait for Aab. He was sure the ISIS man would come. The jihadist wouldn't be able to resist the temptation. How could he? Everyone knew he had an eye for white women. He will be like a dog in heat at the prospect of these two. A commotion got his attention. His men wanted to halt. Some of them wanted to urinate. The others wanted tea. The women too requested a stop. Eras yielded. 
It was 5 p.m. He was near Tal Abayad, which was 50 miles from Tal Saman. There was sufficient time to take a break. He drove to the outskirts of a village and halted near a street vendor. There was no one else at the stall, just their two vehicles. His men alighted and made a beeline to the bushes. The YPJ women got out and led the veiled captives away. Erez went to the vendor and placed his order. He hitched his gun openly in an unspoken message. The vendor wouldn't get any payment. He would live. That would be his reward. Mufid Zaidi, the vendor, was a low-level watcher for ISIS. He didn't recognize the clean-shaven leader, but the patches on his shoulders were clear enough. YPG Zaidi knew ISIS was hunting for one Badar Eras, who was likely to be with two American women. Zaidi's heart thudded loudly as he went about preparing hot steaming tea for the new arrivals. There were women, YPJ ones, but there were also two who were black robed. He didn't know who was underneath those veils. A YPJ soldier came to him and took two cups. Another came and took two more. A third came, but one of the veiled women darted around her and approached him rapidly. Someone hissed, but Zaidi wasn't paying attention. Three YPJ fighters chased the woman who was close to him. So close that he could see her eyes between the veil. Green. A startling green that he hadn't ever seen in his life. He was aware he was gaping. He shut his mouth just as the YPJ soldiers caught up with the women. They spoke harshly to her as they turned her away and went back to the truck. Eris had missed the byplay since his back was to Zaidi. None of his male fighters seemed to have noticed. A YPJ woman came to Zaidi and her eyes flashed a warning. Say a word and he would die. Zaidi nodded dumbly, hoping no one could hear his heartbeat. The pickup trucks raced away in a cloud of dust, and then he sprang into action. He dialed Marwan Pasha's number. Saidi, he screamed, I saw them. I saw the Americans. Those sisters. Chapter 59 Werner isolated Zaidi's calls from among the millions of other calls and messages being relayed between towers, satellites, and cell phones. The supercomputer knew which keywords to look for, in which geography. It was working in tandem with several supercomputers in Langley, the Pentagon, Britain, and Israel. The combined computing power of those machines enabled it to pick the words up almost in real time. Americans. It understood Zadie's words despite the vendor's pronunciation. Green eyes. Sisters. Those were enough for Werner to lock onto the call just a few seconds after it had started. Zadie's voice boomed out on broker's screen and got picked up by the earpieces of the operatives in both vehicles. Where? They heard a rough voice ask the caller. Near Tal Abayad. I just served tea to them five minutes back. I can still see the dust raised by their trucks. They didn't pay me, he grumbled. Was it Badar Eras? I have never seen him before, Saidi. But I saw them. Who? The Americans, the caller yelled out, pronouncing badly. I saw green eyes, Saidi. So deep green. Like a lake. You fool. Calm down or I will put a bullet in your head. Where is it coming from? Zeb gestured urgently. Broker leaned forward and punched in the coordinates to the caller's location. Forty-five minutes away, the map showed him just on the edge of tall Abayad. Zeb accelerated. Shadows were lengthening, but there was still enough light. Good visibility. The caller was still talking to the unknown man as the two SUVs rolled through the Syrian countryside. I swear, Saidi, it was green eyes. She was in an abaya. There was another woman, also in an abaya. The second one didn't come to me. Who else was with them? Twelve people, Saidi. Four YPJ soldiers and eight men. 
13 if you include eras. No Saidi, 11 without him. 14 with the Americans. Five minutes ago, you said. Yes, Saidi. They left in the direction of Tal Salam. Don't tell anyone else, the voice threatened. Let me know if anyone comes asking. What's in Tal Abayad? Zeb yelled above the noise of their growling engines. Nothing. Just a settlement. He sounded like a street vendor. Broker frowned as he searched maps and databases. Can you get satellite images? Video feeds? Just drive Zeb, Broker hissed. Let me do my job. Zeb couldn't help grinning, the smile quickly fading away as he pictured a map of the region. They were 45 minutes from Tal Abayad. Tal Saman was a further 90 minutes away. There's time to question that caller. Mufid Zaidi used an ordinary cell phone, one of those smartphones, but not a fancy brand. It had enough tech in it, however, for satellites to triangulate his call and place his location. Outside Talabayad. Broker winced as Zeb overtook a military truck, sounding his horn continually. The Syrian interior minister owed Zeb big time, and he had put out the message that the operatives' vehicles weren't to be stopped. By anyone. I ran that caller's voice as well as the other dude's voice. No hits on any database. You didn't expect a tea vendor, if that's who he is, to be in any database, did you? Chloe smirked. You never know, Broker replied darkly. Tar Road and occasional concrete flowed like a river behind them. Traffic scattered at their approach. They had turned on their headlights and honked whenever they approached other vehicles. They didn't encounter any bottlenecks and made good time to Tal Abayad. 5.15 p.m. They split up as they slowed down and went through the town. Broker insisted that the call came from outside Tal Abayad, to the north, in the direction of Tal Saman. But Zeb wasn't taking any chances. He wanted to scout every tea vendor in the settlement. However, after one pass through the town, he agreed with Broker that it was a waste of time. There were several vendors in Tal Abayad, but all of them were in crowded marketplaces. But our eras will not go to them, not with two captives. They rushed out of the city in the direction of the vendor, going where their GPS directed them. Mufid Zaidi was wrapping up for the day. He usually kept his stall open till 7 p.m., but he'd had enough excitement for the day. Besides, he wanted to enjoy the memory of those green eyes all by himself. He was bending down and washing cups in a bucket of water beneath the aluminum counter when he heard two vehicles race from the direction of the town. He ignored the sounds. There was a lot of military traffic, and he figured these would be army vehicles. The sounds grew louder, and when they stopped near his stall, he raised his head cautiously. His heart sank when he saw two men alight. A large black man and a bearded one. The two men were so large that he felt fearful just at seeing them. More men came out, and one woman too, but his eyes were fixed on the first two. They came up to him, their eyes flicking over him, assessing him, looking beyond and around him. No one said anything, and when the black man removed a handgun and placed it on the counter, Zadie moaned. An older man pushed forward and pressed a button on his cell phone. I saw green eyes, Zadie. Zadie recognized his own voice, and he moaned louder. That's your voice? the black man asked him. Yes, Saidi, he replied, instinctively using the honorific term. You saw them. The arrival seemed to tense expectantly for his answer. Zaidi was no fool. He hadn't survived an ISIS country without using his wits. He knew who the interrogator was asking him about. He knew danger when he saw it. He realized it was healthier to answer than to lie or keep silent. I saw one of them, Saidi. I saw her eyes. The other one didn't come near me. But she was the same shape and height. Who were you speaking to? 
Another man stepped forward. This one was slightly shorter than the black man. He was brown-haired and lean. His face was expressionless, but there was something about him. Zadie had once watched a TV show in which a panther had stalked its prey. It had patiently lain in wait and had then exploded into speed in a split second. This brown-haired man reminded Zadie of that panther. They will kill me. He swallowed. The bearded man brought out a knife and placed it on the counter. We won't. We will only cut your testicles off. Zadie urinated in his pants. He couldn't help himself, his fear was so deep. Pasha, he stammered. Marwan Pasha. Chapter 60 They didn't wait for Zadie to confess. The moment they heard Pasha's name, Bawana and Bear swung around the stall and grabbed Zadie. They bundled him into the second SUV and took him along with them, despite his screaming and protestations. Broker grabbed the vendor's phone and downloaded its entire contents. He got Werner to track Pasha's location as they left Tall Abayad behind in a cloud of dust. Marwan Pasha Zeb exchanged glances with Broker and Roger in his vehicle. They knew about the killer. He was Tariq Ayab's trusted man, and there were rumors that he was even more vicious than his boss. There had been one execution in which Ayab and another masked terrorist had raped two women before killing them. That second man was widely believed to be Pasha. Zaidi described Pasha once his nerves had settled, and once he found that his captors had no interest in his private parts. As tall as that man, he told Chloe, who was in the rear of the second vehicle with him. He pointed to the vehicle ahead of them, in Zeb's direction. No hair. Black eyes. He wears a shawl around his neck at all times. Why? Zadie shrugged. I don't know. No one asks him any questions. Pasha had six men with him always, Zadie told them. All armed. His ride was a silver Toyota pickup truck, and it instilled fear into anyone who saw it. He killed some of my customers. Zadie's voice trembled. I was serving this family. Father, mother, one daughter. Pasha and his men came. The father didn't move out of the way. Pasha shot him for it. Just like that. And then killed the mother and daughter. Zadie shuddered at the memory and his fingers shook. You didn't tell the police? Chloe asked him. Police, Zayda? Zadie was shocked. ISIS would kill us before the police arrived. In this region, you are either with ISIS or against them. Why did you call Pasha? There was no need for you to tell him. He would have found out, Zadie replied candidly. And when he did, he would have killed me. Got him, Broker interrupted in their earpieces. Pasha is half an hour ahead of us. Going fast in the direction of Tal Saman. He's following Eras. He'll want to grab the twins. Zeb heard Broker, and his foot stamped on the gas reflexively. They had to reach Eras first. They didn't. Pasha's attack came out of nowhere. Eras's trucks were rolling down a dirt track that ran parallel to the highway that went to the road that led to Tal Saman. Their destination was 40 minutes away and Erez was making plans in his head when the first rocket struck his truck in the side. The pickup broke apart under the impact, and Erez himself went flying several feet, along with wreckage. He lay stunned and bleeding from the side of his head. He knew he was in shock, but he still had some of his senses. He could see and hear, and he now heard the dull wump of another rocket and the chatter of several rifles. Voices rose and women screamed. He heaved the metal sheet, the truck's door, over his body, and struggled to climb out of the ditch he was in. Only then did he realize he didn't have any legs. He had nothing beneath his waist. Just a bloody mass of flesh. He wasn't in pain still. He knew that would come soon. His heart was pumping furiously, adrenaline surging through his veins that kept the pain momentarily at bay. 
He squeezed his eyes tight, opened them and crawled groaning to the edge of the ditch he was in. What he saw appalled him. Seven men, all in black, were firing intently into the wreckages of the two trucks. They were ISIS. There was no one else who wore such clothing. The men who were with him seemed to be dead. The YPJ women and the Americans seemed to be alive. Even as he watched, he saw a terrorist race to the women's vehicle. He saw a flash in the dim light, and dark liquid spurt from one YPJ woman's neck. He scrabbled for his AK. It wasn't nearby. He slapped a hand to his waist and screamed in agony when he felt wet flesh and raw nerves. And then the fiery agony came, and with it, a body appeared over him. Marwan Pasha. The terrorist's head gleamed in the light, and his dark eyes glittered. I have your women. His teeth shone whitely. They are no longer your problem. His AK swung over Badar Eras and it flashed, and the rogue YPG commander heard and felt nothing more. I got them Saidi, Pasha yelled triumphantly as he surveyed the American women and three surviving YPJ captives. Eras. He's dead Saidi. I killed him personally. They outnumbered us but we took them by surprise. We were not even scratched. He swelled with pride. If he was expecting Tariq Aab to congratulate him, he was mistaken. Take the women to Tal Saman. This night we will behead not just the Americans, but the YPJ women too. Five women Saidi, Pasha agreed in relish. But first we will have fun. We will see. Pasha had made a mistake, an elementary one. He had called his boss on an open line. It was understandable. He was excited, his body throbbing with the high of a victory, his loins tingling in anticipation. Besides, who was there to listen? The Americans with their drones? They were so far away. He would be away before they could act. Werner recognized his voice and replayed the call to the operatives. Zeb gripped the wheel so tightly that his skin felt like it was bursting. The beast instead of its savage howling was calm. It shook itself and lay down again. A predator in waiting. Fifteen minutes. Pasha was stationary for just that long. You can track him. I am. He's nearly an hour ahead of us. Racing to Tal Saman. Zeb didn't say anything more. None of them needed to talk about the man Marwan Pasha had spoken to. They knew who he was. Tariq Ab. The watcher heard the call too, and cursed savagely in the deepening evening. He had caught up with the team who was following Erez. They hadn't been close enough to mount a rescue, and when the watcher caught up, they briefed him on the massacre. This hadn't been part of the plan. The watcher fumbled with his cell in one hand, and brought up the voicemail number. He left a message for the old man. Marwan Pasha has captured the twins, along with three YPJ women. He's heading to Tal Saman, where Aab will arrive. They're planning a killing. He dropped the phone and eyed his mirror. He had overtaken Carter when the operatives had stopped in Tal Abayad. Half an hour separated him from the pursuing Americans. Pasha was another half an hour ahead. I told the old man these guys couldn't be trusted. They weren't pros. He clamped his teeth and narrowed his eyes as he drove, waiting for instructions from his boss. Tariq Aab was delayed by several calls with his leaders. He finished them as quickly as he could and left Raqqa with ten men in two trucks. He had to move carefully because the Americans were always looking. Their satellites and drones never slept. Over the months, he had perfected his getaway from his hideout, however. He and many of his men dressed as women in abayas, and they sat in the rear of their vehicles. It was a disguise that worked, and if anyone stopped them, Aab would produce a document that claimed he was a doctor. A doctor in the besieged town of Raqqa was rarer than gold dust. No one attacked a doctor, especially a female one. 
Take care, he instructed his driver. We have to reach Tal Saman by night. He would let Pasha have some time alone with the women. He was confident his man wouldn't start anything until he arrived, but that alone time, that was a reward for his lieutenant. They all underestimated Marwan Pasha. Chapter 61 Marwan Pasha reached Tal Saman at 7 p.m. It had grown dark and the moon looked down on him from a cloudy sky. He got his men to drive carefully through the deserted village, making sure they navigated correctly through the landmines strewn around the settlement. Tal Saman was on a hilltop and had a strategic view of the villages and the terrain surrounding Raqqa. The YPG led SDF had taken the village back from the terrorists and it now lay abandoned, patrolled by Kurdish fighters. The house he was seeking was close to the edge of the village, near the secret route through open ground that would take them back to Raqqa. It was the route the slave traders used to transport their women. His men cut their vehicle's lights and parked them in deep shadow. They brought out the women and flitted from house to house, making sure they didn't make any noise. Pasha froze suddenly and dropped to the ground. A shadow had emerged over the rubble of a house, an SDF fighter. From behind he heard one of the women grunting and heard the dull thud of a blow. The Kurdish fighter looked in their direction, straining his eyes in the dark, and then he collapsed. Our route's clear, Pasha's man called out in a low voice. They resumed their passage, and it was only when they were inside the building that Marwan Pasha breathed a sigh of relief. He got one man to block the windows with paper, cloth, any material they could find. He posted guards outside, and when they left, he was alone with the five women. Just him and the video man, Mansur. The cameraman turned on a light and surveyed the small room. Dirt floor, concrete walls that were cracked. Windows that they had blacked out. Wooden door. He shut the door and pointed to a white wall. Here. We will shoot here. Pasha brought one of the American women to the wall, kicking and cursing under her gag. He brought his gun out when the other women gathered together to attack. Nisar, he called out in anger. His man poked his head inside. Stand here. Shoot the first woman who makes a move, he snarled. The fighter stood, his back to the door, and fingered his weapon expectantly. The idea had come to Pasha as he was traveling to Tal Saman. There were two American women and three YPJ soldiers. Surely he could execute one of the green-eyed ones. His boss wouldn't mind, would he? The thought gripped him, excited him, and he had spoken to Mansur in a low voice. The plan had been hastily made. Marwan Pasha would behead one American before Ayab arrived. That would still leave four more women for the ISIS leader. Pasha struck the American repeatedly in the face as she fought him. From behind, he heard Mansur and Nisar hit the other women with their AKs and subdue them. You are a whore. Pasha cursed as the woman used her body to hit him. The world will see you die. He ripped the veil from her face, grabbed her hair, and smashed a fist into her mouth. She collapsed. He heaved her up and propped her against the wall. He wrapped his shawl over the lower part of his face and used her veil to cover his head, leaving just his eyes visible. His groin twitched when he saw her dazed eyes and heard her panting breath and the muffled screaming from behind him. Saidi. Mansur stopped him when Nisar handed him a sword. This has to be proper. You need to set the scene. Pasha understood. He had to deliver a monologue. A long one. That would be the right way to kill an American whore. Zeb's vehicles tore through the night. Broker was calling out Pasha's position every 15 minutes. They cut the lead down to 40 minutes, then to half an hour. It became 25 minutes by the time they came close to Tal Saman. There was little traffic, most of which was SDF vehicles. Nasrao had warned them about the operatives' SUVs, and none blocked their swift pursuit. 
Mines there will be mines, Seb said bleakly. Nasra's given us some safe routes. In any case, we have that drone with us, Broker replied confidently. The landmine detecting drone was a new piece of gear that Broker had brought along. The drone hovered a few inches over the ground and fired bursts of GPR, ground-penetrating radar, along with laser, and mapped the underground surface. It could explode the devices too. However, the operatives only needed to know where the mines were. Where is he? He stopped at the edge of the village. Zeb risked a glance at Broker's screen and saw a green point on it, presumably Pasha, before a warning honk brought his attention back to the road. Zeb, leave this to me, his friend sighed. Just get us there in one piece. The watcher reached Tall Saman twenty minutes after Pasha. He knew of the safe routes in and out of the village, valuable intel that Eraz had shared with them. He and his six men parked outside the village and set off urgently, crouching low. SDF men, one of his men said in his earpiece. Kill them, the watcher replied. We have no friends. We have to find Pasha and rescue the women. Before Aab or Carter get here. The watcher hadn't heard from the old man yet. He was winging it. His brief had been to photograph Carter as the operative took on Aab and Eras. Carter killing Aab was the best outcome, but if that didn't happen, the watcher was to kill both of them and wipe out Carter's crew, Eras too. The old man would use the photographs to further his agenda in D.C. The plan was in ruins, however, and the old man still hadn't gotten back to him. Right now, all that mattered was rescuing the captured prisoners. He wasn't going to let women get executed, not on his watch. Everything else could be dealt with later. The dark shapes of buildings came into view, silhouetted against the night sky. Zeb and Bawana were driving dark, and when the shapes came into view, they slowed. That's it, Broker announced. They had left black tar and dirt track, and had been jostling on rough, uneven ground for more than a mile, climbing up the hill, so that they could get as close as they could to Pasha's location. Zeb steered to a large rocky outcrop and stopped. Bawana parked behind him. They jumped out swiftly, and Broker and Chloe immediately launched their drones. The older man reached into Zeb's SUV and came out with a spindly device with rotors on top of it. The landmine detector. What about him? Bear pointed to Zadie, who remained inside the second vehicle, fear written large on his face. You know Tal Saman? Zeb asked him. No Saidi, Zadie whispered. Gag him and tie him. If anyone finds him, they'll see he's a prisoner. Don't kill me, Zadie whimpered. We won't. We are not ISIS. The route to Pasha's location didn't cover any of the safe routes Nazrao had given them. Their progress was slowed down by the mine detector, which flew slowly and had to be maneuvered over every bump and outcrop. How long has he been here? Zeb asked Broker as they hunched behind the drone and followed. They were all wearing their NVGs, all of them locked and loaded, prepared for any eventuality. About twelve minutes. He's still in that house. Broker had partitioned his screen into several windows. Two windows had feeds from the aerial drones that Chloe and Bear were piloting, the third had the mine detector's video, while a fourth window showed a map of the village with Pasha's cell phone location. They had progressed 200 yards, crossing one house, hugging the wall of another when Bear stopped them. Hostel. At hour 2. Chapter 62. Zeb fell to the ground and searched the buildings for a shape, a shadow, anything that moved. He found an orange shape crouched behind a wall, just the head visible. The head disappeared, just a soft pop sounded. Got him, Bawana said, making the kill. They proceeded, stopping instantly when Broker raised a fist. A red glow had appeared on his screen, a mine. Zeb inched forward carefully and sprayed fluorescent marker in a wide circle around the spot indicated by the drone. 
They skirted it, crossed another house, when a figure broke out from the dark. Abdu. He gurgled when Zeb buried his knife in his throat and in the next moment, was slumping in Zeb's hands. Drones, NVGs, mine detectors, thermal imagers, all of those could be beaten as the hostel had just shown. Split up, Zeb gestured as they approached a narrow street. The house they wanted, where Pasha was located, was at its end. Broker and Chloe followed Zeb while Bawana, Bear and Roger crossed the street and filtered down it, parallel to them. The aerial drones showed images of silent buildings, not a single orange or yellow blob. Zeb was hugging the walls of houses, leaving the mine-detecting drone far behind. There won't be mines so close to houses, he had decided. There was only one way to find out, however. Bawana had noticed his action and was mimicking his moves on the other side. Broker fell behind, swearing at them as he manipulated the mine detector. It still did an important job. However, speed was what they needed. They were approaching a cross street when they heard a clink around a corner, close to where Bawana was. Chloe raised her drone higher to fly over the roof. Hostel. Heading to Bawana. Zeb continued, breaking out and appearing in the gunman's line of sight, walking nonchalantly. He saw the fighter jerk in surprise from the corner of his eye. He felt the fighter's hand slap toward his weapon. Before he could speak or fire, Bawana had lunged around and grabbed him. There was a brief scuffle, and then the body went limp. He won't fight anymore. Bawana wiped his blade and sheathed it. Zeb moved faster. Three down. Zadie said Pasha moved with six men. He will have at least one man with him to control five women. That leaves another hostile on the loose. He could have more. Zadie could be wrong. Zeb stopped thinking about ifs and buts when Pasha's house came into view. Single story. Pale in the moonlight. Opposite it was a crumbling building, some kind of commercial one, from the signboard hanging limply from a wall. No sign of any more fighters. Chloe turned her drone in a full circle and zoomed out, sighting down alleys and streets. Zeb Broker's voice came on taut. Eight thermals inside that house. One standing close to another. Near a wall. There's a light. Bright light. I can hear muffled voices. Chloe struggled to control herself. Screaming. Zeb broke cover. He let loose the beast, which burst into motion, filling him. It bayed silently as he ran as fast as he could, keeping close to the walls. Careful of mines, someone shouted. He didn't care. There could be shooters. An ambush. That too didn't matter. He was driven by one purpose. To burst through that house, rescue the sisters, and inflict maximum damage on whoever was inside. Mines gunman, when had those ever mattered when his friends were at risk? He didn't run recklessly, however. Pasha's house was a hundred yards away. He let his Kai roam seek out any other presence. Eighty yards now. Someone coming up in the side of his vision. Roger and Bawana, running as effortlessly as he was, on the other side of the street. Zeb's hands pumped, the beast preparing itself for violent combat. Fifty yards now. He could see a concrete porch. A few steps leading up to it. A wooden door. More screaming, Chloe called out anxiously. A male voice speaking above it. Can we break that down? Zeb asked the beast, his eyes shutting out everything else except the door. The beast roared in answer. Oxygen flooded his blood and powered through him. Something flickered, just as his Kai warned him. Simultaneously, Chloe, Bawana, and Roger yelled out. A hostel came around the side of the house, his hands on his AK. He was staring at Zeb and at the others. Zeb was ten yards away from the steps. The hostel moved to his side, towards the door. His barrel started rising, his mouth opening. 
Zeb took one lunge, ripped off and threw away his NVGs. Another lunge, and he was over the steps. Landing on the porch on his left foot. His Winkler knife coming up in his right hand, as if the blade was an extension of his body. The beast one angry mass of black inside him. Close enough to see the whites of the gunman's eyes. Near enough to see the shooter's finger curving around the trigger. And then he was on top of the hostel, his knife sliding easily cutting through flesh and sinew, powered by rage and fury in the beast. His left hand chopping upwards, carrying the AK's barrel with it. Rounds flying harmlessly into the night. They crashed through the door, his momentum and their combined mass making short work of weak wood. He was inside. Vision zoomed out. To his left, four women, three of them cowering from the shock of his sudden entry. A hostile on his left too, waking from startled surprise, reaching for his weapon. To his right, a man holding a video camera. A bright light mounted on a stand further away. In front of him, a woman slumped against a man. Her head rising. Her face swollen and blotched. Dried blood on her lips and chin. Green eyes meeting his. Megan Peterson. A hostel behind her. Pasha who had one hand around her waist propping her up. A long sword at her neck. Only his eyes visible, burning hatred in them. Twelve feet separating him from the killer and his captive. Megan's eyes caught his, and the dull light in them faded. Became hope. All this in three seconds. And then he was moving. Later, much later, his friends would tell him he was snarling, yelling like an animal. He didn't remember flinging the knifed hostile at the gunman to his left. He didn't remember flowing across the distance that separated him from the butcher. He did remember clamping his left hand on the killer's wrist. Holding Pasha's gaze, squeezing, letting the beast fuel him, pouring all his pent-up feelings into his grip, until the killer cried hoarsely and the sword dropped from his hand. Zeb grasped Megan and shoved her out of the way. Nothing existed now, just Pasha and him. Pasha scrambled and tried to get away. Zeb grabbed him, one hand at his waist, another at his throat, bunching his garments, and heaved him bodily at the far wall. Pasha shrieked as his body impacted against the concrete wall and slid down it. His shawl fell away, his head covering fluttering to the floor, exposing his face fully. There was a reason he was a vicious terrorist however, and his left hand darted to his waist even as his body fell. It emerged with a sig, but before he could trigger it, Zeb was on him. Zeb's hand batted the gun away almost casually, the rock-hard edge of his hand catching Pasha just inside his wrist, the sheer force of the blow breaking Pasha's bones. Pasha howled. Zeb didn't hear it, didn't see the agony and the hate in the killer's eyes. His eyes were intent on the terrorist's right shoulder. His right hand curled, his knuckles jutted out and rammed with explosive force into the soft flesh, just beneath the killer's right clavicle. Zeb's hand drew back. Repeated the same blow on Pasha's left side. The killer was shaking, spittle dripping from his mouth, his eyes unseeing, his body jerking in shock. Zeb didn't see any of it. He was seeing Pasha's hand across Megan, his sword at her throat. But first, we will have fun? He turned, using his body to block out the sight line of the others in the room, and drew his hand back. His knuckles pointed like an arrow spread slightly apart like a pincer, a move taught to him by an Indonesian master. He let fly at Pasha's throat. Zeb was implacable. He was granite. He was remorseless as he watched Pasha shudder, try to draw breath and fail, as his body struggled for oxygen and his mind started shutting down his organs one by one. Marwan Pasha would never lay his hands on another woman. Zeb turned finally, fury cooling, swift rush of blood abating, the beast standing down. His friends were in the room. Broker by the door, screen in his hand. Beth, who had ripped off her abaya, and Megan, sobbing into Chloe's shoulder. The YPJ women watched in horrified fascination. Fear too in their eyes. 
Bawana Bear Roger, their jaws clenched, standing loose but ready. The video man terror stricken, shaking his hands bound. Two hostels on the floor. Dead. Broker. Zeb knew his voice sounded strange. It took a while for the effects of the beast and all that was inside him to fade. His friend looked up. We were led from one place to another. Broker nodded, not understanding where Zeb was going. Beth and Megan. They need to die. Chapter 63 The Watcher and his men had discovered Pasha's house and were making plans for entry when they heard engines in the silent night. The Watcher knew of the locations of the mines in the village since Eras had shared a map with the old man. If that's Carter, he'll be slowed down by the mines. Assuming he knows there are explosives. He cast an eye to Pasha's house, which was still dark. The terrorist had entered with his captives and two of his men, but seemed to be still considering his next move. The Watcher dispatched five to investigate the vehicles. Five. They always used numbers, never names. It made it easier for them to move on if any team member died or had to be replaced. His man ran silently to the end of the street and disappeared from view. They are here, he answered breathlessly a few minutes later. They've got drones, a mine detecting one too, and they are coming rapidly. Stay on the street. Make yourself scarce, the watcher ordered and thought swiftly making new plans. Let Carter rescue them. The mines in the village meant there were very few houses that had a direct view of Pasha's house. The watcher shrugged in the dark. They would have to roll with the punches. He directed his men to three houses across the street. He would occupy the one that was opposite Pasha's. His men would flank him in residences on either side. What about a rear exit? They could go out from the rear, Four objected. There are no rear exits in the village, the watcher stated. Isis had made sure of that when they had initially taken Tall Saman. They had blocked all rear exits so that occupants had only one entrance. The SDF had taken back the settlement but had made no changes to any of the houses since all the residents had fled. We'll take down Carter and his men as soon as they come out of that house. Transport the women to where the YPG can find them and then exfil. No one commented. His men had been with him for a long time. There was trust and confidence in him. What about Aab? Five thought out loud. We take him out if he shows up. Otherwise, we stick to our plan. How will Carter know where Pasha is? He's got drones. I'm sure those craft have thermal imaging. The Watcher fingered his combat suit as he lay in the house and watched Carter and his crew race towards the residence across the street. He took several photographs with his sat phone and kept observing. He had a clear view of the street and if he wished, he could have taken out the operatives. Not now. He wasn't worried about the drones spotting them. Their suits had thermal evasion technology. Some special material and coating. The Watcher wasn't interested in the details. All he knew was that no drones could spot him if he was indoors. He was thankful that he had insisted on those suits. The old man had protested but finally given in. He cited his MK-12 SPR and made calculations for the elevation. Pasha's door was 200 yards and even as he watched, Carter took a hostel along with him and splintered it. No wind. Downward angle. Great visibility through his night vision scope. It would be easy. And then his phone rang. He stared at it for a moment, at the old man's number. What happened to radio silence? Everything's gone south, he whispered harshly before the old man could say anything. He narrated the past events swiftly, even though he had outlined them in the voicemail. Kill everyone, the old man grated after hearing his revised plan. No. No women. You know my rule. And you know I can destroy all of you. 
your records have been expunged. All these years you have been carrying out black ops as private contractors. Illegal, unsanctioned killings. I have copies of those records and missions, however. I can release them. That will destroy you too. You think I care, boy? The old man cackled. No women. The watcher remained firm. Carter will die. Aab too if he shows. If he doesn't, we are leaving. I have photographs of Carter entering Pasha's house. His team members too. I will send those across to you. That will give you more ammo. I wanted Aab dead, the old man yelled. If I come across him, yes. I won't go hunting him. The old man swore and cursed he cajoled and bribed, but the watcher didn't budge. All right, have it your way. Send me those pictures. Execute your plan. The watcher hung up and turned back to his rifle. He didn't know it, but he would never hear from five again. The old man flung the phone against a wall. He yelled in anger in the vastness of his house. He looked at the framed photograph of him and his brother, and threw it too. It shattered, but the picture was undamaged. Aab. I want him, he screamed. There was no one to hear him. It was several moments before he got hold of himself. He swallowed a glass of whiskey and made plans of his own. Reaper drones. Hellfire missiles. Three of them would reduce Tal Saman and its surroundings to rubble. Aab will die too. He was sure the terrorist was on his way to Tal Saman. He had heard Pasha's call to the terrorist. I can still get him. Even if he's within a few hundred feet of Tal Saman, by the time the missiles strike, he'll die. The women too. No loose ends. And in case Aab escaped, the old man wouldn't give up. He would try again later with a new team. He would have to be careful, however. The strike orders could not be traced back to him. That won't be difficult. He grinned wolfishly. I will let it be known that Aab is in Tal Saman. He made calls and settled down to wait for the watcher's photographs. Maybe I should warn him, he thought. After all, he has served me well. All the operatives stared at Zeb in surprise as he bent over the terrorists and searched them. He drew out a marker from his suit and labeled their cell phones. P for Pasha, D1 for the man he had knifed outside the house, D2 for the gunman inside the house, and C for the cameraman. Need to die. Broker asked, puzzled. What do you mean? The sisters raised their tear-stained faces to him. He pocketed the phones, the wallets he'd found, and straightened. He could see they were weak, exhausted, still in shock, Megan close to passing out. He hadn't spoken to them yet. He hadn't smiled or reassured them. He clamped down on emotion. There would be time for that later. Beth Megan. Stateside they are accused of being frontline troops, he explained swiftly. Working with YPG. Faking their deaths will not kill those lies, Roger Bot. Yeah, they will. If we do it my way. He outlined his plan, and after a shocked silence, Bear grinned. You're a sly one, aren't you? Chloe raised Megan's head. You okay with this, honey? Megan nodded, still too choked to speak. Anything, Beth answered for both of them. We are ready for anything. Meg came close to dying. Me too. She managed a smile. We might as well complete the act. What about them? Chloe pointed to the YPJ women. Not them. We'll release them as soon as we're out of the village. Bawana? Zeb noticed his friend's thoughtful expression. What's it? It struck me just now, his friend said slowly, looking at the two dead terrorists. That man on the street. The one I took out. He was outfitted just like us. More pieces of the jigsaw came together in Zeb's mind. There'll be more of those gunmen. That dude wouldn't be alone. Where though? 
He drew his Glock out instantly and shot the video man, who was still alive, in the shoulder. Mines, he asked above the terrorist's scream. Where are they? The cameraman confessed quickly. He was a killer, he had destroyed his share of innocence, but he had also watched Zeb take out Pasha easily. He had seen death lurk in Zeb's eyes. You got that? Zeb asked Broker, who was inputting the locations on his screen. Yeah. Don't kill me, the terrorist sobbed after spilling all that he knew. I was just following orders. You videoed all the beheadings? Zeb asked him roughly. You killed women, children, civilians. The ISIS man shrank from the look in Zeb's eyes. Did you? Zeb repeated sternly. Yes, he moaned. I only did what Pasha and Aab asked me to do. He was going to record Pasha killing Megan. For one moment the beast burst free, brought Zeb's hand up, became his trigger finger, turned into the round that flew through the air and burst the video man's head. Zeb was moving before the terrorist's body had fallen to the floor. Chloe Broker, you go ahead with the recording, Zeb said, firing off commands as he snapped his fingers and beckoned at Bear, Bawana, and Roger to follow him. Got to take out those strangers. He went deeper inside the house, past a kitchen, a smaller room, into its rear, where the hallway ended at a wall. There had been a door once. It was now sealed. A room next to the hallway. Empty. Dirty. Zeb's eyes weren't on the floor, however. It was on the small window high on its wall. You want me to fit through that? Bawana checked it out skeptically. No. I want you to make it big enough for all of us to go through. Chapter 64 Bawana and Bear worked swiftly, using brute strength to dislodge bricks and make the window hole wider. They worked as silently as they could while Zeb and Roger helped. Chloe, Zeb called out. Need your help. Fly a drone over the rear of the house. Check if anyone's there. A moment. The back opens into the countryside, she said after a while. There's vegetation, and then an open field. This house is at the edge of the village. We came through one side of the village. No mines at the back. No hostels. They might have antithermal suits, but behind the house there's no place to hide from night vision. They'll be at the front, Zeb surmised. Correct, Broker boomed out. And genius that I am I can tell you where they could be. How? Later. Zeb heard Broker clicking his fingers impatiently. Something to do with location of mines and the houses. Don't stand jawing with me Zeb. Take them out. Four houses overlooked Pasha's across the street. Bawana Bear Roger and Zeb split up. Each one would clear out a house. They went through the immediate neighboring houses for good measure, peering through whichever windows they could find, entering through any available openings. No hostels on their side of the street. They sprinted up the backs of the houses, paralleling the street, in the direction where their vehicles lay, and when they were well away from possible hostile line of sight, they entered the alley. Broker had marked the mines in the street earlier, and their glow made it easy to navigate. They moved like ghosts, agents of death, clearing every house as they headed to their target locations. Roger reached the first location, sliding against the wall until he came to the entrance. There was no door, just a hole in the wall, bricks and concrete lying at its entrance. He knew there would be a gunman above him, peering intently through a scope, at Pasha's house. However, he and the rest of the operatives were banking on the shooters having no sightline to their own doors. Having that sightline would expose them. Roger entered the dim hallway and clicked his fingers near his throat mic. A signal to the others that their theory was right. No round smashing into him, and therefore no line of sight to the door. Ahead was a flight of stairs. Concrete, not wood, which was a blessing. Concrete didn't creak. He crawled up, just his glock showing, and behind it his eyes. Landing. 
Rooms laid out, one to his immediate right, which overlooked the street. He stilled himself, breathed as lightly as he could, and felt the house. Nope, he didn't detect any human presence. Zeb, only he can do that trick. He shook his head in disgust. Only one way to go in that case. He paused for a moment and then dived across the open door of the room, his gun out, his eyes seeking. No shape at the window or beneath it. Nothing at the far end, and then he was away, rolling, stopping and rising swiftly to his feet. Any hope that he had been silent was swiftly dashed when a voice called out from the room to the left of the steps. Five? What's with the number? Roger shelved the thought and dived again, headlong. He skittered on the concrete floor, not the smoothest for sliding, but he still made do, his Glock rising again. A burst of rifle fire sailed above his head, and his Glock spoke once, twice, thrice in reply to the dark mass that was crouched at the window, before he went past the door. He heard his rounds impacting flesh and then a grunt. He turned around swiftly, grateful for the mistake the shooter had made. The gunman had fired at waist level, whereas Roger was low, on the floor. He thrust his gun out and poured lead inside blindly. At the spot where he had seen the shooter, to its left and right. At floor level as well as at head height. A fast reload and another burst and then he stopped, his ears straining. Utter stillness. He risked a quick glance. The shape was unmoving. He drew his knife and threw it at the body. No response. He rose and approached it carefully, towing the body over until lifeless eyes greeted him. One of his rounds had gone through the shooter's throat, the other through his face. One hostile out. Not the quietest takedown, he informed his friends and bent to search the body. Zeb climbed slowly, his kai down to the barest minimum. Another one down, Bear reported. Two more. Bawana chuckled softly. Zeb continued watching his steps. He figured any hostel in the house would be the best of the lot. Has to be. He'll have the best shot at Pasha's house. The building was cold, its air dank. There was the smell of urine and animal waste. He let his senses reach out, his HK at the ready. Nothing pinged on his radar. He lay down on the stairs and brought out his cable camera, his right hand holding his weapon. Landing was clear. Two rooms on either side of him. He twisted the cable and bent it to look inside the one to his right. No one inside. He didn't have to turn it far before he spotted the huddled shape in the room to his left. The hostel's back was to him as he bent, looking out the window. Zeb left the cable on the floor and rose noiselessly. He took a single step, turning and stood in the doorway and let his kai flow outward. There was nothing in the shooter's stance that suggested he was aware of Zeb, but Zeb knew. He sensed when the hostel became aware of his presence. The sound of firing came to them from another house, and that triggered the shooter. He threw himself to his right, letting go of his MK-12, drawing a holstered gun, a SIG, bringing it up smoothly, turning in mid-flight to face Zeb, letting loose a burst at the door. Except that Zeb wasn't at the door. People instinctively turned to their dominant side, which was right for most. Zeb had counted on that, and had flung himself to the left the moment the gunman had moved. He fired in the gunman's direction. Two shots that sounded like one. At least one landed. The unknown man was fast, very fast however. He corrected instantly, not letting any injury slow him down, and his rounds blazed a path in Zeb's direction, but Zeb had turned and was rolling towards the door, triggering as fast as he could, changing mags at blurring speed, until the shooter slumped against the wall and his gun hand fell weakly. Zeb didn't move. His eye locked down the sight line, trigger finger ready, waiting for the slightest move from the shooter. A tortured breath escaped the killer, and the SIG fell to the floor. Only then did Zeb rise and approach the gunman, whose left hand was splayed out, too far to make any sudden move. Zeb kicked the SIG away, relieved the shooter of his blade and another SIG, and crouched next to him. 
His rounds had found the shooter just below the neck, over the edge of the killer's armor. Dark eyes watched dully as Zeb kneeled. Who are you? The eyes blinked and lips moved to form words. Wouldn't. Kill women. Midwestern accent. American, definitely. What I suspected, our own people behind this. But who? You wouldn't. The man nodded weakly. Who sent you? Who's behind all this? Our country. Someone from our country? Your black ops. Someone in the intelligence world? Zeb asked urgently, resisting the urge to grip the dying man and shake the answers out of him. A phone buzzed, its vibrate mode sounding loud in the room. The killer looked at it, and with all his remaining energy, pointed at it. Answer. And he died. Zeb looked at him for a moment, and then went to the phone. A sat phone, a familiar model. No number on the screen. Just the flashing icon that a call was incoming. He accepted the call. You got them. An old voice, irritable, impatient. I've been waiting to hear from you. Aha, Zeb replied, trying his best to mimic the killer's voice. What does that mean? Yes or no? In any case, there's no time. The caller took a breath and continued curtly. This is a favor to you. I didn't have to do this. Get out of there. You have ten minutes. Fifteen at the most. Three hellfires are headed your way. Chapter 65 Broker. All. Leave now. Zeb yelled in his mouthpiece. Hellfires, headed our way. A fraction of a second to scoop up the shooter's sat phone, search his body, find another cell, and pick up the camera near the window. He was heading out the door when something else caught his eye. Backpack. He grabbed that too, and then he was flying down the steps. Outside, through the door, where he saw Broker and Chloe hustling the sisters and the YPJ women from Pasha's house. No time to explain. He looked to his side as Bear, Bawana, and Roger came pounding up. We have ten minutes. He assessed Beth and Megan swiftly. Pale. Tired. They won't be able to keep up. Bear, Bawana, you can carry the sisters? They didn't reply. They stepped forward, scooped them up, and set off. They would run and keep going until their last breath. But they wouldn't drop the twins. Zadie. Zeb dashed, his legs stretching, landing, his weight barely registering on the ground. Going around the fluorescent markers, overtaking Bawana and Bear. Zadie, he panted. They nodded in understanding. The vendor was in the vehicle, bound. He had to be freed. If all of them reached the SUVs in time, they could drive away, but if they didn't Zeb would wait for his crew. However, the vendor could escape once freed. Not many curves in the street. Good. Saves us time. It was only when he was halfway down the alley that another thought struck him. What about other hostels? Too late to think of them. His feet carried on pumping. Sixty, seventy feet. The figures came into his mind as he turned a bend and risked a quick glance behind. His friends were following not far behind. The YPJ women too. That's the blast radius for those missiles. Could be more. He knew there was no point in looking up at the sky or trying to hear an incoming hellfire. The Reaper fired from 25,000 feet, and while it was possible they might hear the missile, he didn't plan to find out. If we are lucky. And then he was out of the village, bolting towards the outcrop behind which their vehicles were parked. Took a second to spin around in the air and check up on his crew. All streaming out of the village, their feet pounding as fast as they could run. Bear and Bawana effortlessly carrying the sisters. 
two minutes to reach Bear's SUV, go around the back and slash the surprise prisoner's bonds. Seven minutes. We can make it. If what that caller said was accurate. Chloe reached him first and then the YPJ women who bustled inside. Bawana came next and Zeb helped him place Megan in his SUV. The others came, broker last, swearing as Roger reached out, grabbed him and pulled him inside as Zeb's wheels spun, found purchase and the SUV shot away. The second SUV followed close behind. Both the vehicles were crammed and heavy, carrying eight operatives, three YPJ fighters, Muffied Zadie and the operatives' gear. Their engines could cope, however. They were designed to take higher loads and to work in more hostile terrain. 600 horses under each hood made light work of their burden and carried them swiftly down the hill. Nine minutes. They drove fast, not caring about terrain, the holes and ditches in the ground, or the short vegetation that attempted to slow them down. Distance was what mattered. A hundred yards turned into a hundred and fifty, and then became two hundred. And then the earth shook. They felt the explosions through the vehicles. Zeb stopped, bare too, and they turned to look behind. Tall Saman had disappeared in a giant cloud of dust. Flames and smoke were visible through, as the billowy mass parted briefly. They heard the crackle of fire through the distance, and felt tremors in the ground as buildings collapsed. No one could have survived the demolition. Zeb clenched his lips tight as he watched the destruction. That old man. He wanted everyone dead. Were there any civilians in the village? SDF fighters? That wasn't one missile. Bawana came next to him, his face hard, all angles and edges. Three missiles. That wasn't three, bro. More. Maybe five or six. Those hellfires are precision missiles. They're ripple fired. Within a few seconds of each other. These were deliberately aimed to raise down the village. Zeb nodded absently, his mind far away, imagining an old man alone following the explosion on some screen. He'll be in DC, maybe in the Pentagon. That's where all this leads to. They were joined by the rest of the operatives, Megan and Beth next to him. The sisters didn't linger on the destruction. They turned to him, and he saw the clouds and flames reflected in them. Megan parted her lips and fell silent when he raised a hand. No. Nothing needs to be said. She can thank me, Bawana said in a mock aggrieved tone. I carried her. Chloe slapped his arm and thrust herself forward. Zeb, we need to get to a doctor. She was beaten badly by Pasha. They're dehydrated. Wounded. Zeb made for his ride without a word, the beast growling in him, anger filling him, as he thought of the terrorist. Something tugged at his sleeve. He's dead. It's over. Megan smiled with difficulty. Zeb nodded and controlled himself. He was helping her inside when a cell rang. It wasn't his. He looked at his friends. None of them were drawing out a phone. It's from your pocket, Zeb. Chloe pointed. He reached inside and drew out several. The one he had marked with a P was ringing and vibrating angrily as he held it. He took the call. Pasha, where are you? A voice in Arabic came on, brusque. I'm just outside Tal Saman. What remains of it? Those missiles. Did you get away? Zeb knew that voice. The world knew that voice. Tariq Ab. Pasha. Ab's voice rose angrily. Why aren't you speaking? Are the women with you? The women are with me, Zeb replied softly in the same language. The line fell silent, and then Ab came back warily. Who are you? Broker tapped Zeb on the shoulder and held his screen up. A map of the region. A red dot about 300 yards away from them, on the other side of the village. Tariq Ayab's location. Find me and you will see. 
You'll get the American women too. He hung up and pocketed the cell. He didn't have to say anything more. His team understood. They had a new mission. Get the Butcher of Raqqa. Chapter 66 Let us help. The YPJ women came forward as the operatives geared up with their HKs, slapped spare magazines on their belts and in their pockets. We didn't know what Erez had planned for your friends, one of them, who had taken on the role of their leader, pleaded. We would have deserted him if we knew. Or killed him, another flashed. We know this area. We want Aob too. Let us come with you. You can help, Zeb replied and gestured at the twins, who were in no shape for combat of any kind. They are staying behind. Chloe will be with them. If you can stay back and protect them. We will, Saidi. Zeb stared at her when she smiled. The honorific was rarely used by the women fighters. We've got a killer out there, Broker reminded him testily. They set off. The plan was simple. Broker was monitoring Aob's cell, and it showed he was stationary, behind the ruins of the village. He will either seek us out or retreat to Raqqa. Zeb briefed them rapidly as the five operatives moved swiftly in the dark, in Aob's direction. If he retreats, we'll follow as far as we can. If he comes our way, we'll receive him. That cell's location. That could be a dummy, Roger observed. Eob's no fool. He could be sucking us into a trap. Or he could retreat. Those are possibilities, Zeb admitted. But he's one of the most wanted terrorists. We want to give that up? They didn't. The female fighters had told them the mines started a mile beyond the village, in the direction of Raqqa. So long as they remained in that mile-wide corridor, they would be okay. The YPJ soldiers didn't know the safe routes through the explosives. Only the terrorists knew. We will go to the edge of that safe space. If we come across Aob, we finish him. If not, we turn back. His friends nodded. They turned off their cell phones, dropped beneath the horizon, and under a cloudy sky just after 9 p.m., Zeb and his men went hunting. More calls had delayed Tariq Aob as he left Raqqa. He was not a member of the senior council, however, he was one of the most famous killers. His reputation and ruthlessness meant that ISIS leaders consulted him. Those discussions took time. On top of that, the SDF were pressing hard, fighting the terrorists in the city. Aob's vehicle had to stop several times in reverse to get away from incoming fighters. Then there were the missile and drone attacks by the Syrian military and the Western coalition. All those distractions meant Aab was in the countryside separating Raqqa and Tal Saman only by 8 p.m. He hadn't called Pasha, trusting his man to set everything up for him. Nevertheless, he intended to reprimand his lieutenant for calling him on a non-secure line. America and Britain were always listening. Still, their satellites had to process millions of calls and text messages. Aab was confident that one call wouldn't be traced. A lengthy conference call involving some of his commanders stopped him again. The council wanted more beheadings. The brutal executions would help their recruitment campaigns. Aab was reluctant to tell them that he had many planned for that very night, but at last he confessed. It would be a spectacular affair, he boasted before hanging up. He gave the order to his nine men to proceed in their two vehicles. He could see the silhouette of Tal Saman when some animal instinct cautioned him. He ordered the vehicles to stop, and in that instant, in the deepness of the night, he saw the flashes and knew. He screamed at his men to get out of their vehicles and hug the ground. He lay flat on his belly his hands over his ears and watched in fear and awe. What followed was a kind of destruction he had never witnessed. Sure he had seen hellfires and their effects. He hadn't seen so many of them, however. He thought there were five, but his men swore there were seven. 
The ground shuddered as the village was struck so swiftly that the explosions rolled into one continuous stream of noise. And when it finished, Tall Saman was no more. The village was reduced to pieces of rock and stone. Ayab was in shock for a few moments before he remembered who he was, where he was, and his purpose. He knew they were lucky that no missile had found them. They were just two hundred yards from the village. A cold tremor ran through him, but he showed no emotion. He was Tariq Ayab, the butcher of Raqqa, leader of killers. He could show no fear. He got to his feet, snatched his phone and made the call to Marwan Pasha. Get off, he told his men after the stranger had hung up. The man had sounded like an Iraqi. Or he could be Syrian. He had spoken Arabic fluently. Have you heard of any new players? Ayab asked his men, slapping his sword against his thigh. They shook their heads. It couldn't be Eras. The YPG commander was dead. It couldn't be an American either, they didn't speak Arabic, not like the stranger had. It had to be some YPG leader who had somehow killed Pasha and had escaped before the missiles with the American and YPJ whores. Thoughts of those women spurred him on. He would share the YPJ women with his men, but the Americans were just for him. Once he'd had his fill, he would behead them. One of his men had a camera, and he would video the entire act. Let's hunt that pig whoever he is, and capture the whores. Let's show the great Satan what we are capable of. They bombed Tal Saman. Now they will see how we will strike back. That man may not be alone, Saidi, one of his gunmen pointed out. So what? Ayab challenged him scornfully. Have you drunk goat's milk or human blood? Saidi, the deeper we go, the further away we will be from Raqqa, his man persisted. Ayab frowned. His killer had a point. There could be SDF fighters around. YPG and YPJ killers. He turned back and saw the distant lights of his city. Occasional flashes marked the war with the opposing forces. We will go until the edge of the village, he agreed reluctantly. If we don't encounter the women by then, we will turn back. Walk in a single line, he directed his men. Each one should be able to see the other. No radios. No vehicles. We want to hear them, not ourselves. If you have to fire, make it count, and warn the rest. I want them alive, he told them before they split up. He kept two of his best fighters close to him, spread out his killers, and walked slowly towards the destroyed village. Bawana was at one end of the loose dragnet they had formed. The village crackled and burned behind them, and occasionally logs fell off roofs in a blaze of sparks. The operatives were crawling foot by foot, pausing every now and then to stop and hear. They had run parallel to the village, then turned in the direction of the red dot they had seen on Broker's screen, and dropped to the ground. Bawana fought the impulse to sneeze as dust and soot entered his nostrils. He paused behind a bush. Nope, that wasn't water. There was no stream nearby. He started off again but stopped and listened. It sounded like... He peered through the dark, using the edge of his vision to separate night from human. There. That shape wasn't the trunk of a tree. It moved and the sound stopped. He's urinating. The man was twenty feet away, in the shade of a large tree, one of the few near the village. He came out of its dark canopy, and starlight glanced off something metallic off his hands. Bawana inched closer. The man was walking carefully, making little noise, looking to his right and to his left. Amateur. An operative would widen his vision, instead of turning his head frequently. He quashed the thought. The same amateurs were terrorizing the world. The gunman's trajectory didn't intersect with Bawana's. The two would come close, maybe five feet, before the shooters would veer off. Five feet was enough for Bawana, who stopped moving. The terrorist was careful. His eyes were scanning the ground ahead, his breathing was soft. 
He was confident, so sure of himself that when Bawana sank his blade into him from seven feet away, he stared at it in surprise. And then lost any capacity to question when the giant pounced on him. Roger, several feet away next to Bawana, was less lucky. Chapter 67 A terrorist came right at Roger bending low, his eyes straight ahead. Roger stopped breathing, but some animal instinct alerted the terrorist. His eyes dropped to the ground in front of him, and he exclaimed in surprise. His gun had to move a mere few inches to cover the operative on the ground, and it started turning while a sound of startled surprise escaped him. Even in the dark, Roger could see the killer's eyes turn triumphant as he prepared to fire and alert Aob. Roger dove at the terrorist's legs as his first shot went wide and lost itself in the earth. He jabbed his blade into the hostile's belly before a second shot was triggered, then clamped the killer's mouth with a palm. He finished the hostile with more cuts and subdued his thrashing. He raised his head to check whether anyone had heard the slight sounds. Sitar, a voice called out from Roger's right. It wasn't Aob. It was another terrorist. Roger Rose brought his HK up and turned to face the village, hoping he would be mistaken for Sitar. It's nothing. I was mistaken, he replied gruffly and held his breath. The caller didn't question him again. Roger heard his message being relayed in soft calls. He turned his head slowly, and in the dim light, he made out another hostile, head down, moving towards Tal Saman. That was close. How did he think I was Sitar? Our voices were that alike? He thanked his good luck and figured out his next move. I could take this other shooter out. He's 15 feet away. But that would alert the others. They're likely to be jumpy after that shot. He started crabbing sideways to get to that other killer. Need to find out how many of them are out there. Broker and Bear flanked the far right of the operative's sweep. Broker had attacked one hostile who had spotted him, but the killer hadn't been fast enough to shoot or call for help. The terrorist had thrashed around on the ground, and that sound had alerted another killer. The second man had come running, his AK swinging up. He hadn't seen Bear approach. He gave a startled gasp when large hands circled his waist. Before he could act, a massive paw smashed him into oblivion. You're welcome, Bear murmured to his friend and slithered into the night. Aab wasn't worried, but he was feeling antsy. His line had moved forward about 50 feet without encountering anyone. There had been that one shot, but his men told him it was Sitar. He strained his eyes in the dark and thought he could make out the shapes of his men stretching out in the night. His two guards, Fadi and Aman, were ahead of him, bunched together. Their eyes were seeking, their AKs following, as they made slow, steady progress. You're sure that was nothing, he grumped. Yes, Saidi, Fadi replied. Sitar. You know him. He acts first, thinks later. You can see him? I can't, but Uwais is to our right and Aman to our left. Fadi called out to the nearest men, and they responded. Keep silent you fools, Aab hissed angrily. He was regretting his decision. His men were right. This was no place for him. He was well protected, but still, it was dark, and that took away a lot of his advantage. Besides, they were in hostile territory. At any moment, SDF fighters could come to the village. He thought of calling his men back, but how would that make him look? Indecisive. No. Tariq Aab could not appear like that. The village was a hundred and fifty yards away. I will give it another fifty yards, and then call it off. He fingered the sword at his belt, and drew it out of its scabbard. The blade was worn from use but had a sharp edge, and could still slice through a man. Or a woman, he reminded himself, and grinned in anticipation. Fadi, your camera? It's with you? Yes, Saidi, came the whisper. 
You and Aman, you two can have the YPJ women first, he said, feeling generous. The others can follow. I will take the Americans, and when I have finished, we will begin. Yes, Saidi. Zeb was earth. He was soil and dirt and vegetation as he lay on the ground, listening. He had slowed his pulse to its lowest, but the beast was another story. It was dark, darker than the night, as it flooded him. Take him, it bade. Not yet. You heard what he said. About Beth and Meg. Yeah. Be patient. Zeb reached deep in his mind, breathing easily, lightly, willing himself to go into the zone where he detached from himself and his body became a machine. It was another master, a Japanese one, who had trained him in that ancient art. It had helped him withstand torture. It could also help him momentarily cheat death. It had other uses, it controlled the beast and channeled it. It wasn't often that he had to go into that state. Threats to his friends, danger to the twins were some of those moments. He waited. He could outweigh time if he needed to. He felt loose stones under his hands, felt their texture, a current connecting him to the molten core deep deep beneath him, drawing sustenance from it. Energy and killing force. I bet those American thighs are creamy, Saidi. The earth parted and Zeb Carter rose. The deadliest killing machine in the vicinity, honed in Fort Bragg and around the world, perfected by sacrifice and loss, cold fury and resolute determination, and fueled by right and wrong. He was five feet away from Aab's protectors. The beast sprang and his right hand flashed, slashing Fadi in the belly, cutting up and above, the blade tearing into soft flesh, meeting air briefly and then piercing Amon's throat. Tariq Aab froze when the apparition emerged. He stood dumbstruck as the man cut Fadi and killed Amon in one motion, with balletic grace. And then he moved. His sword came up and he thrust forward, yelling as loudly as he could. His blade slid into the night, finding nothing and no one. Something slammed into his shoulder. Something growled low and continuously like an animal as he went flying in the air. It's him. He's making that sound. He fell badly and his left side went numb. But he got to his feet quickly, ignoring his aches and pains, and yelled loudly to alert his men. He thought he heard firing, but what was before him, who was in front of him, was of more importance. He reached behind his shoulder and got his AK in front as the stranger came at him. He fired two rounds, deeply satisfied as the man jerked. But he kept coming. He's got armor. Aab started to trigger again, but his weapon went flying when the attacker swatted it away. Those eyes. They are burning. Aab had more weapons. He had a sig at his waist. He grabbed at it and cried in agony when something like a vice clamped his right hand. He lost the gun but he wasn't done. This wasn't the butcher of Raka's first fight. Quick as a snake, his left hand darted to his ankle and came out with a blade. He jabbed and found flesh. American, he roared in delight as his knife sank into the man's forearm. His assailant came closer, so near that Aab could feel the low sound he made, the snarl that he recognized with a shock as one he himself wore when killing. The terrorist thrust furiously again, burying his knife in the American's right shoulder, just above his armor. The attacker didn't flinch. His eyes didn't shudder. They held Aab as instead of retreating, the man kept coming, and the knife went deeper into the stranger until the terrorist felt the attacker's breath on him, and felt another vice squeeze the wrist of his knife hand so hard that blood seemed to stop flowing to his fingers and he thought he heard his bones snap. And as he howled out loud he thought he heard the stranger say, this hand will not kill again. Aab staggered back when the stranger punched him in the chest with a blow that broke a couple of his ribs. Aab was crying. He was on his knees, tears and sweat streaming down his face, and he grunted when a boot kicked him in the belly. He sprawled on his back. The stranger weaved in and out of his vision, and became clearer as he bent over the terrorist. Something moved and Aab gasped hoarsely as his left shoulder broke. 
that hand will not go across a woman. Tariq Ayab heard the words, but they didn't register. His dulled eyes lifted to see the stranger draw the blade out of his shoulder. It was dark, coated with blood, and despite his torment, Ayab felt a flicker of satisfaction that he had injured his assailant. That spark died as he screeched, his body shuddering when the knife went into his groin. You will not rape another woman. The words fell on him, unheeded. He couldn't think. He could only feel, his body turning into nerve endings, flames of hurt licking through him, searing him. The stranger crouched over him for several moments, watching him, pinning him down with his merciless eyes as he lay there trembling and shivering, calling out for help. Finally the American rose and turned away, and the animal instinct in Tariq Ea brightened. He could still survive. He could still live. And then a shadow loomed over him. The stranger. He watched Aab for a moment, and bent and pulled the knife from his groin, a sucking yank that drew out a shriek from the fallen man. The knife seemed to turn in the American's hand and headed straight down to his throat, parting skin with ease, finding blood and crushing vitals till its tip reached the back of his neck. You will pollute no more. Chapter 68 Zeb searched Aab's body and added his cell phone to the growing collection in his pocket. He's dead. Broker came up beside him. Yeah. What about the rest? All dealt with. Broker wiped at a trickle of blood on his neck. A scratch. Looks worse. Your hand, your shoulder, those need looking at however. Zeb became aware of the steady drip of blood from his forearm and shoulder. It started hurting now that the heat of battle was fading. He cocked his head to listen, but except for the faint sounds of war from Raqqa, they heard nothing. Let's go. I don't trust our own people. They might fire a few more hellfires up our butts. Your wounds. Later. It started raining, a steady drizzle, when they reached their vehicles. Chloe bathed his gashes and taped them after pronouncing that no bones had been broken and no tendons had been torn. You'll live. She jabbed him in the shoulder with an unforgiving finger and glared at him when he grimaced and bit his lips. That's for not responding. We didn't know what was happening. Meg Beth, they were readying to gear up and follow you guys. I had a hard time restraining them. Zeb had agreed with his men that they would maintain radio silence until they either finished Aab or came away empty handed. They wanted stealth and silence to move in the dark and to hear the terrorists. Zero comms had been the only option. Looks like that didn't go down well. Megan's face was mutinous as she ignored him. The twins wore their armored vests and had HKs across their arms. They huddled with Bear and Bawana, Beth punching the large men in their chests as she expressed her anger. You would have let them, he asked Chloe softly. They aren't in any shape. Of course not. She snorted. I would have knocked them out if it came to that. Zeb hustled them back into their vehicles as he glanced at his watch. 10.30 p.m. He wanted to put as much distance as possible between them and Tal Saman. They had to get to Turkey, but before that, they had to hand over the YPJ soldiers. Leave us anywhere, Saidi, the leader suggested. We will find our way back. We'll get Zaidi to Tal Abayad. We'll get Nazrao to pick you all up. There could be ISIS killers roaming. He climbed into his vehicle, ignoring Broker's insistence that he was in no shape to drive. Megan got into the back, along with Roger. Her eyes landed once on his injuries, but she made no comment. He had just started the engine, then stopped abruptly. That killer had a Midwestern accent. Likely that the rest of his crew were American too. How did they know where we'd be? He climbed out to mystified looks from his friends and reached inside the glove compartment. He brought out a powerful flashlight and crawled underneath his SUV. A problem? Broker kneeled next to him and peered up as he ran the light on the underside. We'll see. 
He narrowed his eyes and searched in sections. If his guess was right, the tracker would be small, gray or black, almost invisible to the casual eye, and would be well concealed. It took 15 minutes, by which time Bawana and Bear had joined Broker and followed his flashlight. It was Bear who spotted it first. A protuberance on the inside of the passenger side wheel well, at the rear. He dislodged the device, which was attached magnetically to the chassis, and held it out in his palm. Let me search mine. He got to his feet and went to his vehicle. Broker inspected the tracker and pursed his lips thoughtfully. Not good. What does that mean? Chloe demanded, hands on her hips. It means our people use this. Those in the black ops business. The NSA, the CIA, all those secretive kinds of people. This device is the latest. High tech. Battery lasts for days, signal is powerful. A shout distracted them, Bear holding up a similar tracker. That's how they knew where we were at all times, Bawana said darkly. They could watch us on their screens. We didn't sweep the vehicles at all, since we were always on the move. Turkey. When we were meeting Hanum in that hotel, there was ample opportunity to plant them. Zeb sighed cursing himself internally for not being vigilant. We're all to blame, Broker said heavily, knowing what he was thinking. Zeb saw weariness in his friend's eyes. Hajj seemed days away, while in actuality, they had just been at the village early that morning. That old man, he's likely to be tracking our vehicles. Let him believe we got wiped out in the missile strike. Zeb looked beyond the village to where he had taken out the terrorist. Aab's vehicles. Let's use them. Zeb had one more task before they started off in Aab's trucks. He got Zadie to use his cell and make a call. Hello. Nazrao picked up promptly, even though it was 11 p.m. You don't know me, Saidi. The vendor spoke rapidly, taking his cues from Zeb's hand signals. We have a friend. He wants you and Resin to meet him in one hour. Which friend? Who are you? I am Munif Zaidi, Saidi. I am a street vendor near Tal Abayad. This friend, you met him today. You served him tea. Personally. That friend. Nazra's voice cleared. Is he okay? Why can't he call me himself? He will tell you himself, Saidi. You have to meet him in one hour. Near Tal Abayad. He gave directions to his stall. Should I bring some friends? No Saidi, just Rezin and you. Day 12. Why didn't you call him yourself? Zeb met Megan's eyes in the mirror as he drove carefully. Rain was pouring heavily, reducing visibility, and their tires frequently slipped in the slush that passed for road. Looks like she's forgiven me. Whoever's behind this could be tracking my calls. That satisfied her, and he focused on his driving. The slow going delayed them, and when they reached Zadie's stall, there was no one present. For a moment Zeb thought that Nazrao and Rezin hadn't arrived, but then the two stepped out from the shadows. They were wearing plastic sheets over their heads, and when the YPJ fighters stepped out from Bear's vehicle, they stopped. Where did you find them? Why are they free? They should be treated as prisoners, Nazrao said frostily. They helped us, Nazrao, Zeb explained swiftly while the three women huddled together, keeping their distance. Where's Rajda? She was your leader. Rezin turned to them. She died. Pasha killed her. You don't trust me, Zeb? Nazrao asked when Zaidi and the women soldiers climbed into his vehicle. You had to ask Zadie to make that call. It's not you, Nazrao. I don't trust my own people, Zeb replied grimly. Roger took his turn at the wheel as they left Tal Abayad behind, while Zeb took a short nap. He woke at 2 am when the vehicles stopped. Coffee break, Roger reassured him when he emerged from the truck, Glock in hand. Nazrao and Rezin had given them several flasks as they were leaving. 
Zeb felt his energy returning as the hot liquid went down his throat, and with it, another task came to his mind. Broker those videos back in Talsaman. You edited them? Yeah, they're good to go. He turned his screen in their direction and punched a button, and an image came of a hooded man launching into a diatribe against the West. Broker, for that was who it was, was holding Pasha's blade against Megan's neck. She appeared terrified. Behind them was an ISIS flag stuck to the wall. Some slick editing showed the hooded man behead Megan, and then it was Beth's turn. How did you do that? Roger exclaimed in surprise at the realistic depiction of ISIS executions. You wouldn't understand, Broker told him kindly and raised an eyebrow in Zeb's direction. It's time? Yeah. Use Aob's cell to broadcast it. Zeb had come up with the idea of the fake executions as a way of countering the false news that was being spread about them. The video would result in an enormous outpouring of rage against the terrorists. Joe Public would be shocked and angered and would not tolerate a wrong word said about them. All the leaked photographs would be forgotten, and Claire would have her own narrative to tell. Broker had laughed in delight when Zeb had outlined his plan, and once the sisters had agreed, he and Chloe had shot the videos quickly. He now turned on Pasha's cell, and on getting a signal, he uploaded the video to a popular website that ISIS used. Simultaneously, he emailed the video to a media distributor, and when he had finished, he rubbed his hands. Give it 20 minutes. 30 at the most and our phones will go nuts. We can't turn them on, Zeb reminded him. We can't take that risk. There's one problem, Megan reminded them urgently. Claire. We haven't told her. Chapter 69 Zeb winced when Megan's words hit home. Before heading into Tal Saman, they had shut down all their phones and removed the batteries. She must have tried to call us several times. When she sees that video. Broker, can you make an internet call to her? Zeb didn't want to use Aob or Pasha's phones for a voice call. It could get noticed, and hellfires could follow. Broker mumbled something about bears defecating in the woods, and by the time Zeb had stopped in a clearing by the side of the road, he had patched a call through. Claire's number rang several times. She's wondering who's calling her. Running checks, but there won't be a number. Broker's call never has one. Who's this? Ma'am? Zeb. Her voice started shaking. Where have you, did you see that? You couldn't save them. Ma'am, we. He killed them, Zeb. Beth and Meg. Executed. You didn't. She choked back a sob. Megan put a hand to Zeb's shoulder and came closer to the screen. Ma'am, we are alive. Claire was silent for such a long time that Broker checked his screen. Yeah, the call was still on. Megan. The disbelieving hope in her voice made Zeb curse himself. Should have kept her in the loop. Yes, ma'am. We're both alive. Safe. Unharmed. Zeb and the others got there just in time. Zeb let Megan explain, answer the zillion questions Claire had, and gradually their boss recovered. Her voice grew stronger, calmer until the ice-cool head of the agency returned. You should have told me, was her only rebuke to Zeb. When I heard about those hellfires and then saw that video. Yes ma'am. Great idea, she complimented him in the next breath. I've been on the receiving end for a few days. This will change everything. Already the networks are changing their stories. Back to the original one. That the twins were kidnapped and met a gory end. Ma'am, who ordered the missile hit? She mentioned a name, a general in the Pentagon. He had actionable intel. That Aab was in the village. Where did that come from, ma'am? I'm working on that with Daniel. It's not turning out to be easy. The intel came through several analysts. Each one is saying it was genuine. 
Are they claiming that Aob's dead? Not yet. The official stance is that a successful hit was carried out. Identities are being verified. Can you let it be known that Aob and Pasha are dead? Destroyed by the Hellfires? Yes. What about you and the twins? The sisters are dead, ma'am. The whole world saw that. We are missing, presumed dead. Killed by those who know of our existence and suspect we are the agency. Best to keep it that way till we blow this whole thing wide. In any case, it's only the sisters who are known to the public. Zeb. There was the faintest note of pleading in her voice. Daniel. He needs to know. He's distraught. Broken. You know what Beth and Megan mean to him. No ma'am. He remained unmoving. I will apologize to him in person when all this is over. However, the sisters remain dead. He got Broker to make another call, to a number in Jerusalem. Avachai, you know who I am. No names, he cautioned the gruff voice, that of Avachai Levin, the Mossad head. You. I watched that video. Achi, Zeb interrupted the outburst. He switched to Yiddish. What you saw isn't true. Then? Yes. He's caught on. Suspects why I put out that video. What can I do? How can I help? The Mossad chief was all business. If his friend Zeb Carter needed him, there wasn't anything he wouldn't do. I need a plane. A pickup from Turkey. In the next four hours. You'll have it. Wherever you want it, and wherever you want to go. Because you think there'll be eyes on the Gulf Stream? Megan asked him when he had hung up. There could be. Right now that old man knows you two are dead. He thinks we've been finished too. If he's as wily as we think he is, he'll have someone watching our aircraft in Istanbul. In the dark of the night, as a new day started dawning, with rain washing down on them, Zeb punished the truck, driving as fast as he could. The plan was to reach the Turkish border, which was in the Kurdish-controlled territory of Syria, and cross over. Going back along the route they had come wasn't an option. Levin's plane would await them in Turkey and take them back to the US. Miles of road and slush fell behind them. Visibility was restricted to a few feet, but he didn't let that slow him. Behind him was the diffused glow from Bear's vehicle, keeping up with his truck. Roger offered to spell him. He refused. His friends fell asleep, and as he heard their breathing, he let himself feel. He retraced all that had happened the previous day and night. From Hajjaj to Tal Saman. You couldn't save them. The despair in Claire's voice twisted his gut. He remembered the knife at Megan's throat. The helpless, resigned look in her eyes the moment he had burst into that house. Horror on Beth's face. If I had been later by even a minute. And then the shake set in. His hands trembled. His body shivered. He tried to check it, but this time the gray fog didn't ride to his rescue. He heard stirring beside him, Broker waking up. Shifting in the rear, Megan and Roger, one of them yawning. He shut his eyes tightly and opened them again, gripping the wheel as hard as he could. No use. The shaking transmitted to the vehicle, and it wobbled. Hey Zeb. You okay? Roger asked concerned, gripping his shoulder. Bro? Bawana asked softly, urgency in his voice. Anything could have delayed us. He slammed on the brakes, jumped out of the truck and ran in the rain into a nearby growth of trees. He leaned against a trunk and closed his eyes, jamming his hands deep into his pockets. His heart was racing, he was sweating, and his nerves were jumping wildly. There was no sign of the lethal operative who had taken down terrorists and criminals in several countries. He doubled up suddenly and retched, dry heaves that racked him and left him feeling empty. His friends were there when he straightened. Broker who had been with him for the longest, Bear, Chloe, Bawana, Roger, Beth and Megan. 
There was no judgment in their eyes. No pity, and for the first time that he could remember, he let his guard down. We were lucky, he whispered brokenly to the twins. If you had, if it had happened again. He swallowed and looked at them stricken. They knew what he was referring to, that event in his past that he never spoke of. The time when he and his young family had been captured by terrorists, and he had been made to watch them die in the most horrific circumstances. We didn't. Beth's eyes swam with tears as she held her hands out, and Zeb Carter, the killing machine, broke down and sobbed on her shoulder. Day 13 They were stateside 36 hours later, after Levin's aircraft whisked them from Turkey to a private landing field in New York State. There, they rented two vehicles and went to a safe location in Long Island that only Claire knew. Going to their office wasn't an option. There could be eyes on it too. The sisters were recovering fast from their traumatic experience, healthy eating, youth, and the circle of their friends all playing a role. They stubbornly resisted all pleas to seek counseling, and when Megan threatened to deck Bawana, who dwarfed her, the operatives gave up. Zeb and Roger went to New York and returned with all the gear and weapons they would need, from a cache they had. They had such stashes across the country, and in many international cities. Broker and the twins holed up with their screens, and commenced the most important hunt they had ever undertaken. The old man, who in all probability was a traitor. Chapter 70 Day 17 It was one of those perfect days in Washington, D.C., when Claire set out from her home. 9 a.m., just after breakfast on a Sunday, too early for tourists to hit the streets. There were cyclists and joggers when her car eased out into the glorious sunshine. She rolled down her window and inhaled deeply. The air didn't smell of politics. It was fresh light and filled her with a quiet peace. The previous night she had met with the president, who had been dumbfounded when she told him the sisters were alive. But. He waved at the TV. You told me they are dead. Your crew's missing. Heck, there's nothing else the media is covering. We have a traitor, she told him bluntly, and proceeded to brief him when he sat down heavily. He swiveled his chair when she had finished and looked outside the Oval Office. A Secret Service agent was in the distance, his back to them. Who else knows? General Klaus, sir. Why am I not surprised? A smile tugged his lips despite the anger in his eyes. It makes sense, he said after a while when she gave no response. They wanted me to let the Russians do the work. It was no secret. I trusted him, he reflected, glancing once at a photograph of the National Security Council. Take care of it. Yes, sir. And Claire, I'm glad your team is safe and alive. The agency is back in business? Yes, sir. She brought her mind back to the present as her car rolled up to the gates of a secluded house in McLean, Virginia. There was a security detail outside who wasn't expecting her, but let her in after a brief call to the house. A long driveway past manicured lawns in a koi pond ended in front of an enormous entrance, outside which two armed men stood. This is a surprise, Claire, the old man greeted her. You could have called me. I needed to meet with you, Joseph. Shall we head to your study? Joseph Kleins, deputy director of the CIA, nodded shortly, putting his game face on, and led her inside. Kleins' study was a short walk away, a room full of books and framed photographs. There was a well-used wooden desk polished to a gleam on which were more pictures. Behind it was a swivel chair, and Kleins stopped abruptly when he saw that it was occupied. Him? he exclaimed in surprise and growing anger when he saw Zeb Carter lounging in it. How did he get here? Earlier, days 14 to 16. The tall Saman hostel sat phone had several voicemail messages on it, from the old man as well as from the dead shooter. None of the incoming or outgoing calls could be traced, and the one number in its contacts was dead. Beth and Megan ran those voice prints and compared them against all the databases they had. 
There was no match. That old man. Broker tapped his cell thoughtfully. He probably spoke through an altering program. That changed his voice just enough. The hostel's face didn't come up in any databases, either. He could be a private contractor. Megan pulled up more browser windows and ran searches. Nothing. She frowned when Werner came back empty-handed. Look at it another way, Zeb suggested from the couch he was lounging on. What did Fiorentini, the Haramio gang, and that splinter PKK cell have in common? And Aob. Not Aob, Beth objected. Pasha capturing us wasn't in the plan. We were bait for Aob. So eras, Zeb corrected himself. What links the mafia, the drug cartels, the Kurdish group and eras? On the surface, nothing did, but the sisters and broker weren't giving up. They set Werner to work, after disguising any search they performed. They got their first break when Bawana and Roger made an immediate short visit to Mexico. Helped by Almaraz, the Samar officer, they interviewed several of the surviving Jaramillo gang members. One of them, the tunnel digger at the airfield near Canelas, paused when he saw the photograph of the watcher. You know him? Bawana loomed over the prisoner. See, him I know. He sold us guns. Many guns. Why him? You could buy from anywhere else. The digger smiled, revealing broken teeth. Alberto. He's smart. Very smart. He gave information on other gangs, like... A snitch. Yes, like snitch. Not much. Just enough to keep the guns coming. Zeb turned it around in his head when Bawana and Roger returned and briefed them. What if the Watcher was working for the CIA or one of its rogue agents? He fronted the deal to sell guns to the Mexican gang. He got intel in return and passed it on to his bosses. Sounds like how the CIA would operate. He went to his screen when a memory surfaced. Wasn't there a rumor Fiorentini was let off because he snitched? He snapped his fingers to get his friend's attention and pointed to the Darknet site he had opened. A message board that was frequented by those in the covert ops community. It was a CIA operation. They cultivated Fiorentini, got him to sell guns to domestic terrorists. They pressured the NYPD to release the mafia boss once those jihadists were captured. Megan read the post aloud and several more responses to it. That's the link. Her eyes sparkled when she turned to them. The CIA's behind this. I'm sure if we dig hard enough, we will find who that watcher is. That dead hostel. And we can then find a connection to him and the CIA. Which in turn will lead to links to the PKK and eras, Megan added. Something on your mind? Zeb asked Bear when he appeared unconvinced. If the idea was to have Beth and Meg as bait, Bear said, stroking his beard, why go to all this trouble? New Jersey, Mexico, California, why not just kidnap the twins and take them to Syria? They, Chloe made a disparaging face at him, needed to cover their tracks. They used us to take out all the pieces. We would destroy anything that stood in our way. Claire would make sure no questions would be asked. We provided them the ultimate clean sheet. Beth bounced in her seat in excitement. The juice Claire wields she could make stories disappear or rewritten. Fiorentini dead. No problem. Jaramillo's cleaned out. A feel-good report about that. That old man, Bawana smacked a fist in his palm, and whoever was with him. We were pawns. Manipulated. He used the agency. Chapter 71 we still need proof. Broker looked troubled. That darknet post and the cartel dude statement don't mean anything. We need more. It would have to be someone high up in the CIA, Chloe supplied. Such an operation couldn't be conducted by someone low on the tree. It would have to be someone who would have the resources and could work no questions asked. 
We've already profiled such people. Megan brought up six photographs on her screen. Old, powerful, and who would have the clout? Hildred and Kleins, the director and the deputy director, were the first two men. One was a chief of staff, and the others were very senior agents. Nothing in their bios, she continued. However, Werner's looking. Where are you going? she asked when Zeb rose. To find out who the Watcher was. The Darknet post was by one Darth Vader 21. He had concealed himself well, but he hadn't reckoned on the sisters and broker. Uncovering his IP address was easy, but it turned out to be a proxy. That didn't deter them. They searched other posts he had made, worked out the time zone he was in based on the message board's location. They then looked up the available records of the covert ops personnel where they lived. Several calls ensued, threats and requests were made before they got a name, Joe Emmons. Emmons was a retired SEAL who, after leaving the Navy, had joined a private military contractor. Zeb knew he had carried out missions for the CIA and several other clandestine agencies. He now ran a charter boat service in San Francisco. Emmons was alone in his boat when Zeb walked down the marina and hopped into the pristinely maintained white vessel. Help you? Emmons asked him, wiping his hands on a rag. Yeah. Zeb removed his shades and eyed the athletic figure in front of him. Emmons looked to be in his forties. A weathered face, short dark hair, gray eyes. His arms were sinewy, bereft of any tattoos. He was wearing a white tee over a pair of blue shorts. His feet were bare. You looking to rent the boat? Nope. Zeb fished out the rolled up photograph from his pocket and smoothed it out. Him. I want to know who he is. Emmons glanced at it once, his face expressionless, and looked back at Zeb. Why would I know him? Who are you, friend? Because you are Darth Vader 21. Emmons seemed to freeze for a moment. Whoever you are, you're wasting my time and yours. I don't know who this dude is, he said, tapping the photograph, and I don't know this Darth Vader guy. Zeb took a leap of faith. You've heard about those Peterson twins? Who hasn't? Emmons snorted. What's that got to do with anything? I worked with them. I'm Zeb Carter. They were in my security outfit. I'm hunting whoever is responsible for them. Emmons looked him up and down and came to a decision. He jerked his head to the boat's cabin where he fished out a couple of beers. I sense a story. Tell me and I'll see if I can help you. Travis Dolchek was the watcher's name. Emmons and he had worked together on a CIA operation in Kandahar. He was like their personal errand boy. I don't know who he worked for. It was just one person in the CIA. My firm was contracted by them to safeguard weapons transports in Stan. It was there I came across him. We kept in touch after that mission, and he tried to recruit me. He worked with five men and wanted a sixth. I declined. Working for one single person in the CIA didn't seem right. He told you who that person was? Nah. But we got close, sort of. He looked me up whenever he was in Frisco. We went drinking. One of those days, he told me about the Fiorentini thing. He was drunk, it slipped out. He didn't remember the next day. Beth and Megan pored over the financial records, family histories, social circles, anything they could find, of the six people they were targeting. Divorces, stepfamilies, second or third marriage, Megan mumbled as she programmed Werner to mine deeper. Beth was working another angle. She had voice recordings of the six men. She wrote an algo to run those recordings through voice-altering programs and let Werner compare them to the old man's voice. It'll take time. She yawned. We have time, her sister snarked, now that we're alive. Zeb Bear, Bawana and Roger were in Miami that evening. They rented an SUV and headed out to Coral Gables, 
which was a residential suburb to the southwest of the city. It was where Dolchek's former wife lived, along with their 11-year-old son. If you were that old man and didn't know if we were dead or alive, what would you do? He asked his friends as he drove out. Keep an eye on her, Bear replied promptly. The old man wasn't nervous or scared. Ayab was dead. That filled him with joy. Nevertheless, the continuing silence from Dolchek concerned him. He had lost the PR battle with Claire. The brutal execution of the sisters had taken the wind out of his sails, and he'd kept quiet once that news had broken. He knew Carter and her other operatives were missing. And those who knew of the developments in Tal Saman suspected they had died in the missile attack. The old man believed Dolchek to be dead too. They had a protocol in case things went south. That code hadn't been activated. Nevertheless, the old man took precautionary steps. He arranged for two men to watch Dolchek's wife's house. Former wife, he reminded himself as he lovingly polished his brother's picture. He didn't tell me anything, Maria Dolchek told them. She looked frail with her frazzled hair and nervous gestures, but Zeb could sense the inner strength in her. She had let them in when Zeb had introduced themselves as FBI agents, investigating her husband. He hasn't done anything wrong, he had assured her. One of his missions is linked to one of our cases. We aren't able to locate him. He trailed off apologetically. We've been separated a long time. He visits Jerry, she pointed to the ceiling referring to her son upstairs, two, three times a year. They're very close. But I don't know anything about his work. He keeps sending money. Regularly. That's how we could afford this home. The house was simple, a three-bedroom building, done well. She's a teacher. She couldn't have afforded it, on her salary. Megan had looked into her financial records, her emails, everything about her. There was nothing suspicious there. No correspondence with Travis Dolchek, either. He emails you. No. She shook her head. Travis never believed in email. He always called. You have his number, ma'am? No. He was the one who called. Never gave his number. Said it was for our protection. We were used to him. And life had moved on for us after the divorce. They spent another hour with her without learning anything useful, until Roger flashed her his high wattage smile. You remember anything at all, he said, ma'am? About his employer. She frowned deeply and stared into the distance. There was this one time he said something. That his boss was driven because he had lost a brother in the Middle East. Executed by a terrorist. They thanked her and left, donning their shades against the evening light. Zeb set out to their SUV, which was parked in a line of vehicles in the street. Roger behind him, Bear and Bawana falling back. Now? Bear asked in his earpiece. Now? Zeb and Roger sprinted to their vehicle, but instead of climbing into it, they ran past it, to a park beyond the sidewalk. From behind doors slammed, someone cursed and then Bawana's amused voice came on. Got them. They turned back to see their friends kneeling over two suits sprawled on the sidewalk, a gaggle of onlookers surrounding them. In Long Island, Werner was running the voice comparison, as well as searching far and wide into the families and friends of the six men. It could handle various tasks with ease. It was a supercomputer, after all. Mere humans didn't have its capability. Besides, it would do anything for Beth and Megan. Its processors nearly melted whenever the twins smiled at Werner. It went hem when it discovered the oilman. Why hadn't anyone known of that brother? Stepbrother, Werner discovered, and it looked like his connection to the CIA man had been erased, except for one old school record that Werner had stumbled upon. Now to check if any of the voice alterations matched that of the CIA man. Werner alerted the sisters shortly afterwards. Yes. 
Megan scream jolted Broker from his sleep. If she had yelled any louder, she could have been heard in Raqqa. A name flashed on her screen. Voice print match, Werner informed them. Link to Tariq Ayab. It mentioned the execution. I'll be damned, Broker swore when he read the name. Joseph Kleins. Chapter 72 Day 17 What's going on? Kleins blustered, turning to Claire. How did this man get inside? He's trespassing. And whatever you have to discuss, it can wait till tomorrow. Get out of my house. Your brother, Zeb said, picking up the photograph, Chip Pasquale. He died in Syria, didn't he? He was one of the first Americans Aab beheaded. No one knew of your connection to him. Zeb stood up, came around the desk and leaned against it. You erased all records and made sure nothing existed. Because you wanted to protect your family. Get out, Klein shouted. He hurried to his chair and sank into it. I'll call the police. He picked his phone up, dialed a number and then flung it down when he got silence. Your cell won't work. Your landline won't work, Zeb told him. Chip. You did everything, but you forgot about one clipping in a school magazine. In those days, the magazine was print only. It slipped off your radar. What you didn't know, Zeb said, shaking his head in reproof, was that the school digitized all their magazines. Made them available electronically. And you know what happens to such records. They can always be found. Claire sat across the desk from Kleins and crossed her arms. She was calm, composed, watching the deputy director of the CIA disintegrate in front of her. Ted. Kleins hollered, his face red, his hands clenching and unclenching. Ted's one of your men? Outside. He won't be coming. Not unless he wants to be arrested. You covered your tracks well, Zeb resumed when Kleins made no reply. My friends and I, we did suspect there was someone yanking our chain. But identifying you wasn't easy. Dole check your man. He smiled mirthlessly when Klein stiffened. He's dead. I killed him. But you suspected that, didn't you? You also figured out I could be alive. And so you sent those watchers to Dolchek's wife's house. They reported that no one turned up to her house, didn't they? They would. They had guns to their temples. But you know what led us to you? Beth and Megan Peterson. Zeb planted his palms on the desk and leaned towards Kleins. They're alive. Safe and unharmed. Klein stared at him in disbelief for several seconds, and then he whirled towards Claire, who nodded. He turned pale and the bluster, the resistance, escaped him. Those calls you made to Dolchek, Zeb said, pinning him with cold eyes, the twins did some fancy computer stuff that I don't understand. However, they can prove that it was you on those calls with Dolchek. Klein's harsh breathing filled the room. Zeb sat beside Claire and looked at the broken man curiously. Why? They were threatening me, Kleins replied dully. Fiorentini. Alberto. None of those were CIA missions. I was acting on my own. But I got wins, he said, becoming defiant. Both of them gave us vital intel. We shut down several terrorists and dealt big blows to the cartels, based on what they told us. Why the twins? Why kidnap them? Aalb. Kleins reached out to the photograph with trembling fingers. I tried several times to get at him. It failed. When I heard of you in one of her reports, he said, not looking in Claire's direction, I checked you out. You would do anything for your friends. You were my last resort. You're right, Zeb accepted. I would kill for them. I would die for them. I was totally okay with that. But it nearly turned out worse than that. Worse than dying. Kleins barked. What could be beyond that? Me, unable to stop their deaths. Living a life without them. Kleins swallowed. 
I did this for our country too. Fiorentini is gone. The Jaramillos have been wiped out. Iab is dead. His voice grew stronger. No one can question that I am a patriot, he ended in a shout. So am I, Zeb replied quietly and shot him. How do we explain this, ma'am? Zeb asked Claire as he walked out with her. She adjusted her shades and smiled at him faintly. Explain what, Zeb? Kleins, ma'am. I don't know about you, Zeb, but for the last hour, I have been in a meeting in the White House. Breaking the news to the President that all of you are safe and well. Her smile grew broader when Zeb gaped at her. As for Joseph Kleins, do read the newspapers tomorrow. They will report that he died of a heart attack. Which is true. You shot him in the chest after all. One week later. There weren't many loose ends to tie up. The dead Joseph Kleins was thoroughly investigated, and it turned out he had several offshore accounts that he had used to conduct his clandestine activities. Hildred resigned. He wasn't involved, but his position was untenable once the president and Claire quietly told him about Kleins. The twins became celebrities once it was known they were alive. We were rescued by a special ops team, they explained in several interviews. That video, it was deliberate misinformation to trap Aob. The army declined to comment on which covert unit was responsible for their rescue. The Navy said it wasn't the SEALs. Furious speculation ensued, which resulted in the armed forces enjoying an upsurge of popularity. Beth and Megan momentarily became two of the most popular names for girls. A Hollywood studio offered them a movie deal, which they declined. They turned away the scores of agents who offered to represent them. We just advise companies on protecting themselves. Email security, viruses, that kind of stuff. They smiled in a nation swooned. It was late, very late, in the Columbus Avenue office. It was raining as Zeb stood by the window, alone in the emptiness, watching and hearing the heavens lash down. It reminded him of Syria. The drive to Tal Saman and after. The helplessness and the impotent rage he had felt all along, that he had kept bottled up, until the rescue. He felt her presence but didn't turn his head. I know what you're thinking, Megan told him softly. You're a trouble magnet. Being with us puts us in danger. I know exactly what's going on in your mind, Zeb Carter. She grabbed his shoulder and looked at him fiercely. You're thinking if you disappear, we'll be safe. Well, that's not gonna happen, Zeb. Know why? Because if you do, Beth and I will drop everything we're doing. We'll come hunting you. We will find you wherever you are and bring you back. That's what you were ready to do for us, right? Guess what? It's exactly what we will do for you. And she flounced off. Zeb stared after her, and a reluctant smile escaped him. I guess I'd better listen to her. She's right, honey, a voice spoke in his mind and spread instant warmth through him. They are your family. You don't desert family. And Zeb Carter stayed. The End Bonus chapter from Run the Next in the Series He came from Beirut. He came from war. His name was Walid Omar Bilal, but not many remembered that name. Namir was what everyone called him, those who feared him, and there were many of them, and those who respected him as well. Namir. Leopard. They had started calling him that, because of his ability to strike without warning, and disappear into nothingness. No one knew when he would come, or from where. All knew that when he left, there would be death and destruction in his wake. The name had originated in a small village in the Baka Valley of Lebanon. He and his small band of men had ambushed and captured an American convoy of 30. He had killed most of the men and after torturing the survivors, had left them to die in the heat. Namir. That's when his men had started calling him by that name. Namir had known war all his life. 
he was born during a Lebanese army bombing raid in the valley. He had seen his parents murdered by Maronite Christian guerrillas. That horrific incident stayed with him. He grew up being reared by neighbors and militants. The earliest memory he had was of his parents dying. The strongest emotion he had was hate. Hate for Christians. Namir's first kill happened when he was eight years old. It wasn't planned. His gun went off when he was playing with it and killed an old villager. He fled the place and joined a wandering band of armed militants. War became not just his solace but his profession. The militants Namir had joined were a splinter group of Hezbollah, the group that had waged a political war and sometimes terrorism against Israel and America and had persecuted people of other faiths. Having grown up in a toxic environment, Namir quickly found he was better at military strategy than any other militant in his group, and that he liked killing and torture. He also found he was uninterested in the ideological beliefs of the Hezbollah. He killed the leader of his group when he was 25, took over the cell which was 50 strong, turned it into a mafia-style gang and ruled over a small village in the Bacaw Valley. Product and money. Only those two mattered. Religious killing, fanaticism, creating a caliphate, all that was of zero interest to him. He still had a burning hatred for Christians. He killed them where he could. However, he didn't allow his emotions to get in the way of his business. The valley was broad and flat, a hundred miles northeast of Beirut, high up against the anti-Lebanon mountains. It had orchards, wineries, and factories for handmade carpets. The village used to make wine at one time. Now it was better known for its hashish fields. Namir's gang controlled hundreds of acres of such fields, the villagers effectively serving the bandits. Hashish sales, however, were being rapidly overtaken by the manufacture of Captagon, an addictive drug that helped fighters stay awake for days and fight like zombies. Namir had converted four houses in the village into laboratories, the hub of his multi-million dollar income. It was when he turned 35 that it all came crashing down on him. End of bonus chapter Author's Message Thank you for taking the time to read Scorched Earth. If you enjoyed it, please consider telling your friends and posting a short review. Check out Ty Patterson on his website, typatterson.com. Search for the Facebook group of Ty Patterson's readers on Facebook and join it.